The Zeitgeist Movement Defined Realizing a New Train of Thought Part 3, A New Train of Thought An Introduction to Sustainable Thought Action is the product of the qualities inherent in nature. It is only the ignorant man who, misled by personal egotism, says, I am the doer. The Bhagavad Gita Socioeconomic Spectrum As alluded to in prior essays, sustainable practices can only come about by a value reorientation towards sustainable thought. While the notion of sustainability is often reduced to an ecological context, the real issue under the surface is cultural. This hence becomes a process of education. It is the perspective of the Zeitgeist movement that the economic system utilized in a society is the greatest influence on the values and beliefs of its people. For instance, deeply rooted in even the seemingly separate political-religious doctrines of our time, resides an undercurrent of values set forth by economic assumptions. The term socioeconomic, which is the social science that links the effects of economic activity to other social processes, could have its meaning more specifically extended to also include religious views, political biases, military initiatives, tribal loyalties, cultural customs, legal statutes and other common societal phenomena. It appears that the very fabric of our lives and hence our value system is born, most dominantly, from the cultural perception of our survival, social relationships and ideas of personal-slash-social success. Moreover, it is critical to restate that political systems, which most in the world still seem to award priority of importance when it comes to the state of affairs in society, are, at best, secondary in relevance, if not, in fact, entirely obsolete, when the true ramifications of the economic structure are factored in. In fact, as will be argued in future essays, political governance as we know it is really nothing more than an outgrowth of economic inefficiency. Very few would care much about who was in power or other such traditional notions if they clearly understood the process of economic unfolding and were able to contribute and gain without conflict. Therefore, there is no greater issue of importance than the system of economic unfolding when it comes to the conduct and stability of human beings on both the personal and social level. Ephemeralization. Generally speaking, an economic system exists to meet the needs and wants of the population. The degree by which it is able to do so depends on the state of usable resources and the technical strategy utilized to harness those resources for a given purpose. In this context, notable engineer and thinker R. Buckminster Fuller argued that true economic wealth is not money or even the material outcome of a given production. Rather, True wealth is the level of energy-slash-production efficiency enabled, coupled with knowledge development that furthers the intelligent management of the Earth's resources. In this view, he defined and expressed a trend termed ephemeralization which tracks humanity's technical ability to increasingly do more with less. Historically speaking, ephemeralization is, in gesture, a contradiction of the still deeply held Malthusian consideration which, in part, claims that humanity is forever out of balance with nature and there will always be a section of the population that must suffer, as the available resources simply do not add up to meet everyone's needs. As noted in prior essays, this worldview is ever apparent in the economic system we still embrace today globally, forging deep structural biases that have inevitably favored one class of people over another in survival advantage. In other words, a war game has culminated, built out of the assumption of universal, perpetually reinforced scarcity, which moves forward today on its own momentum, largely absent of its original causal reasoning. The vast majority of what we define as corruption today, more often than not, finds its psychological root in this competitive awareness both on the personal level, the corporate, business, level and on the level of government in the form of war, tyranny and self-preserving collusion. In fact, it can be well argued that the very notion of ethical in a world decidedly working to gain at the expense of others becomes a highly relative and almost arbitrary distinction. Yet, this trend of ephemeralization, having increased rapidly from the 20th century's almost sudden industrial-slash-scientific advancements, deeply challenges this protectionist, elitist, scarcity-driven worldview, suggesting new, paradigm-shifting possibilities for human organization. These possibilities, in part, statistically reveal that we are now able to take care of the entire world's population at a standard of living unknown to the vast majority of humanity today. 
However, in order for this new reality of efficiency to be harnessed, the archaic barriers ingrained in our everyday way of life, specifically our perception of economics, need to be re-evaluated and likely overcome entirely. As noted in prior essays, the term utopia commonly arises as a pejorative term amongst those who tend to dismiss large-scale social improvement due to either a cynicism of so-called human nature or an outright disbelief in humanity's technical capacity to now adjust greatly with new technical means. For example, an objection common to the current culture, specifically the wealthy first world nations, rests in the value of what could be termed the violence of mass acquisition. At its root, this view takes the Malthusian concept of need-oriented resource insufficiency and transposes it to assume a pressure of acquisitive irrationality. In other words, it assumes human beings empirically have infinite material wants and even if, say, every human being could exist with what the West today would deem an upper-class lifestyle, with no one falling short, an element of our psychology would never be satisfied in the material sense and the interest in more and more material gain would thus always create a destabilizing imbalance in society. Therefore, the existence of haves and have-nots is perceived to be a consequence of our inherent, status-driven psychology and greed, not availability of resources and means. To the extent that this is actually true is dubious at best given the extreme cultural condition we find ourselves in today, compared with the historical fact that outside of Western, aka capitalistic, influence, the concept of vain material success is far from universal for the human being. In truth, the relationship of success and property has been culturally manufactured based upon system necessity and is now a staple value of our consumer-based society. In a world now driven by economic growth to keep employment at a reasonable level, in a world which overtly praises those with great financial wealth as a measure of success, in a world that actually rewards behaviors of human indifference and ruthless competition for market share, rather than honest social contribution for overall human betterment, it is no mystery as to why the idea of a single human owning, say, a 400-room mansion on 500,000 acres of private land with 50 cars and 5 planes parked in the front yard has become part of an ideal coveted vision of personal, and social, success. Yet, from the perspective of true human sustainability, this view is pure violence and exists in nearly the same category of one who hoards food and resources he or she doesn't need and refuses to allow others access for the sake of abstract principle. If we imagine a small island of 10 people where two people decide to extract and hoard 1,000% more than they need to be healthy, leaving eight people to live in abject poverty and are dying, would you find this arrangement an act of personal freedom by those two or an act of social violence against the eight? This is brought up here to dismiss the utopian abundance fallacy reaction common to many regarding, in part, the implications of ephemeralization. Just as we as a global society are realizing the inherent physical limitations of our industrial behaviors, slowly adjusting away from ecologically destabilizing consequences, the understanding that an infinite once based value orientation is equally as detrimental to social balance is critical to realize. System Limitation when it comes to cultural philosophies, the human population must gain, in part, a clear understanding of its limitations and derive its expectations and values from this physical reality. The limitations imposed by our environment exist irrespective of human values, interests, wants or even needs in abstraction. If we were to remove humanity from planet Earth and observe the Earth's natural ecological operations with the causal, scientific understandings we have today, we would witness a synergistic-slash-symbiotic system governed by the universal dynamics of nature. Hence, no matter what we think about ourselves, our intentions or our freedoms, once we are placed into this system of physical law we are bound to it regardless of our beliefs or the cultural norms we have taken for granted, or which have been imposed as inevitable or immutable by our various cultures. If we choose to learn and align with the logic inherent, we find sustainability and hence stability. If we choose to ignore or fight these pre-existing rules, we will inevitably decrease stability and problems will arise, as is the near-constant state of affairs today in the early 21st century. This awareness of natural limitations, as we have come to understand them today via the scientific method, expresses perhaps the most profound shift in human loyalties in history. In short, we now understand that we either align with the natural world, or we suffer. Sadly, this firm referential association still stands at odds with many common philosophies today, such as established religious and political perspectives. 
Remarkably also, it is a common rejoinder to label this very firmly based realization as totalitarian or black and white, a seemingly rigid and arbitrary imposition upon human life, rather than simply the undeniable, scientifically demonstrable state of affairs. Intriguingly, the nearly paradoxical punchline of the whole consideration of natural law is that within this rational box of system limitation we define as the governing laws of nature our range of possibility within these boundaries via the scientific method also reveals an ever-increasing technical efficiency and incredible potential to create an abundance to meet human needs, globally. Furthermore, since humanity is the only species on Earth with the mental capacity to alter slash affect its ecosystem in truly profound ways, this necessity for alignment becomes critical for species sustainability, public health and true problem-solving advancement. Nothing could be more dangerous than a world culture that, given the exponential increase in our capacity to affect ecological and social balance with technology, misunderstands its power and effects. In many ways, humanity is faced with an educational race against time with respect to its current immaturity in handling the incredible, newfound powers it has realized via science and technology. As an aside, it is important to remember that when it comes to the history of economic thought itself, the frame of reference has had more to do with assumptions of human behavior than intelligent resource management and general physical science slash natural law understandings. While our most innate behavioral reflexes and genetic propensities are certainly relevant to the consequences of a socioeconomic system and are very much a part of the equation, assumptions of human behavior cannot rationally be held as a structural starting point of an economic system. Humans are a consequence of the same ecological system conditions and not the other way around. So, in conclusion to this introduction, if the purpose of a social system is to create an ever-increasing standard of living, while also maintaining environmental and social balance to assure we do not reduce this quality in the future due to possible resulting consequences of irresponsible choices such as resource depletion, pollution, disease, negative stress, wealth imbalance and other issues, it then becomes critical to base our methodology on the most relevant set of technical. Parameters we can, oriented around the current state of scientific awareness on both an ecological and human level. Post-scarcity trends, capacity and efficiency. The world's present industrial civilization is handicapped by the coexistence of two universal, overlapping, and incompatible intellectual systems. The accumulated knowledge of the last four centuries of the properties and interrelationships of matter and energy, and the associated monetary culture which has evolved from folkways of prehistoric origin. M. King Hubbard Evaluating Design Examining the surface of Earth today, a network layer of communities, industrial centers, transport routes, recreational areas, agricultural systems and the like dominate much of the landscape. Whether intended as a total system construct or not, this result, at any given point in time, constitutes the appearance of a topographical design. Yet, on the other hand, given that this resulting design today is, actually, a consequential amalgamation of mostly business dynamics moving money around for personal or group self-interest, based around decision-making mechanisms such as profit, cost efficiency and the prevailing logic surrounding property relationships, it could also be argued that what has manifest is actually not a design at all. Rather, it is rooted in a mechanism that has created the appearance of design ex post facto since the structural outcome recognized was not fully anticipated as a whole prior to its construction. In other words, the technical order we see in the world today is mostly the result of financial processes that have little to no perception of larger scale structural outcomes. It is more of a proxy system and while there are some relative exceptions, such as the placement of highways, pipelines and the like by funded city planners who simply must take a broad physical view to be functional, even those circumstances are often working around pre-existing property claims and other forms of interference which tend to reduce design efficiency on the whole. This is an interesting observation, as once it is recognized that our society operates without a large-scale preconception of its own physical design, one might begin to realize the enormous level of unnecessary waste and technical inefficiency inherent to such a short-sighted process. To consider this more so, two points are worth considering, existing yet unapplied solutions. Broad conception versus spontaneous conception. Eh, existing yet unapplied solutions. This first point concerns the tendency of many new innovations for problem resolution to go unapplied within the current economic tradition. 
If further life-improving methods or technologies have not found their way into a system within a respectable amount of time, or at all, after general validation, we can rightly assume there are inefficiencies, if not deficiencies, with the very process of economic incorporation and development. In other words, this delay between proven solutions and their application in the real world gauges the ability of the socioeconomic system to adapt properly to improved methods and applications. If, for some reason, the social order in question is not able to incorporate such new means to further ecological balance, improve public health, solve problems and increase prosperity, then there is likely a structural problem inherent. b. Broad conception versus spontaneous conception, secondly, from a strictly formulaic viewpoint, direct, total system considerations will always be more efficient and effective than spontaneous generation by processes blind to the final outcome or purpose. In other words, as gestured before, a basic good, such as a car, has a design that is conceived of in advance, before physical production. Once this design is decided upon, it is then followed by applying real-life materials and processes to create the actual physical product. This may seem obvious to most as a logical process, but the relevance of such preconception is often lost when it comes to larger-order contexts. We have to wonder what the outcome would be if we applied the pseudo-democratic market process of bidding, buying and selling for short-term profit, if even possible on such a scale, to the creation of high-integrity goods systems, such as an airplane, computer, car, home or the like. While today the resources, labor and subcomponent systems of these items are certainly in play in the open market, the design itself is not. The design is relegated, necessarily, to the discipline of science overall. It could be said that a line is intuitively drawn in this way between what is susceptible to monetary opinion and what is tangibly needed to keep some basic level of technical, system integrity. Please note that this notion of design is not to be confused with subjective style interests. Design, as used here, is not an aesthetic consideration, but a technical one. Imagine, hypothetically, if people bid and offered for the physical design construction of a house in each tiny physical detail, ignoring scientific principles. In other words, instead of referencing the basic laws of physics and the natural science that defines the core structural integrity of any building, we let the market decide, with everyone buying and selling such premises for their personal gain, regardless of their technical understanding. Of course, such an idea is truly absurd in such abstraction and most reading this probably can't even imagine such an irrational interplay. However, this is exactly what is occurring as a result of our economic system in many other less obvious ways. For example, on the macroeconomic scale, the global commercial network created by what is termed globalization with its basis in cost efficiency which, among other things, utilizes cheaper labor in often distant regions, while wasting large amounts of energy sending resources all over the world and back reveals this loss of efficiency well. From the perspective of preconceived design, given the more logical possibility of localization of labor, production and distribution in most all cases, globalization, in its current form, is highly inefficient compared to other possibilities. This is not to deny that globalization and this integration of international economies has generally been a productive occurrence within the evolution of economics. In that context, it has served global industrial development fairly well. However, if we step out of the box of market logic and examine how we could directly design a more technically efficient and localized set of systems, within the global setting, we find that the current method is not only inferior, it is rather offensive. On the microeconomic scale, this can be exemplified with respect to the inefficiency inherent to the quality of basic good components, also due to the practice of cost efficiency and the inherent interest to produce the so-called best at the lowest cost, which, quite simply, does not produce the best at all. For example, a proposed schematic design of, say, a laptop computer might be reasonably efficient, technically. However, if the actual materials used to generate that final good are relatively poor in quality, no matter how intelligent the overall, basic design, it will incur relative weakness and will likely break down more rapidly than if the same design was also optimized to use the most appropriate materials from a technical point of view, rather than those materials decided upon as per the proxy of market efficiency. Another example is the market phenomenon of proprietary technology. 
while we see, ostensibly, an enormous amount of variety in the world today with respect to good production, a closer look shows a vast and wasteful multiplicity, along with problematic structural incompatibility between producers' components of the same good genre. In other words, competing corporations today tend to create custom systems, such as a computer system and its required components, that are incompatible with the developments of other producers in that same good genre. Universal compatibility, or lack thereof, is yet another example that the byproduct of this market proxy game and the larger order system inefficiency and waste is enormous. This pattern is also common to generational development of existing commercial product systems, aka models, such as when improvements are made to a given machine, unnecessarily making obsolete older components of that machine, in the interest of assuring further purchases from the consumer. It is critical to note that there is no such thing as a single product in the closed system of Earth with respect to planetary resources and their use, nor are any product designs or production methods existing in a vacuum. Each good and its process of production is merely an extension of the whole of industry. Hence, the materials utilized, along with designs, find their true context only with respect to the whole of industry and resource management on all levels. This understanding forces the constant need to view industry, and hence economics itself, as a single system process to ensure maximum technical efficiency. So with this in mind, coupled again with the first point regarding the question of why certain realities are not put into practice even though they are clearly doable at a given point in time, this essay will examine socially relevant technological trends and design capacities which, if applied properly, could radically transform the world into a post-scarcity, highly abundant condition that would alleviate the vast majority of the world's problems we see as commonplace today. Moreover, it is a conclusion of TZM that the current model not only disallows, or too slowly incorporates, new advents in efficiency due to the very nature of business and its tendency to preserve inefficiency for the sake of an establishment's profit, the very detached and segregated nature of market activity inherently ignores larger order considerations to source and solve problems or accelerate improvement. Design Efficiency If we break down the everyday complexity of our lives today, Dissecting what interplay is most critical to human survival, sustainability and prosperity, we might find three basic things, science, natural law and resources. Science is the mechanism for discovery and validation, natural law is the pre-existing rule set which we are continually learning about via science and necessarily adapting, while resources exist in the context of both raw earthly materials and the power of the human mind to comprehend. With respect to the development of design, these three attributes are naturally indispensable to each other. Furthermore, the term industrial design, for the purposes of this essay, will be used to denote the process of economic-oriented industry in all its facets, from singular good creation to the total order of the global economy in form. The history of industrial design is, in many respects, the true history of economic development. As our ever-emerging scientific understandings generate logical inference with respect to how best utilize our resources and time, the global landscape, both physical and cultural, has undergone perpetual change. In this context, the core interest of industrial design is essentially efficiency and it could be argued that there are three central efficiency contexts related, a, labor efficiency, b, material efficiency and the c, system efficiency. Labor efficiency has a unique history. Since the early 20th century there has been a relatively rapid transition from the dominant use of human and animal muscle as the source of labor power, to the use of powered machines. This phenomenon, which is termed mechanization, was able to elevate the workforce from much strenuous toil, to operate in more of a position of tool utilization. However, by the end of the 20th century, this pattern continued to advance, where such machines were not only capable of moving heavy loads and performing complex physical acts, they were also merging with computerization and degrees of artificial intelligence, AI, and hence were able to make decisions as well. In short, the accelerating trend today has proven that these modern machines are now greatly surpassing, in productivity, the vast majority of the actions historically held by human beings and there appears to be no slowing down of this trend. Overall, TZM views this trend as suggesting a powerful means by which the human species can further maximize its productive ability to meet the needs of all human beings, while generating a level of human freedom never before seen, if adapted properly. Material efficiency is how well we utilize the raw materials of the earth.
Material science also has a unique history unto itself, with each period of time discovering new patterns and possibilities. Metallurgy, a domain of materials engineering that studies the physical and chemical behavior of metallic elements and their mixtures, was a very important development historically, enabling a vast spectrum of possibility through the creation of compounds and alloys. For example, the term Bronze Age, which was the period in Europe of around 3200 to 600 BC, is characterized by the common use of copper and its alloy bronze for many purposes. However, perhaps the most important discovery in materials science understanding, and perhaps one of the most important discoveries in human history, was the set of chemical elements that comprise all matter, as we know it. Recognized by most as organized via the periodic table, 118 elements have been identified as of 2013, with about 92 known to occur naturally on Earth. In short, these chemical elements are the building blocks of everything we experience as tangible in the world around us and each respective atom has certain properties and hence idiosyncratic applications. This knowledge, which is extremely new relative to the totality of human understanding, has not only allowed for a deeper understanding of how chemistry can work to create an incredibly vast range of materials for increasingly efficient industrial use, it has also facilitated a powerful understanding of the very nature of matter itself and prospects for manipulation at the atomic scale. Nanotechnology, which is very much in its infancy, appears quite concrete in its theoretical basis of assembling and disassembling different materials and even systems of materials, i.e. goods themselves, from the atomic level up and down. Of course, as profound as that is, the current, relatively crude state of nanotechnology applies mostly in the context of what are called smart materials or metamaterials. As will be touched upon later in this essay, the current state and trends of material science hold profound possibilities for the present and future. System efficiency is likely the most crucial and important of all concepts for, as abstract as it may seem, everything we know of is a system itself or an interaction of two or more systems. Perhaps the best way to express system efficiency is to consider any commonplace act and think about how that act could either reduce waste or increase productivity on any and all levels, not just within the context of the perceived singular act itself. System perspectives are rather obscure to most since we tend to view most functions and processes within the bounds of their intended purpose only, in a categorical manner. For example, when we consider a modern fitness center, aka gym, with people exercising on various machines in one location, we tend to think only of the purpose of that institution and hence how to better facilitate the health interests of those people using those machines, etc. We rarely think more broadly and propose, what if all those people pedaling and pushing and pulling had that exerted energy run into a conversion system where the building itself could be powered, in whole or in part, by that energy in the form of electricity. This manner of thought stands at the heart of a systems theory type worldview. Perhaps a useful way to think of this network perspective is through the synergy of nature itself. In the Earth's biosphere, minus current human interference, there is virtually no such thing as waste. Virtually everything we find in nature is deeply integrated and in balance due to the refining nature of evolution itself. This is a powerful observation and the term biomimicry is worth mentioning in this context as, in many ways, our development as a species has been to learn from the natural processes in existence already, even though we appear to have decoupled greatly in many ways. Hence, working to facilitate the most optimized integration we can, ideally reusing everything on all levels, just as nature does, should be a societal goal to ensure sustainability and efficiency. Established and Potential Trends There are two broad, basic trends realities to consider in the world today. For the purposes of this essay, we will refer to them as established and potential. Established trends are the socioeconomic trends in play at the time of this writing and these, in the context of public health and ecological balance, are shown to be almost entirely negative. The potential trends, on the other hand, reveal life-improving and balance-creating possibilities that could occur if larger-order social changes were made. As noted before, these two trends arguably appear to operate in system contradiction of each other. In the essay titled, Social Destabilization and Transition, an in-depth look at the current state of societal affairs will be addressed in detail. However, let it be stated that the efficiencies defined, defended and suggested here are not done so simply to show how much better the world could be, as though what we are doing today is still okay. 
On the contrary, these basic observations actually demand alignment if we intend to maintain stability in our world given its current, degrading patterns. With a population expected to reach over 9 billion by 2050, with reported trends of looming food, water and energy shortages, these suggestions not only seek to improve but to actually change course. Overall, it is the view of TZM that if these current, so-called established trends persist with the short-sighted market-based practice and all the characteristics that go along with it, human culture will not only not achieve the positive application of the potential trends expressed, increased destabilization will continue to occur. Post-scarcity worldview In this section, basic statistics and trends will be presented to show how we can, as a global society, achieve a post-scarcity social system. While scarcity in absolute terms will always be with humanity to one degree or another in this closed system of earthly resources, scarcity on the level of human needs and basic material success is no longer a viable defense of the market system's allocation methods. As a brief aside, a common defense of the price system and the market is that if any scarcity exists, it makes void any other approach. The argument goes that since not everyone can have XYZ, XYZ is scarce and hence people need money or have a lack thereof, to filter out who gains XYZ and who doesn't. The problem with this assumption is that it ignores how certain resources and hence goods have more relevance than others when it comes to public health. Comparing the scarcity of a very expensive, luxury car which draws status satisfaction from its owner more than its basic purpose as a mode of transport, with the scarcity of food, which is a core life requirement for health, is not legitimate in real life terms. The former interest, while perhaps important to the ego satisfaction of the owner who likely already has his or her basic needs met to afford such a product, is not equivalent to the latter interest of those who have little or nothing to eat and hence cannot survive. One cannot arbitrarily conflate such needs and wants, as though they are simply the same, in theory. Sadly, this is how the market system behaves. Likewise, with great wealth and material imbalance, comes inevitable social destabilization. Virtually every large-scale public dissent and revolution we have seen in the past couple hundred years have had some economic basis, usually revolving around societal imbalance, exploitation and class separation. The same goes for the roots of crime, terrorism, addictions and other social problems. Virtually all of these propensities are born out of deprivation, whether absolute or relative and this deprivation is inherent to the nature of a society based on competition and scarcity. So, to simply reduce our economic reality down to mere trade, coupled with the claim that any degree of scarcity justifies the use of the market, price and money for allocation, is to ignore the true nature of what ensures social harmony, stability, and public health. Would it seem reasonable to forego the technical ability to, say, elevate 80% of humanity to the material capacity currently held by only 10% today, simply because not everyone can own a 500-room mansion? Again, the absurdity of this objection is quite clear when a system perspective is taken with respect to what underscores true public health and social stability. That aside, below is a list of current life support realities available to the global population that have gone unharnessed due to inhibiting factors inherent to the market economy. Each point will be addressed in its own subsection. Food production, current production methods already produce more than enough food to feed all human beings on Earth. Furthermore, current trends toward more optimized technology and agricultural methods also show a capacity to further increase production efficiency and nutrition quality to a state of active abundance, with minimal human labor and increasingly less energy, water and land requirements. Clean water, desalination and decontamination processes currently exist to such a vast degree of application that no human being, even in the present state of pollution levels, would ever need to be without clean water, regardless of where they are on Earth. Energy, between geothermal, wind, solar, and hydro, coupled with system-based processes that can recapture expelled energy and reuse it directly, there is an absolute energy abundance which can provide for many times the current world's population. Material production slash access, the spectrum of material production, from buildings to transport to common goods, has experienced a powerful merging of capital goods, consumer goods and human labor. With proper system incorporation of each genre of production, coupled with optimized regeneration processes and a total transformation from the use of property rights to a system of access rights, it is clear that all known good functions, in the form of product, 
can be utilized by 100% of humanity, on a per-need basis, and access abundance. Carrying Capacity However, before these four issues are addressed in detail, an analysis of the Earth's carrying capacity is in order. Carrying capacity is defined as the maximum, equilibrium number of organisms of a particular species that can be supported indefinitely in a given environment. Speculation on the Earth's carrying capacity with respect to human beings, meaning how many people the Earth and its biosphere can support, has been a controversial subject for many centuries. For example, a 2001 United Nations report said that two-thirds of the estimates they noted at that time fell in the range of 4 billion to 16 billion with a median of about 10 billion. However, technological change, and its capacity to increase efficiency with respect to how our resources are used, presents an ongoing interference in such attempts to arrive at a tangible, empirical figure. The reality is that the number of people the Earth can support is highly variable and based, in part, on the current state of technology at a given time and the more we progress our scientific and technical understanding, the more people we tend to be able to support, with less energy and resources applied per person. Of course, this isn't to imply that within the closed system of the Earth we have some infinite capacity to reproduce. Rather, it highlights the relevance of what it means to be strategic, intelligent and efficient with our resource use and, by extension, the industrial-slash-economic process itself. Today, there is no evidence that we are at or are closely approaching the Earth's carrying capacity, if we take into account the trends that reveal our vast potential to do more with less, coupled with a value system that clearly recognizes that we, as a species, occupy a closed Earth system with natural limitations overall, and that it is our personal responsibility to ourselves, each other and future generations, to keep an interest in balance, efficiency and sustainability. This educational imperative suggests that a conscious, informed global culture can stabilize its reproduction rate if need be, without external force, if this basic relationship is properly understood. Of course, much could be said about the influence of old, traditional beliefs, such as religious doctrines that appear to suggest that ongoing and constant procreation is a virtue. These views, which originated in the absence of the knowledge we have today regarding our shared existence on a finite planet, will likely be overcome naturally, with education. Likewise, if current regions of accelerating population growth are analyzed, it is found that those existing in deprivation and poverty are reproducing faster than those who are not in poverty. While there is some controversy as to why this pattern prevails, the correlation appears to still be accurate. This evidence suggests that increasing people's standard of living can curtail their rates of reproduction and this furthers the social imperative to create a more equitable system of resource allocation. 1. Food Production According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, one out of every eight people on Earth, nearly one billion people, suffer from chronic undernourishment. Almost all of these people live in developing countries, representing 15% of the population of these counties. Poverty is, needless to say, clearly linked to this phenomenon. Yet, politics and business aside, world agriculture today actually produces 17% more calories per person than it did 30 years ago, despite a 70% population increase. There is enough food to provide everyone in the world with at least 2,720 kilocalories, kcal, per day, which is more than enough to maintain good health for most. Therefore, the existence of such a large number of chronically hungry people in the developing world today reveals, at a minimum, that there is something fundamentally wrong with the global industrial and economic process itself and not the Earth's carrying capacity or humanity's ability to process enough resources. According to the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, we produce, globally, about 4 billion metric tons of food per annum. Yet due to poor practices in harvesting, storage and transportation, as well as market and consumer wastage, it is estimated that 30-50%, to 50 or 1.2-2 to 2 billion tons, of all food produced never reaches a human stomach. Furthermore, this figure does not reflect the fact that large amounts of land, energy, fertilizers and water have also been lost in the production of foodstuffs which simply end up as waste. In the words of food waste researcher Valentin Thurn, the number of calories that end up in the garbage in North America and Europe would be sufficient to feed the hungry of this world three times over. Economically, first world waste patterns can create price increases for the global food supply due to increased demand resulting from those very waste patterns. 
In other words, the first world adds to the world hunger epidemic by its waste patterns on the consumer end because the resulting demand from increased waste increases price values past what is affordable for many. While there is certainly an educational imperative for the consuming world to consider the relevance of their waste patterns in the current climate, both in terms of real food waste and its effect on global prices due to increased demand because of this waste, it appears that the most effective and practical means to overcome this global deficiency is to update the system of food production itself with modern methods. This, coupled with deliberate localization of the process itself in order to reduce the vast spectrum of waste caused by inefficiencies in the current global food supply chain, would not only reduce such problems in general, it would dramatically increase productivity, product quality and output overall. While the active use of arable land and land-based agriculture should remain, ideally, of course, with more sustainable practices than we are using today, a great deal of pressure can be alleviated at this time with advanced soilless methods, which require less water, less fertilizer, fewer, or no, pesticides, less land, and less labor. These facilities can now be built in urban city environments or even off coastlines, at sea. Perhaps the most promising of all such arrangements is what is known today as vertical farming. Vertical farming has been put to test in a number of regions, with extremely promising results regarding efficiency. Extrapolating these statistics, coupled with parallel trend advancement, increases in efficiency of the associated mechanisms of this process, reveals that the future of abundant food production will not only, compared to the current land-based tradition, use fewer resources per unit output, cause less waste, have a reduced ecological footprint, increase food quality and the like. It will also use less of the surface of the planet and enable types of food that were once restricted to certain climates or regions to be grown virtually anywhere in enclosed, vertical systems. While approaches vary, common methods include rotating crop systems in transparent enclosures to use natural light, coupled with hydroponic, aeroponic and or aquaponic water and nutrient servicing systems. Artificial light systems are also being used, along with other means to distribute natural light, such as the use of parabolic mirror systems that can move light without electricity. Many waste-to-energy systems approaches to these structures are increasingly common, as with advanced power systems based on regenerative processes or localized sources. Between various approaches, the capacity is dramatically increased since food can be grown almost 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Common objections to this type of farming have mostly been concerns over its energy footprint, criticizing the use of artificial light in some arrangements as too power-intensive. However, the use of renewable energy systems, such as photovoltaics, coupled with regional placement most conducive to renewable methods, such as near-wave, tidal or geothermal sources, presents plausible solutions for sustainable, non-hydrocarbon-based powering. However, it is best to think about this in a comparative context. In the US, up to 20% of the country's fossil fuel consumption goes into the food chain, according to the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, which points out that fossil fuel use by the food systems in the developed world often rivals that of automobiles. In Singapore, a vertical farm system, custom-built in a transparent enclosure, uses a closed-loop, automated hydraulic system to rotate the crop in circles between sunlight and an organic nutrient treatment costing only about $3 a month in electricity for each enclosure. This system is also reported as 10 times more productive per square foot than conventional farming, with much less water, labor and fertilizer used, as noted above. There is also no real transport cost given all produce is distributed locally, saving more resources and energy. Overall, there is a spectrum of applications as of now and, in many cases, these pre-existing structures, not intended for such work, are being utilized. In Chicago, Illinois, USA, the world's largest certified organic vertical farm is in operation. While producing mostly greens for the local Chicago market, this 90,000-square-foot facility uses an aquaponic system, with waste from tilapia fish providing nutrients for the plants. The farm reportedly saves 90% of its water, compared to conventional farming techniques, and produces no agricultural runoff. Additionally, all of its waste, such as plant roots, stems and even biodegradable packaging, is recycled in collaboration, making it a zero-waste facility. Current statistics vary with respect to the efficiency, often due to monetary-based limitations and inherent profitability concerns. As with much in the market system, 
promising technology finds development only if it proves competitive. Given how new these ideas are, we cannot expect to see many examples nor can we expect to see an optimization of such methods to a high degree for measurement without market acceptance. However, we can extrapolate the realized potential of existing systems, scaling the application out as if it were incorporated in every major city, in its most relatively efficient form. The following list confirms the superiority of this approach to the current, traditional land-based model, not only showing a more sustainable practice, but a more productive practice which can, in concert with existing methods, provide the entire world's population with vegetable-based nutrition many times over. Versatile. Unlike traditional farming, vertical farms can be constructed anywhere, even on water, using upward layers to multiply output capacity. I.e. a 10-story farm will produce one-tenth of a 100-story farm. This space utilization is limited mostly to architectural possibility. Likewise, the plants grown can be on demand in many ways, since region-based restrictions have been lifted since these farms can grow virtually anything. Reduced Resource Use Vertical farming uses substantially less water and pesticide, and is more conducive to non-hydrocarbon-based nutrient-slash-fertilizer methods. Its energy use can vary based on application, but in its most efficient setting it uses dramatically less energy both to power the farm itself and with respect to the now-removed need for excess hydrocarbon fertilizer and oil-fueled transport, which is a heavy burden in the current, farm-based process. More sustainable, slash less ecological damage. The current tradition of farming has been recognized as one of the most ecologically destructive processes of modern society. In the words of environmental writer René Cho, as of 2008, 37.7% of global land and 45% of U.S. land was used for agriculture. The encroachment of humans into wildland has resulted in the spread of infectious disease, the loss of biodiversity and the disruption of ecosystems. Overcultivation and poor soil management has led to the degradation of global agricultural lands. The millions of tons of toxic pesticides used each year contaminate surface waters and groundwater and endanger wildlife. Agriculture is responsible for 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions and accounts for one-fifth of U.S. fossil fuel use, mainly to run farm equipment, transport food, and produce fertilizer. As excess fertilizer washes into rivers, streams and oceans, it can cause eutrophication, algae blooms proliferate, when they die, they are consumed by microbes, which use up all the oxygen in the water, the result is a dead zone that kills all aquatic life. As of 2008, there were 405 dead zones around the world, more than two-thirds of the world's fresh water is used for agriculture. Post-scarcity capacity Students at Columbia University working on vertical farm systems determined that in order to feed 50,000 people, a 30-story building the size of a New York City block would be needed. A New York City block, loosely speaking, is about 6.4 acres. If we extrapolate this into the context of the city of Los Angeles, California, USA, with a population of about 3.9 million, with a total acreage of about 318,912, it would take roughly 78 30-story, 6.4 covering land acre structures to feed the local residents. This amounts to about 0.1% of the total land area of Los Angeles to feed the population. The Earth, being about 29% land, has roughly 36,794,240,000 acres and a human population of 7.2 billion as of late 2013. If we extrapolate the same basis of a 30-story vertical farm covering 6.4 acres to feed 50,000 people, we end up needing 144,000 vertical farms, in theory, to feed the world. This amounts to 921,600 acres of land to place these farms. Given roughly 38% of all the Earth's land is currently being used for traditional agriculture, 13,981,811,200 acres, we find that we need only 0.006% of the Earth's existing farmland to meet production requirements. Now, these extrapolations are clearly theoretical and obviously many other factors need to be taken into account with respect to placement of such farm systems and critical specifics. Also, within the 38% land use statistic, much of that land is for livestock cultivation, not just crop production. 
however, the raw statistics are quite incredible with respect to possible efficiency and capacity. In fact, if we were to theoretically take only the crop production land alone currently being used, which is about 4,408,320,000 acres, replacing the land-based cultivation process by placing these 30-story vertical farm systems only, side by side, the food output would be enough to feed 34,440,000,000,000 people. Given that we will only need to feed 9 billion by 2050, we only need to harness about 0.02% of this theoretical capacity, which, it could be argued, likely makes rather moot any seemingly practical objections common to the aforementioned extrapolation. As a final note, proteins, which are readily available in the vegetative realm, are still brought into question in the modern day with respect to interest in meat production. From a sustainability standpoint, ignoring the common moral issues and arguably inhumane practices still common to industrialized livestock cultivation, the production of meat is an environmentally unfriendly act today. According to the ILRI, livestock systems occupy about 45% of the Earth's surface. According to the FAO, livestock sector produces more greenhouse gas emissions than modern gas-consuming transport. Given that 90% of all the large fish once thriving in the ocean are gone due to overfishing as well, new solutions are needed. One such solution is aquaculture, which is the direct farming of fish, crustaceans and the like. This direct approach, if sustainably driven, can provide farm-raised, protein-rich fish for human consumption, replacing the demand for land-based meat. Another approach is the production of in vitro meat. In vitro meat may be produced as strips of muscle fiber, which grow through the fusion of precursor cells, either embryonic stem cells or specialized satellite cells found in muscle tissue. This type of meat is usually cultured in a bioreactor. While still experimental, in 2013 the world's first lab-grown burger was cooked and eaten in London. Other benefits include the reduction of livestock source disease, which is very common, along with being able to avoid certain negative health characteristics of traditional meat, such as the removal of fatty acids in production. 2. Clean water. Given that the human body can only survive a few days without fresh water, making this most basic resource abundantly available to all is critical. Likewise, it is the backbone of many industrial production methods, including agriculture itself. Fresh water is naturally occurring water on the Earth's surface in ice sheets, ice caps, glaciers, icebergs, bogs, ponds, lakes, rivers and streams, and underground as groundwater in aquifers and underground streams. Of all the water on Earth, 97% of it is saline and not directly consumable. According to the World Health Organization, about 2.6 billion people, half the developing world, lack even a simple improved latrine and 1.1 billion people have no access to any type of improved drinking source of water. As a direct consequence, 1.6 million people die every year from diarrheal diseases, including cholera, attributable to lack of access to safe drinking water and basic sanitation and 90% of these are children under 5, mostly in developing countries, 160 million people are infected with schistosomiasis, causing tens of thousands of deaths yearly. 500 million people are at risk of trachoma, from which 146 million are threatened by blindness and 6 million are visually impaired, intestinal. Helminths, ascariasis, trichuriasis and hookworm infection, are plaguing the developing world due to inadequate drinking water, sanitation and hygiene with 133 million suffering from high-intensity intestinal helminths infections, there are around 1.5 million cases of clinical hepatitis A every year. According to the United Nations, by 2025, an estimated 1.8 billion people will live in areas plagued by water scarcity, with two-thirds of the world's population living in water-stressed regions. As with most all of the world's current resource problems, it is an issue of both poor management and a lack of industrial application. From the standpoint of management, the amount of water wasted in the world due to pollution, overuse and inefficient infrastructure is enormous. About 95% of all water that enters most people's homes goes back down the drain in one shot. A systems-based solution to optimize this use is to design kitchens and bathrooms so they recapture water for different purposes. For example, the water running through a sink or shower can be made available for a toilet. Various companies have slowly put such ideas to practice recently, but overall, most infrastructures do nothing of the sort as far as reuse schemes.
The same is true of large commercial buildings, which can create reuse networks throughout the whole structure, coupled with capture of rainwater for other purposes, etc. Water pollution is another problem, which affects both developed and developing nations on many levels. The American Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, estimates that 850 billion gallons of untreated discharges, waste, flow into water bodies annually, contributing to over 7 million illnesses each year. The Third World Center for Water Management estimates that only about 10 to 12 percent of wastewater in Latin America is treated properly. Mexico City, for example, exports its untreated wastewater to local farmers. While the farmers value this because the water increases crop yields, the wastewater is heavily contaminated with pathogens and toxic chemicals, representing a serious health risk for both farmers and consumers of the agricultural products grown in this area. In India, major cities discharge untreated wastewater into the bodies of water that serve as their drinking water. Delhi, for example, discharges wastewater directly into the Yamuna River, the source of drinking water for some 57 million people. Solutions to this problem, in part, must address the issue of the vast inefficiency, likely driven by the monetary limitations of most governments, to institute proper waste systems, coupled with an industrial design imperative to include reuse system techniques to better preserve and utilize our existing resources. That aside, the most notable, broad solution to compensate for these emerging problems, to facilitate not only an alleviation of the current water problems affecting over 2 billion people, but also to transcend into a condition of relative abundance of fresh water for all humans, is to utilize modern, a, purification and, b, desalination systems both on the macro-industrial and micro-industrial scale. a, purification. Advancements in water purification have been accelerating rapidly with many technological variations of approach. Perhaps one of the most efficient today is what is called ultraviolet, UV, disinfection. This process is highly scalable, low energy and works quickly. According to engineer Ashok Godgill, inventor of portable UV systems, in terms of energy use, 60 watts of electrical power, which is comparable to the power used in one ordinary table lamp, is enough to disinfect water at the rate of 1 ton per hour, or 15 liters per minute. This much water is enough to meet the drinking water needs of a community of 2,000 people. This device Godgill developed for rural, poor areas can run off of solar panels and weighs only 15 pounds and has no toxic discharge. Of course, there is no silver bullet. While UV disinfection works very well for bacteria and viruses, it is less effective with other types of pollution such as suspended solids, turbidity, color, or soluble organic matter. In large-scale applications, UV is often combined with more standard treatments, such as chlorine, as is the case with the world's largest UV drinking water disinfection plant in New York, which can treat 2.2 billion U.S. gallons, 8,300,000 cubic meters, per day. That is 3,029,500,000 cubic meters a year. The average person in the United States uses 2842 cubic meters a year. This includes fresh water used for industrial purposes, not just for direct, drinking, consumption. The global average is 1,385 cubic meters per year. China, India and the United States are currently the largest freshwater users in the world and the majority of that water is used in production, mainly agriculture. In fact, about 70% of all freshwater is used for agriculture globally. For the sake of pure statistical argument, ignoring the highly needed revisions towards strategic water use, reuse systems and conservation possibilities through more advanced and efficient industrial applications, let us assess the simple question of what it would require to disinfect, assuming it was needed, all the fresh water currently being used in the world on average by the population, in all contexts. Given the global average of 1385 cubic meters and a population of 7.2 billion, we arrive at a total annual use of 9.972 trillion cubic meters. Using the New York UV plant's output capacity of roughly 3 billion cubic meters a year as a base per installation of such a plant, we find that 3,327 plants would be needed globally. The New York plant is about 3.7 acres, 160k square foot. This means about 12,309 acres of land is needed, in theory, to facilitate a purification process of all the fresh water currently used globally by the population. 
Of course, needless to say, there are many other footprint factors that come into play, such as power needs, coupled with the critical importance of location. However, let's put this into a larger, more thoughtful comparison. The United States military alone, with its roughly 845,441 military buildings and bases, occupies about 30 million acres of land globally. Only 0.04% of that land would be needed to disinfect the total fresh water use of the entire world, if it were even needed at scale, which it is not. B. Desalination the realistic possibility of mass, global purification of polluted fresh water aside, likely the most powerful means to assure usable, potable water is to convert directly from a saline source, namely the ocean. With a planet comprised of mostly salt water, this technique, if done properly, assures global abundance alone. The most common method of desalination used today is reverse osmosis, a process that removes water molecules from salt water, leaving salt ions in a leftover brine waste byproduct. According to the International Desalination Association, currently, reverse osmosis, RO, accounts for nearly 60% of installed capacity, followed by the thermal processes multistage flash, MSF, at 26% and multi-effect distillation, MED, at 8.2%. As of 2011, there were roughly 16,000 desalination plants worldwide, and the total global capacity of all plants online, example, in operation, was 66.5 million cubic meters per day, or approximately 17.6 billion US gallons per day. As with everything technological, many advancing methods currently considered experimental suggest a powerful increase in efficiency as the trends unfold. One such method called capacitive desalination, CD, also known as capacitive deionization, CDI, has been shown to operate with greater energy efficiency, lower pressures, no membrane components and it does not produce a waste discharge like conventional practices. It can also be easily scaled up simply by increasing the number of flow electrodes in the system. Overall, if we examine the existing methods in general, coupled with emerging methods, we see a general trend of increasing efficiency in both power conservation and performance. That briefly noted, the focus of this extrapolation towards a post-scarcity utilization of desalination will consider only current, proven, in-use methods, namely the reverse osmosis system. The Wanthagi desalination plant is an advanced reversed osmosis seawater desalination plant on the base coast near Wanthagi, in southern Victoria, Australia. It was completed in December, 2012. It can produce, conservatively, about 410,000 cubic meters of desalinated water a day, 150 million cubic meters a year, while occupying about 20 hectares, about 50, acres of land. Since, as noted before, the total, annual water use of the world today is about 9 trillion, 972 billion cubic meters, this means that it would take 60,000 plants to process all potable water usage. Once again, this extreme extrapolation is to make a relative point, since we do not need to desalinate that much water in reality. However, assuming that we did need to desalinate seawater constantly to match current global use, 3 million acres of land would be needed total. Earth has about 217,490 miles of coastline which means, loosely using the Wanthagi model of roughly 20 hectares, roughly 50 acres, with 100 meters per hectare, or 328 feet, assuming the construction was 4 hectares deep and 5 hectares long, parallel to the coastline, the plant would take up 1,640 feet along the coast. This means, assuming 60,000 plants of the same dimension, it would take up 98,400,000 feet or 18,636 miles of coastline, 8.5% of the world's coastline. Of course, that is a great deal of coastline and naturally many other factors come into play when choosing an appropriate location for such a plant. Again, it is not the purpose of this extrapolation to suggest these statistics are of any other use than to gauge a broad sense of what such capacity means, in light of the water scarcity slash stress issues occurring today. Yet, the fact is, it is clearly within the range of such application to meet the needs of people suffering from water scarcity via desalination alone, coupled with an infrastructure and distribution system to move water inland. As a final example, let's reduce this abstract extrapolation more so and apply it to a real-life circumstance. On the continent of Africa, for example, which has about 1 billion people as of 2013, roughly 345 million people lack sufficient access to potable water. 
if we apply the noted global average consumption rate of 1385 cubic meters a year, seeking to provide each of those 345 million people that amount, we would need 477,825,000,000 cubic meters produced annually. Using the one thaggy annual capacity of 150 million cubic meters produced as the base figure, Africa would need 3,185 50-acre plants along its coastline to meet such demand, taking up about 25,158 miles of coastline in Africa, 5,223,400 feet or 989 miles. This takes up only 3.9% of Africa's coastline. However, if we divided this number in half and used UV purification systems for one section and desalinization for the other, the desalinization process would need about 1.9%, or 494 miles of coastline for desalination facilities and only about 296 acres of land for purification facilities, which is a minuscule fraction of Africa total landmass, of about 7 billion acres. This is highly doable and obviously, in this case and in all cases, we would strategically maximize purification processes since it is more efficient, while using desalination for the remaining demand. Such crude statistics reveal that between UV and traditional decontamination, coupled with traditional desalination processes, as they currently exist, even ignoring the rapid advancements occurring in both fields which will likely have an exponentially advanced level of efficiency in the coming decades, the idea of enduring water scarcity on planet Earth is absurd. Both of these isolated extrapolations have assumed only one or the other was applied, in only large-scale form, assuming there are no other existing sources of potable water. In reality, given the existing level of freshwater still available, coupled with a simple, intelligent reordering of use-reuse water network schemes to further preserve the existing capacity, coupled with both large and small-scale desalination and decontamination processes as regions require, many of which can be powered by rapidly advancing renewable energy processes as well, we have the technical capacity to bring potable water availability to absolute global abundance. 3. Energy Renewable energy sources are sources that are continually replenished. Such sources include energy from water, wind, solar and geothermal. In contrast, fuels such as coal, oil, and natural gas are non-renewable as they are based on earth stores, which show no near-term regeneration. As of the early 21st century, the recognition of clean, renewable energy possibilities has been substantial. The spectrum of application, scalability and degree of efficiency, coupled with advancing methods for energy storage and transfer, have arguably made our current, mostly hydrocarbon-based energy methods appear outdated, especially given the ongoing negative consequences of their use. Nuclear energy, while effective and considered a renewable form by some, works at very high risk given the unstable materials involved and the large-scale accidents on record have brought the safety of this form of production into question as well. In the world today, the five most commonly used renewable sources are hydropower, via dams, solar, wind, geothermal and biofuels. Renewable energy sources currently represent about 15% of global energy use, with hydropower accounting for 97% of this figure. Given that over 1.2 billion people are without access to electricity worldwide, coupled with the ongoing pollution and periodic crises associated with traditional, non-renewable methods, the purpose of this subsection is to show how the dangerous realities associated with fossil fuels and nuclear energy are no longer needed. We can now power the world many times over with clean, renewable, relatively low-impact methods, largely localized as per the needs of a single structure, city or industrial application. However, it is important to point out up front that there is no single solution at this time. Given that different areas of the earth have different propensities for renewable energy harnessing and use, application must be seen as a system or network development of a combination of mediums. That noted, narrowing down the most relevant of these abundance-producing possibilities, it is perhaps best to think of renewable energy extraction slash harnessing and use in two categories a, large-scale slash baseload and, b, small-scale and total mixed-use systems. a, large-scale, slash baseload. Large-scale generation, such as four baseload needs required to power a city or high-energy industrial center, includes four main mediums, a 1, geothermal plants, a 2, wind farms, a 3, solar fields, and, 4, water, ocean, slash hydropower. a 1, geothermal. 
Geothermal power is energy harnessed essentially from the natural heat of the Earth's molten core, with plants usually placed around areas where the distance to large heat centers is fairly shallow. A 2006 MIT report on geothermal energy, promoting an advanced extraction system called EGS, found that 13,000 zettajoules of power are currently available in the Earth, with the possibility of 2,000 zettajoules being harvestable with improved technology. The total energy consumption of all the countries on the planet is about half a zettajoule, 0.55, a year, and this means thousands of years of planetary power could be harnessed in this medium alone. The MIT report also estimated that there was enough energy in hard rocks 10 kilometers below the US alone to supply all the world's current needs for 30,000 years. Even with an expected 56% increase of consumption by 2040, geothermal's capacity is enormous if properly tapped. Likewise, the extraction of heat taking place from within the Earth appears quite minor in comparison to its store, making the source virtually limitless in proportion to actual human consumption. Also, since the energy is produced constantly, there are no intermittency problems and this type of energy can be produced constantly without the need for storage. The environmental impact of geothermal is relatively very low. Iceland has been using it almost exclusively for some time and their plants produce extremely low emissions, no carbon, when compared to hydrocarbon-based methods. Apart from some sulfur-produced, small earthquakes can occur as a result of drilling techniques. This problem has been acknowledged as human-induced and improvement in the engineering process is the solution, coupled with clear understanding of the nature of the location for drilling. As far as location, it is theoretically possible to place geothermal energy extraction plants anywhere, if the capacity to drill deep enough was there, coupled with other advancements in technology. However, today most plants need to exist near where tectonic plates meet on Earth. A geothermal map of the surface of the Earth taken by satellite can show such ideal spots very clearly based on heat emitted. These maps show possibilities near most coastlines around the world and while most studies are ambiguous with respect to exactly how many locations could be made available, the potential recognized, in general, is enormous. The U.S. Department of Energy has noted that geothermal energy also uses much less land than other energy sources, including fossil fuel and currently dominant renewables. Over 30 years, the period of time commonly used to compare the life cycle impacts from different power sources, a geothermal facility uses 404 meters squared of land per gigawatt hour, while a coal facility uses 3,632 meters squared per gigawatt hour. If we were to do a basic comparison of geothermal to coal, given this ratio of meters squared to gigawatt hour, we find that we could fit about nine geothermal plants in the space of one coal plant. Likewise, it is important to note that new, more efficient methods to tap geothermal appear to be just starting with respect to possible output potential. In 2013, it was announced that a 1000 MW power station was to begin construction in Ethiopia. A megawatt is a unit of power, and power capacity is expressed differently from energy capacity, which is expressed, in this context of megawatts, as megawatt hours, MWH. Put another way, Energy is the amount of work done, whereas power is the rate of doing work. So, for example, a generator with 1 MW capacity that operates at that capacity consistently for 1 hour will produce 1 MW hour, MWH, of electricity. This means if a 1000 MW geothermal power station operated at full capacity 24 hours a day, 7 days a year, 365 days, it would produce 8,760,000 MWh per year. The world's current annual usage in MWH is about 153 billion, which means it would take, in abstraction, 17,465 geothermal plants to match global use. According to the World Coal Association, there are over 2,300 coal power plants in operation worldwide. Using the aforementioned plant size slash capacity comparison of about 9 geothermal plants fitting into one coal plant, the space of 1,940, or 84% of the total in existence, coal plants would be needed, in theory, to contain the 17,465 geothermal plants. Also, given coal today accounts for only 41% of the world's current energy production, this theoretical extrapolation also shows how an 84% of the current space usage by coal plants alone, which only produce 41%, Geothermal could supply 100% power capacity as per global use instead. 
all this without the pollution from coal, which has been considered one of the most polluting practices in the world along with being likely the largest contributor to the human-made increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. A 2. Wind Farms U.S. Department of Energy studies have concluded that wind harvesting in the Great Plains states of Texas, Kansas, and North Dakota could provide enough electricity to power the entire USA. More impressively, a 2005 Stanford University study published in the Journal of Geophysical Research found that if only 20% of the wind potential on the planet was harnessed, it would cover the entire world's energy needs. In corroboration, two more recent studies by unrelated organizations published in 2012 calculated that with existing wind turbine technology the Earth could produce hundreds of trillions of watts of power. This, in effect, is many more times what the world currently consumes. Wind power is perhaps one of the most simple and low-impact forms of renewable energy and its scalability is limited only to location. Using the 9,000-acre Alta Wind Energy Center California as a basis, which has an active capacity of 1,320 megawatts of power, a theoretical annual output of 11,563,200 megawatt hours is possible. This means 13,231 9,000-acre wind farms would be needed to meet the current output figure of 153 billion megawatt hours. This means 119,079,000 acres of wind sufficient land would be required. This amounts to 0.3% of the Earth's surface that would be needed to power the world in abstraction. Once again, this is not to suggest such a thing is ideal given what land is feasible for wind farms, along with other important factors. This is simply to give a general perspective of possibility. However, one unique reality of wind power generation is the potential of offshore harnessing. Compared to land-based wind power, offshore wind power has, on average, a much larger yield, as wind speeds tend to be higher. This reality also alleviates land-based pressures, given land scarcity and regional restrictions. According to the assessment of offshore wind energy resources for the United States, 4,150 gigawatts, 4,150,000 megawatts of potential wind turbine capacity from offshore wind resources are available in the United States. Assuming this power capacity was consistent for a year, we end up with an energy conversion of 36,354,000,000 megawatt hours per year. Given the United States, in 2010, used 25,776 TWh of energy, 25.78 billion megawatt hours, we find that offshore wind harvesting alone exceeds national use by about 10.6 billion MWHS, or 41%. Intuitively, extrapolating this national level of capacity to the rest of the world's coastlines, also taking into account the aforementioned land-based only statistic research that found we can power the world many times over onshore as well, the possibilities of wind-based energy abundance is exceptionally impressive. A 3. Solar Fields The upper atmosphere of Earth receives about 1.5 by 1021 watt-hours of solar radiation annually. This vast amount of energy is more than 23,000 times that used by the human population of the planet. If humanity could capture one-tenth of one percent of the solar energy striking the Earth we would have access to six times as much energy as we consume in all forms today, with almost no greenhouse gas emissions. The ability to harness this power depends on the technology and how high the percentage of radiation absorption is. Conventional photovoltaics, currently the most common form used mostly for smaller applications, use silicon as the semiconductor and exist in something of a flat cell or sheet. Concentrated photovoltaics, CPV, are generally more efficient than non-concentrated on average, however they tend to require more direct exposure to focus the light properly. Concentrated solar power, CPS, is a large-scale approach that uses mirrors or lenses to concentrate a large area of sunlight, or solar thermal energy, onto a small area. Electrical power is produced when the concentrated light is converted to heat, which drives a heat engine, such as a steam turbine connected to an electrical power generator or the like. Unlike photovoltaics, which convert directly to electricity, this technology converts to heat. Recently, large-scale storage methods have also been used to prolong access at night. A variation of CPS is STE, or solar thermal energy. 
The Ivampa Solar Electric Generating System in California, USA is a 3,500-acre field with a stated annual generation of 1,079,232 MWh. While Ivampa does not use any form of storage, it serves about 140,000 homes in the region. If we were to extrapolate using Ivampa as a basis, it would take 141,767 fields or 496,184,500 acres to theoretically meet current global energy use based on output. This is 1.43% of total land on Earth. Once again, this is not to suggest such a thing is practical nor is it to ignore the radiation yield differences found on different areas of the Earth. However, deserts, which tend to be highly conducive for solar fields while often less conducive to life support for people, are roughly one-third of all the land mass in the world or about 12 billion acres. Compared to the roughly 500 million acres theoretically needed to power the world as per our extrapolation, only 4.1% of the world's desert land would be needed. Likewise, other projects similar to the Ivampa field have been incorporating storage systems. The Solana 280-MW solar power plant in Arizona combines parabolic trough mirror technology with molten salt thermal storage and is able to continue outputting up to six hours after the sky goes dark. In general, the rate of advancement of photovoltaic, solar thermal, storage methods and other existing and emerging technologies continue to rapidly advance, revealing that many installations seen as highly efficient today will be grossly inefficient in a decade or two. As will be addressed more so with respect to smaller-scale renewable energy solutions, the use of solar power localized in the very construction of buildings and domiciles is likely to be where true future efficiency will take place. The issue is making the technology compact and efficient enough for localized, per case use. However, solar field power stations, just like geothermal and wind, have an enormous global potential in and of themselves and there is little doubt that given proper resources and attention, these fields alone could theoretically establish an infrastructure and efficiency level to power the world alone. F4, Water, Slash Hydro Energy Water-based renewable energy extraction could generally be said to have two broad sources, the ocean itself and river-type water flows which use the gravitational force of falling or flowing water, usually in an inland watercourse. The latter is generally referred to in practice as hydroelectric and, as noted before, it is currently a fairly large part of the existing renewable energy infrastructure. On the other hand, the vast potential of the ocean has yet to be harnessed within a fraction of its capacity. It is not far-fetched to suggest that the intelligent harvesting of both the various mechanical movements of ocean water coupled with exploiting the differences in heat, known as ocean thermal energy conversion, OTC, that ocean water power couldn't also power the world alone. Given the existing, fairly large-scale use of hydroelectric power, dams, already, this section will instead focus on the ocean potentials. The most pronounced sea-based potentials at this time appear to be wave, tidal, ocean current, ocean thermal and osmotic. Waves are primarily caused by winds, tides are primarily caused by the gravitational pull of the moon, ocean currents are primarily caused by the rotation of the earth, ocean thermal results from solar heat absorbed by the surface of the ocean, and osmotic power is when fresh water and salt water meet, exploiting the difference in salt concentration. Wave it has been found that wave power's usable global potential is about 3 TW or about 26,280 TWh slash year assuming constant harnessing. This is almost 20% of current global use. This amount of power has been ascertained essentially by analyzing deep water regions off continent coastlines. The theoretical power estimate has been estimated at 3.7 TW, with the final net estimate reduced by about 20% to compensate for various inefficiencies related to a given region, such as ice coverage. Energy output is basically determined by wave height, wave speed, wavelength, and water density. Wave farms, or the construction of wave harnessing plants off a coastline, have seen limited large-scale application at this time, with only about six countries sparsely applying the technology. Locations with the most potential include the western seaboard of Europe, the northern coast of the UK, and the Pacific coastlines of North and South America, Southern Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. Tidal Tidal has two subforms, range and stream. Tidal range is essentially the rise and fall of areas of the ocean. Tidal streams are currents created by periodic horizontal movement of the tides, 
often magnified by the shape of the seabed. Different locations of Earth have large differences in range. In the United Kingdom, an area with high levels of tidal activity, dozens of sites are currently noted as available, forecasting that 34% of all the UK's energy could come from tidal power alone. Globally, older studies have put tidal capacity at 1800 TWH slash year. More recent studies have put the theoretical capacity, both range and stream, at 3 TW, assuming only a portion would be extractable. Tidal, while very predictable, is also subject to daily periods of intermittency based around tidal shifts. Assuming only 1.5 TW could be harnessed in a year based on advanced technology, this means about 7% of the world's power could come from tidal. Ocean Current Similar to tidal streams, ocean currents have shown great potential. These currents flow consistently in the open ocean and various emerging technologies have been developing to harness this largely untapped medium. As with all renewables, the capacity to harness such potential is directly related to the efficiency of the technology employed. The EOEA estimates the current potential at 400 THW slash year. However, there is good reason to assume this figure is outdated. Prior applications of turbine slash mill technologies to capture such water flows have needed an average current of 5 or 6 knots to operate efficiently, while most of the Earth's currents are slower than 3 knots. However, recent developments have revealed the possibility to harness energy from water flows of less than 2 knots. Given this potential, it has been suggested that ocean current alone could power the entire world. The Gulf Stream potential has been estimated at 13 gigawatts of actual output, assuming a 30% conversion efficiency using more traditional turbine technology. This means 13,000 megawatts, or, assuming constant harnessing of the stream all year, about 113,880,000 mwh slash year. The United States, in 2011, is estimated to have used 4.1 billion megawatt hours in electricity. This means 30% of the U.S.'s electrical consumption could be generated by the Gulf Stream alone. Once again, this is assuming the use of only established technology. Osmotic Osmotic power or salinity gradient power is the energy available from the difference in the salt concentration between seawater and river water. The Norwegian Center for Renewable Energy, SFFE, estimates the global potential to be about 1,370 TWH slash year with others, putting it at around 1,700 TWH slash year, or the equivalent of half of Europe's entire energy demand. While still largely in its infancy, osmotic power harnessing through advancing technology is promising. Power plants can, in principle, be built anywhere freshwater meets seawater. They can generate power 24-7, regardless of weather conditions. Ocean Thermal The final ocean-based means for energy harnessing worth noting is Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, OTC. Exploiting the differences in heat existing around the surface of the ocean and below, warmer surface water is used to heat a fluid, such as liquid ammonia, converting it into vapor, which expands to drive a turbine which, in turn, produces electricity. The fluid is then cooled using cold water from the ocean depths, returning it into a liquid state so the process can start all over again. Of all the ocean-based energy sources, OTEC appears to have the most potential. It has been estimated that 88,000 TWH slash year could be generated without affecting the ocean's thermal structure. While this figure may not express total, usable capacity, it implies that well over half of all current global energy consumption could be met with OTEC alone. As of 2013, most of the existing OTEC plants are experimental or very small scale. However, a few major industrial capacity projects have been set in motion, including a 10 MW plant off the coast of China and a 100 MW near Hawaii. One 100 MW offshore plant can theoretically power Hawaii's entire Big Island alone, meaning 186,000 people as of a 2011 census. Now, in conclusion to this subsection of ocean energy harnessing, keeping consistent with the prior categorical estimations set forward for solar, wind and geothermal, it is worthwhile to consider the total, combined, largely conservative, potential of each noted medium. While this will, of course, 
be a crude extrapolation since there are many complex variables, including the fact that some applications are still semi-experimental and difficult to properly assess, this general figure still helps to digest the broadest perspective of the potential of ocean renewables. Here is a list of the noted global potentials, wave, 27,280 TWH slash year title, 13,140 TWH slash year, 1.5 TWX 8,760 hours, ocean current, 400 TWH slash year, old estimate with old tech, osmotic, 1, 500 TWH slash year, average of noted statistics, ocean thermal, 88,000 TWH slash year added together we arrive at 130,320 TWH slash year or 0.46 ZJ a year. This is roughly 83% of current global use, 0.55 ZJ. It is important to note that such numbers are derived, in part, from traditional technologies, with no adjustment made for more recent improvements. If we bring traditional hydroelectric, watercourse-based, back into the equation, which, according to the IEA has a potential of 16,400 TWH slash year, this brings the figure up to 146,720 TWH slash year or 96% of current global use. B. Small scale and total mixed use systems. The prior section described the vast potential of large scale, baseload renewable energy harnessing. Wind, solar, water, slash hydro, and geothermal have all shown that they are capable, individually, of meeting or vastly exceeding the current 0.55 ZJ annual global energy consumption at this time. The true question is how are such methods to be intelligently put into practice? Given the regional limitations coupled with other native issues such as intermittency, the real design initiative to create a workable combination of such means is needed. Such a systems approach is the real solution, harmonizing an optimized fraction of each of those renewables to achieve global, total use abundance. For example, it is not inconceivable to imagine a series of man-made floating islands off select coastlines which are designed to possibly harness, at once, wind, solar, thermal difference, wave, tidal and ocean currents, all at the same time and in the same general area. Such energy islands would then pipe their harvest back to land for human use. Various combinations could also be applied to land-based systems as well such as constructing wind-slash-solar combinations to complement the fact that often wind is more present at night, while solar is more present during the day. Likewise, creative ingenuity with respect to how we can intelligently combine various methods also extends to what we could consider localized energy harnessing. Smaller-scale renewable methods that are conducive to single structures or small areas find the same system's logic regarding combination. These localized systems could also, if need be, connect back into the larger, baseload systems as well, revealing a total, mixed-medium integrated network. A common example today is the use of single-structure solar panels, such as for home use. While the efficiency of these panels is still improving, coupled with imposed cost limitations as per the investment-slash-profit mechanism of the market, most people utilizing these solar power systems are only able to complement their home's electricity use rather than gain 100% utilization. For example, most systems are applied to power the home during the day, while pulling power from the regional baseload grid at night. This kind of approach that seeks to maximize localized possibilities first, before resorting to larger-scale energy use, in a system approach, is the key to practical energy abundance, efficiency and sustainability. To understand the relevance of this more thoroughly, let's expand the example of household solar array application to a possible theoretical potential. In 2011, the average annual electricity consumption for a U.S. residential utility, household, customer was 11,280 kilowatt hours. Given 114,800,000 households in 2010, this means 1295 TWH year was used. Total electrical energy consumption in 2012 for the USA was 3,886,400,000 megawatt hours per year. This equates to 3,886 TWH slash year. This means 33% of all electric consumption occurred in people's homes, with the vast majority of that energy coming from fossil fuel power stations. If all households in the United States were able to power themselves for electricity using solar panels alone, localized energy utilization that is simply wasted at this time, the base load stress reduction would be dramatic. 
Contrary to popular belief, as of 2013 this is a real possibility given the state of solar cell efficiency and storage technology. The problem is that the current energy industry is not prepared for such efficiency and consumer solar systems available suffer from high financial expense as a result of limited mass production, competition and a lack social initiative to forward advancement. It's worth stating here that the financial system and its price-oriented mechanisms exist as barriers to ubiquitous and optimized household solar development in the broad view, along every other developing technology after a certain point of proven efficacy. While defenders of capitalism argue that the process of investment to market of an in-demand good generally reduces the cost of that good over time, making it more available to those who could not afford it before, it is forgotten that the entire process is a contrivance. If price and profit were removed from the system, focusing only on the technology and its statistical merit, both at the current time and its longer-term efficiency trends, future improvements, proper resource allocation strategies and research, could be employed to bring promising technology to the population much more rapidly. In the case of solar arrays for home power generation, given the incredible capacity it has to alleviate baseload energy stress which would, today, further reduce emissions and fossil fuel pollution, it is a very unfortunate circumstance this technology and its application is subject to the whims of the market. If we survey the commercial expense of an average solar array as of 2013, an average home using 11,280 kWh a month would require about 30 panels, with a solar cell efficiency of about 9-15% and a nighttime battery system. This would cost well over $20,000. Such an expense is unaffordable for the vast majority of the world, even though the basic materials used in traditional PV systems are simple and abundant, along with ever-increasing manufacturing ease. Likewise, it is equally as disappointing to notice how modern home construction has made little to no use of other basic, localized renewable methods that can further facilitate the real-world capacity to bring all households, not only in the USA but in the world, to a place of energy independence. Noting the power of solar, other nearly universal applications also apply. Small wind harvesting systems and geothermal heating and cooling technology, combined with architectural design making better use of natural light and heat slash cool preservation efficiency, there is a spectrum of design adjustments which could make apartments and houses not only self-sufficient, but more ecologically sustainable. Coupling this with use-reuse designs for water preservation, along with other approaches to optimize energy-slash-resource efficiency, it is clear that our current methods are enormously wasteful when compared to the possibilities. Extending outwards to city infrastructure, we see the same failures almost everywhere with respect to such applied systems. For example, an enormous amount of energy is used in the process of transportation. While the electric vehicle has proven viable for full global use, even though lobbying efforts and other market limitations have continued to keep its application well behind the gasoline-powered norm, many system-based methods also go unharnessed. Apart from a general necessity to reorganize urban environments to be more conducive to convenient mass transit networks, removing the need for numerous autonomous vehicles, simply re-harnessing the powered movements of all transport mediums could dramatically alleviate energy pressures. A technology called piezoelectric, which is able to convert pressure and mechanical energy into electricity, is an excellent example of an energy reuse method with great potential. Existing applications have included power generation by people walking on piezo-engineered floors and sidewalks, streets which can generate power as automobiles cross over them and train rail systems which can also capture energy from passing train cars through pressure. Aerospace engineer Chaim Abramovich has stated that a stretch of road less than a mile long, four lanes wide, and trafficked by about 1,000 vehicles per hour, can create about 0.4 megawatts of power, enough to power 600 homes. Other theoretical applications extend to pretty much anything that engages pressure or action, including minor vibrations. For example, there are projects working to harness the seemingly small-scale energy production, such as texting on a cell phone in an effort to charge the phone while the phone is simply being touched or moved, applications to harvest energy from airflow from airplanes, and even an electric car that uses piezo tech, in part, to charge itself as it travels. If we think about the enormous mechanical energy wasted by vehicle transport modes and high-traffic walking centers such as downtown streets, the potential of that possible regenerated energy is quite substantial. It is this type of systems thinking that is needed in order to maintain sustainability, while actively pursuing a global energy abundance. 
4. Material production, slash access. Unlike the prior three subsections, which have taken only existing, established methods into consideration with respect to humanity's potential to achieve an abundance of each given focus, this section will necessarily be approached differently. The problem with creating a basis for an overall material abundance extrapolation in a similar manner, taking into account general raw materials, is that the level of industrial revision needed to embrace the high degree of efficiency sought, is radically different from current traditional practices. In other words, we cannot definitively extrapolate in the same way, using an existing, singular process or genre technology in order to draw such a conclusion about the level of productivity possible on the whole. This is because the true abundance generating efficiency mechanism is to be found in the large-scale system orientation, taking into account the synergy present between the sustainability laws inherent to the natural world and the level of efficiency incorporated within the entire societal operation. For example, today there are over 1 billion automobiles in the world. From a narrow view, the idea of an abundance of automobiles would perhaps imply, based on the current property-oriented framework, that every human being on the planet should then own a private automobile. Put bluntly, this is the wrong perspective and an outgrowth of a non-synergetic conditioning which is common to the market system's reinforcement of property as value. From the standpoint of efficiency and sustainability, it is extremely wasteful to employ one automobile per person due to the fact that a person actually only drives, on average, only about 5% of the time. Otherwise, the automobile sits in parking lots, driveways and the like. In the city of Los Angeles, California about 1,977,803 automobiles are reported as in use as of 2009. In abstraction, based on this use time average of 5%, only 98,890 automobiles would actually be needed to meet the transport time needs of the current use demand, assuming a sharing system. In other words, in principle, only 98,890 automobiles would be needed to meet the transport needs of 1,977,803 people. Furthermore, for the sake of argument, with all other modes of public transport ignored and with the entire population of Los Angeles, 3.9 million people, needing to be mobile for 5% a month, only 195,000 automobiles would be needed, in abstraction, to meet the average use time of 3.9 million people. Likewise, in the United States in 2008, it was recorded that 236.4 million consumer vehicles were being used. With a U.S. population of 313 million, using the 5% use statistic once again, it would take 15.6 million automobiles to meet use demand. That is an 83% decrease in automobile output to meet the needs of all Americans, a 32.4% increase in use or access based on total population, in theory. Of course, please note that it is well acknowledged here that such an extrapolation is merely for speculation as obviously many other complicating factors come into play in real life that would adjust this equation greatly. The point here is to give the reader a sense of synergy. What should be pointed out is the noted increase in efficiency, where substantially fewer automobiles are needed to meet the transport needs of substantially more people, due to a system-based, synergetic reorientation, in this case, a car-sharing system. Again, this is not to dismiss the need for improved urban or public transport, nor does it address the importance of an automobile's design. At the root of this issue is really the subject of transportation itself, the reasons why people need such mobility, and how the environment is designed to cater for, or bypass, such needs. This is an enormous, dynamic subject to consider. Also, let it be stated up front that no matter what real or assumed efficiencies may exist in real life, the goal of seeking post-scarcity, as both a means to relieve human suffering and as a method to adapt to truly efficient and hence sustainable practices, is without debate as a critical point of focus for an expanding society. It could be well argued that only a perverse society would willfully choose to persevere with a system that knowingly preserves scarcity for profit and establishment preservation when it is intellectually clear that such a condition is no longer needed and hence any such related human suffering resulting is also no longer needed. As argued prior, the market economy is not just a response to a scarcity-based worldview, it is also a preserver of it. The market structurally requires a high degree of scarcity, as an abundance-focused society would eventually mean less labor for income, less turnover and less profit on the whole. 
If society woke up tomorrow to a world where 50% of the human job market was automated and where all food, energy and basic goods could be made available without a price tag due to increased efficiency, needless to say the job market and monetary economy as we know it would collapse. Value shift. In order to think properly about the state of our productive capacity to produce life-supporting and standard of living improving goods today, we need to first rationally separate human needs from human wants, with the priority of meeting needs first. While this distinction may appear like a controversial opinion to many, in a world where now 46% of the total wealth is owned by 1% of the population, in a world where roughly 1 billion do not get basic nutrition, in a world where 1.1 billion people live without clean drinking water and 2.6 billion people lack adequate sanitation, in a world where 100 million people do not have shelter, in a world where 3 billion live on less than $2.50 a day and in a world where 1.2 billion do not even have. Electricity, perhaps our priorities as a global civilization need to be addressed with respect to the true maintenance of what we might questionably term civilization. The truth is, this priority is not a mere poetic gesture, it is a public health requirement. The process of our physical and psychological evolution has created human needs. Not meeting these virtually empirical needs results in a destabilizing spectrum of physical, mental and social disorders. Human wants, on the other hand, are cultural manifestations that have undergone enormous, subjective change over time, revealing something of an arbitrary nature, in truth. Now, this isn't to say neurotic attachments can't manifest into wants, so much so that they start to take the role of needs, emotionally. However, that is still mostly a cultural condition. Sadly, again, the market does not separate needs from wants in its basic psychology, which is why scarcity arguments can be extended infinitely in defense of its existence and hence the proposed need to have a competitive, trade-based society, no matter the degree of abundance that can be achieved. This has arguably created a type of neurosis, in fact, where people assume having infinite wants and more and more is a virtue or even a driver of human progress itself. Of course, infinite possibilities are certainly a reality in many ways, as society cannot predict what technology will materialize many years down the line as influences change and preferences change. However, infinite possibility is about vulnerability and creativity, while still being strategic and intelligent about resource management and use. This is not the same as infinite wants, which sees the human being as insatiable and indiscriminate. Therefore, Part of this value shift will be undoing the sociological damage done by the psychology inherent to market-based living. A relatively high standard of living can be made available for all human beings assuming, in part, a basic, responsible value shift away from our troubling patterns of wasteful, frivolous acquisition. It is important to restate that the materialism we endure as a society today is a direct response to the economic need to keep money circulating as much as possible. The role of business as we know it is either to service people's existing wants slash needs, or to invent them in the hope people will conform by showing new demand. A new widget put forward by the market is only as viable as the interest of others to purchase it and the use of advertising and marketing has been very influential in creating a culture which sees ownership and acquisition as a sign of social status. This directly assists the need to keep high levels of consumerism in play as GDP and employment are directly related to this pressure. Again, the less interest there is to consume, the less economic growth and hence less demand for jobs. This slows the existing state of a market economy and creates a systemic loss of well-being for many. It can be well argued that a culture which has decided that acquisition and expansion is the path of progress slash success, promoting constant consumption and seemingly infinite economic growth, is going to eventually hit the limits of sustainability on a finite planet. In clear terms, this trend is one of disorder. Social success and progress can only mean, in part, finding balance with the habitat and the other human beings who share the habitat. Sadly, the market system's entire premise contradicts this sustainable value, as the mechanism of economic unfolding does not reward conservation and the reduction of consumption in a direct sense. Put another way, the market is a scarcity-based structural approach that paradoxically seeks increased levels of consumption to operate efficiently.
So, an analysis of our material capacity to bring common goods into a post-scarcity abundance to exceed the needs of all humans on Earth cannot be discussed without also understanding necessary, sustainability-oriented revisions, which will substantially reduce our resource use footprint at the same time. In short, the new industrial design approach is to deliberately increase the performance, per unit, of how we use our resources, seeking to always move along the route of doing more with less. Within this logic, as noted, a series of pressure alleviations toward increased sustainability and production simplification slash efficiency would occur. Efficiency amplifiers. We will call these efficiency amplifiers and the following list presents examples of needed structural economic and social changes which assist this optimized efficiency. The pressure for employment for income or earning a living is removed. In the market model, everyone is structurally coerced to engage some form of trade for survival, whether it is trading labor for a wage or creating a product to distribute for profit. This overall pressure, while often touted as an incentive mechanism for social progress, actually reduces overall efficiency greatly, as it does creativity and innovation as well. This creates a spectrum of resource and time waste since the interest in income generation and the pressure to produce is often absent existing demand. The intent and need to do something to gain income for survival persists, regardless of our modern reality that society may not need everyone to participate in the economic process. In a NLRBE, the idea of everyone being required to produce or sell something is viewed as counterproductive given the trends of ephemeralization and the necessity of now orienting society towards sustainability. 2. Production targeting social classes is removed. Social stratification, which is a natural consequence of market capitalism, creates the need to produce a spectrum of qualities for a given good genre. This spectrum is not based on utility or having variation of a good as per the personal needs slash interests of individuals. Rather, each quality standard is intended to be purchased by, or made affordable to, a given income class. This creates poor quality goods to meet affordability requirements of lower income consumers and hence generates unnecessary waste. In this new strategically sustainable model, no good is created to be cheap by relative standards simply because it fits lower class demographic buying patterns. In a NLRBE, there is no lower class demographic. 3. Inefficiency inherent to the competitive practice is removed. Competition between businesses produces four basic forms of unnecessary inefficiency and hence resulting waste, proprietary incompatibility of related goods components, lack of standardization, wasteful multiplicity of goods by competing businesses of the same genre, incentivized good weakness to encourage turnover, planned obsolescence, inherent good weakness due to seeking cost efficiency, intrinsic obsolescence. With respect to, a. In a sustainable economy, there would exist a universal standardization of all related genre components, wherever possible. In 1801, a man named Eli Whitney was perhaps the first to apply standardization in an impacting way. He produced muskets, and during his time, there was no way to interchange the parts of different muskets, even though they were the same overall design. If a musket part broke, the whole gun was useless. Whitney developed tools to do this and after 1801, all parts were full interchangeable. While most would assume this common sense idea to be prolific across the global industrial community today, the perpetuation of proprietary components by companies that want the consumer to repurchase any such needed component from them directly, ignoring the possibility of compatibility with other producers, creates not only great waste but also great inconvenience. Similarly, with respect to, b, a wasteful multiplicity of genre goods by competing businesses is generated at all times in the current model. While less obvious to many, the general competitive nature of the market keeps new ideas invisible from competitors during development. Then, a good is produced for purchase that likely has some overall improvement of a given feature. Once that feature is on the market, it is then acknowledged and assessed by competing businesses and the race to continue improvement moves forward, back and forth. While many argue this, creative warfare is a driving force of development slash innovation of a given product or purpose, the negative and unnecessary consequence is the rapid, wasteful physical obsolescence inherent to each cycle of output. 
In other words, if a notable cell phone feature improvement is obtained by one company, on the heels of a major release by another company that has already started mass production of their phone version without this upgrade, an immediate state of obsolescence is produced, resulting in less optimized products, which could have been avoided if the producers had been working together, as an industrial whole, rather than hiding progress and competing. While it may be argued also that it is only through price and the patterns of consumer interest that the knowing of what is in demand or not can be obtained, the truth of the matter is that communication could be made more readily between the design mechanism and the consuming public as well. This bypasses the price-demand acceptance-slash-rejection technique that is also wasteful as well since it requires production to occur, in many cases, before the actual demand is fully understood. As a final point, a globally interlinked, shared data, non-competitive oriented design slash production system would also further facilitate the ability to foreshadow component feature improvement over time. This means industry would be able to understand what changes are coming based on progressive trends and design more efficiently, in anticipation of those looming changes. Regarding new C, or what has been termed planned obsolescence, the interest to see products fail or be less optimized to motivate repeat purchases of the same basic good would no longer be incentivized. The practice of deliberately designed obsolescence has been a hidden part of the industrial approach since the mid-20th century when interest in creating economic growth was high. In a NLRBE, this interest is removed as there is no market incentive to pursue repeat purchases and therefore more optimized efficiency, durability and sustainability strategies can be applied. Regarding, D, or intrinsic obsolescence as it is termed here, all competition for market share seeks to reduce input costs to whatever degree possible in order to remain affordable in the marketplace and hence persuade the consuming public to purchase one version or brand of one good over another. This has been gestured in American marketing culture as producing the best possible goods at the lowest possible prices. This inherent inefficiency of seeking to reduce costs creates, as a systemic result, less efficient goods immediately upon production, in the technical sense. Cutting corners in design and production for the sake of preserving money might be considered economically efficient in a market context, but it is clearly economically inefficient in the real world, physical context, as it creates unnecessary waste over time. This is not to say that there are no limits to production optimization given the fact that true design can only be taken on the whole, with respect to the state of resources at any given time and associated limitations. This is to say that the use of mere profit-oriented cost efficiency to limit product quality is a wholly unscientific means for such decision-making. Property relationships that create use isolation are removed in favor of shared access. As expressed in the prior example regarding automobiles and their use time, in an NLRB the property system is replaced by an access system which creates a more fluid means of shared-use goods, which are not needed at all times by a single person. Common examples would be vacation domicile use, transport, seasonal equipment, tools, production equipment and the like. As an aside, apart from a general overall reduction of production per use time per person, this can assist larger forms of efficiency as far as convenience as well. We can imagine airport or train travel, for example, being redesigned to assist access to various goods locally, so much so that the idea of packing a suitcase was no longer needed. This seemingly minor change alone would positively impact queuing, as well as storage in transit, luggage processing machinery, etc. The chain of alleviation is actually quite extensive when given detailed thought. Clothes, communication tools, recreational items and the like could all be made available at the destination airport or similar facility upon arrival. While this is foreign to many as an idea, especially given the personalized oriented nature of our culture, the strife reduced in no longer having to carry large bags and the like could persuade those modern values, given the increased ease. Either way, it comes down to personal choice. In abstraction, a person could literally live without needing to move property around at all, moving around the world at will, without property-oriented inconvenience. Again, facilitating a means of access, where things can be shared, will allow many more to gain use of goods they otherwise would not in the current model, along with less being produced in proportion. A NLRB seeks to create access abundance, not a property abundance. It is also important to note that property is not an empirical concept, only access is. Property is a protectionist contrivance. Access is the reality of the human-slash-social condition. 
In order for one to truly own, say, a computer, one would have had to personally come up with technological ideas that made it work, along with the ideas that comprise the tools of its production. This is literally impossible. There is no such thing as empirical property in reality. There is only access and sharing, no matter what social system is employed. Design-based recycling is mandated and incentivized, maximizing resource reuse. Contrary to our intuition, there is no such thing as waste in the natural world. Humanity has given very little consideration to the role of material regeneration and how all of our design practices must account for this. As an aside, the highest state of this recycling will eventually come in the form of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology will eventually facilitate the ability to create goods from the atomic level up and disassemble goods back into raw atoms. Of course, while this approach appears to be on pace for the future, it is not suggested that such nanotechnology is even needed at this time for us to be successfully regenerative or abundant. Today, industrial recycling is more of an afterthought than a focus. Companies continue to do things such as blindly coat materials with certain chemicals that actually distort the properties of that material, making the material less salvageable by current recycling methods. Overall, strategic recycling is a core seat of maintaining abundance. Every landfill on Earth is just a waste of potential. The law of conservation of mass states that for any system closed to all transfers of matter and energy, the mass of the system must remain constant over time, as system mass cannot change quantity if it is not added or removed. The quantity of mass is conserved over time. This natural law implies that mass can neither be created nor destroyed. Human society's use of resources is perhaps best thought of as a process of intelligent rearrangement, rather than of using and discarding. Material use per a given production output is strategically calculated to assure using the most conducive and abundant materials known. As will be expressed more so in the essay The Industrial Government, a new model of evaluation is created which orients materials based on certain efficiency parameters. Two critical ones are material conduciveness and a material's overall state of abundance. Conduciveness relates to how appropriate the proposed use is, based on the material's properties. Abundance refers to how much of it is available and hence its state of scarcity. Put together, you weigh the value of conduciveness against the value of how accessible and low impact the material is, as compared to other materials that may be more or less conducive and more or less abundant. In other words, it is a synergistic efficiency comparison that makes sure the materials used are optimized for the purpose. Probably the best example of this is home or domicile construction. The common use of wood, brick, screws, and the vast array of parts typical of a common house is comparatively inefficient to more modern, simplified, abundant prefabrication or moldable materials. A traditional 2,000-square-foot home is reported to require about 40 to 50 trees. Compare that with houses that can now be created in prefabrication processes, like mold extrusion, with simple, earth-friendly polymers, concrete and other easily formable and movable methods. Such new approaches have a very small footprint, as compared to our destruction of global forests, for wood. Home construction today is one of the most resource-intensive and wasteful industrial mediums in the world today, and it doesn't need to be that way. 7. Design Conduciveness for Labor Automation The more we conform to the current state of rapid, efficient production processes, the more abundance we can create. Most manufacturing approaches typically divide labor into three categories, human assembly, mechanization and automation. Human assembly means handmade. Mechanization means using machines to assist the human worker. Automation means no human interaction in the process. Imagine if you needed a chair and there were three designs. The first is elaborate and complex and could only be done by hand at that time. The second is more streamlined where its parts could be made mostly by machines, but would need to be assembled by hand in the end. The third is a chair that is produced by one machine process, fully automated. This latter chair design type would be the design goal in this new approach. What this would do is reduce the variety of automation machine configurations needed. Imagine, if you will, a robotic-based processing plant that can not only produce cars, it can produce virtually any kind of industrial machine slash good comprised of the same basic set of raw materials. 
this would increase output substantially. An easy way to understand this trend of simplification is to consider the power of digital software and how one piece of hardware, i.e. computer, can now serve an enormous number of programmable roles. This dematerialization, as it could be termed, is best exemplified by the modern cell phone. Due to the vast program applications now available for such smartphones, from medical measurements to full musical synthesizers, the functionality of these small, handheld computers can now take on almost countless roles. Such roles long ago, before the digital age, would have usually required one hardware configuration for each task. Today, any basic operating system can run a dramatically large number of programmed functions, all contained in a small device. This logic applies to the nature of physical machine production as well as it is simply a matter of time before the act of producing a vast array of goods can be accomplished by small, modular mechanical systems, just like a digital operating system can conduct almost countless programmed functions. Serviceable problems resulting from the prior, inefficient economic process are reduced if not eliminated. This idea is often difficult to fully comprehend as the chain of causality resulting from one general inefficiency can be vast and complex. For example, the resolution of water scarcity alone has enormous preventative potential for disease. The amount of labor and resources once used for treating those then-resolved diseases can find other roles. Energy abundance has the same reality since energy is the driver of all human activity. A clean, reliable, renewable state of absolute energy abundance would have enormous effects on the production and abundance capacity of this future society. Likewise, the pursuit of meeting human needs and the removal of labor for income occupations, which often have no real technical function, would set in motion a new educational possibility, reinforced by an incentive to pursue personal interests and hence the freedom not to feel pressured away from fields of interest since survival and well-being are already taken care of by the social model itself. It is hard to imagine the explosion of creativity possible when this pressure is removed and society is set free to think clearly. 9. Invigorating the group mind, meaning human connection and the sharing of ideas, will bring ever-accelerating progress. Similar to the prior point, the internet has become a powerful tool for research and idea expansion. While open-source research and development gets a fair amount of attention today, the ability to harness the communicative power of the internet to create a global dialogue about any given technology or idea will facilitate a type of interactive development never before seen, once focused. The Game Changers The discussion of advanced technologies which can dramatically transform the unfolding of the future and assist the pursuit of post-scarcity have not been a focus of this essay as it becomes too easy to simply assume the reality of the speculations. A great number of futurists have done just this with mixed results and oftentimes it leaves the audience with looming, premature expectations, waiting around for this or that new technology to finally progress. However, to dismiss these potentials is equally as hasty. The truth of the matter is that our capacity to accelerate such change comes down to our focus. Just as the Manhattan Project was able to bring countless scientists together for a single output goal, as violent as it may have been to build the atom bomb, the idea of global network projects to rapidly accelerate new technical possibilities is merely a matter of choice. We can only imagine the progress of any given project if enough minds came together to pursue it at once, in an organized way. This open-source world approach alone will likely have limitless possibilities. Likewise, there is no shortage of transformational or disruptive technologies on the horizon that could radically alter the industrial landscape. Artificial intelligence, robotics, biotechnology, 3D printing, infinite computing and nanotechnology are just a few. Each of these developing mediums has vast implications for efficiency increases. It is very difficult to know exactly how they will unfold or, more importantly, how they will find synergy but we do know the trends of development are increasing exponentially in most cases. For example, a fusion of 3D printing, nanotechnology, AI, and robotics will forever alter the state of manufacturing, so much so that a person could perhaps have a garage-sized manufacturing system in their home to produce virtually anything they may need. Again, while such futuristic and seemingly science fiction speculations are unneeded to justify our modern, tangible capacity to create abundance, these new and emerging mediums should not be overlooked as they are said to have a great impact, if embraced properly. 
In the 19th century, aluminum was more valuable than gold, even though it is technically one of the most abundant elements in the world. However, before the discovery of electrolysis, it was extremely difficult to extract. Once this technical process was discovered, almost overnight the scarcity of the material plummeted. Today, we tend to use aluminum with a throwaway mindset. Such dramatic historical changes are important to keep in mind as the same kind of advancement is occurring across many disciplines, often hidden from most people's comprehension and far beyond their expectations. Likewise, the aforementioned technologies are on pace to dramatically change the world. Raw Resource Assessment As noted, assessing the state of natural resources to gauge the degree of total-slash-maximum use capacity as per the human population cannot be done by simply extrapolating around current methods. We need to get both a general sense of current inventory levels of all relevant earthly resources and then digest them with respect to the aforementioned efficiency amplifiers which, in effect, radically change the way industrial practice and consumption unfolds. It is also worth noting that modern science has brought a great deal of synthesis into play and the use of polymers, metamaterials and other rapid advancements in chemistry, physics and engineering are accelerating. The end result is that many resources, considered problematic, such as rare earth metals, are finding replacements via highly abundant means. It is important to point out that most perspectives on current resource use trends are quite negative by those thinking within the context of the current model. There is no shortage of negative reports, and rightly so. We have been abusing and misusing our resources to a vast degree, locked into a life blind paradigm which has little structural comprehension of its consequences. However, again, this is actually a mismanagement problem, not a quantitative or empirical one. It is also important to note that it is not how much or how little there is of any one thing in absolute terms. Rather, the qualifier has to do with how we are to achieve the purpose sought. For instance, the available amount of oil in the earth, as would be needed for its non-energy uses today, since in this model it isn't needed for energy, as noted, is only as relevant as our incapacity slash capacity to find other ways to achieve the same goals oil has achieved, but without it. Another example is lumber. If home construction completely transcended the use of wood frame houses, globally, using earth-friendly concrete and polymer processes instead, coming from ubiquitous and abundant raw materials, suddenly a once potentially scarce resource becomes exceptionally abundant, relatively speaking. Moving on, natural resources are best organized initially by dividing them into a. biotic and b. abiotic. Biotic resources are derived from the biosphere and are often called living resources. Examples of biotic resources are forests, plants, animals, etc. By some definitions, it also includes resources originating from life in the distant past, such as fossil fuels. Abiotic resources are often considered non-living resources and include water, soil, minerals and the like. Overall, the biotic resources of the planet have been suffering greatly due to ever-increasing industrialization. Forest depletion, the loss of biodiversity, loss of fish populations and other issues have brought the sustainability of many such resources into question. In all cases, the problem is not a limited supply of these resources, it is a blatant disregard for any equilibrium with natural regeneration and basic environmental respect. The solution to these declines is to obviously deviate from their rates of use. This can be done by simply substituting other comparable materials for those being harvested at unsustainable rates. In the essay's True Economic Factors and the Industrial Government, this process is described in detail. In short, there is no biotic resource being used today which cannot have its rate of consumption subsided by conscious, strategic adjustment. Wood does not need to be used today for all the current purposes. Not everyone needs to eat fish from the wild ocean as advanced and humane aquafarming processes now exist. We have already discussed the ability to produce a vegetarian abundance with vertical farming and the move to in vitro meat can be more healthy and sustainable than livestock methods that are damaging the environment. With such alleviations, we would see a vast improvement in overall resources, biodiversity, the preservation of life-saving medicine derived from the rainforests and so forth. The other, largely untapped renewables, mentioned prior, can also rapidly displace fossil fuels for energy use today. So, the issue is really a matter of intelligent choice. 
abiotic resources have a different, yet similar management reality. We have already addressed our technical ability to circumvent or solve the problem of water scarcity with purification methods and our rapidly depleting topsoil with soilless farming. Overall, the main resources we are left with are the valuable minerals we utilize to build many of the goods we use. These minerals are mostly compounds of earthly elements and are extracted from rocks, from the Earth's crust. Much progress in use versatility has also been achieved by industry by extracting elements and forming metal alloys. An alloy is a metal mixture made by combining two or more metallic elements, such as the formation of steel. There are close to 5,000 known minerals and the number of alloys possible is enormous, with many thousands in use today. As far as analysis, the British Geological Survey, BGS, outputs a statistical assessment of world minerals-slash-elements-slash-chemical compounds each year regarding global extraction-slash-production use. 73 are documented in their 2007-2011 report and hence these can be considered the most utilized for global industrial production. Of those, the BGS in turn updates a risk list of such materials based on stressed or anticipated stressed supply. The following chart expresses the medium risk to very high risk elements, as per their analysis. Reproduced from the British Geological Survey's Risk List 2011. The BGS states the list provides a quick and simple indication of the relative risk in 2012 to the supply of elements or element groups that we need to maintain our economy and lifestyle. The position of an element on this list is determined by a number of factors that might affect availability. These include the natural abundance of elements in the Earth's crust, the location of current production and reserves, and the political stability of those locations, recycling rates and substitutability of the elements has been considered in the analysis. The qualifier of political stability slash governance is actually not relevant, empirically. This is a cultural problem. It should be stated up front that a NLRB is achieved by global cooperation and the common war patterns, the resource curse and disruptions in the supply chain by such contrived, self-preserving pressures common of world powers would no longer be a problem. Overall, the BGS rightfully concludes that substitutability and recycling are the solutions and the scarcest resources essentially suffer from a lack of recycling and a lack of adequate substitutions being made. Rather than address each material noted, the first one listed, rare earth metals, will be used as the example by which problem resolution can be considered with all the others. There are 17 rare earth metals that are considered the most scarce of all elements. Recycling The first great failure is that only 1% of all rare earth minerals are recycled today, according to some estimates. Given their common use in electronics, electronic waste recycling has also been dismal. Based on EPA statistics in the U.S., in 2009 only 25% of consumer electronics were collected for recycling. Likewise, the goods created that hold most of these valuable materials are also not even intended to be recycled for the most part. According to an organization called Second Wave Recycling, for every 1 million cell phones recycled, we can recover 75 pounds of gold, 772 pounds of silver, and 33,274 pounds of copper. If the United States recycled the 13 million cell phones that are thrown away annually, we could save enough energy to power more than 24,000 homes for a year. Substitutions Perhaps more importantly, it is now possible to manufacture synthetic versions of these metals in the context of their properties out of very common, abundant materials, in a lab. Nanotechnology is proving to be very strong in this approach. Many different industries have been actively working to address the issue in each application, such as now being able to make LED light bulbs without these metals. Overall we see the push to solve this problem ramping up and the fact is, resolution is simply a matter of ingenuity, focus and time. Industrial reorientation is also important to add to this problem-solving equation as a larger tier form of substitutability. While this may not currently apply to rare earth metals as much at this time, larger scale components in various technologies are changing rapidly. It is a design initiative in engineering to actively focus on component innovation that can bypass such needs. However, given the rate of change for rare earth metal substitution through synthesis, it appears to be simply a matter of time before this issue is resolved through a combination of strategic use, recycling and synthesis. 
Beyond that, it cannot be reiterated enough that the great failure of global industry has been not to make proper purpose comparisons when it chooses to use a certain material. In other words, it is not intelligent to use a very rare metal in a generally arbitrary and fleeting product. Since there is no referential database that shows active rates of use, decline and the like, companies make their decisions based merely on cost relationships which have very little value in the sense of strategic use by comparison. While it is true that price can reflect scarcity and difficulty of acquiring a certain mineral or element, such a dire reality arises only as the problem acutely materializes. In other words, no real foresight exists in price and by the time price reflects what was actually an observable technical reality at any time, it is often too late and the scarcity becomes a real problem. In an actively aware resource management system, this would not occur. Not only would such materials be constantly compared to draw assessment as to what is the most appropriate material for a given use, any foreshadowed problem can be seen from a long period away and hence efficiency can be better maximized. Land. Unlike prior assessments, the issue of land access takes a different consideration. Earth has a finite amount of inhabitable land and hence the method by which humans gain access to and share land over time is the real issue. Needless to say, not every human being can have his or her own private earth. Likewise, the sickness bred by materialism, wealth and status, which manifests vast and enormous estates by the super-rich, fall in the same irrational category, utterly oblivious to sustainability and social balance. Today, the property system creates a static orientation to land access, with people typically acquiring land and staying on it indefinitely. This tendency to settle seems compounded by the labor roles and location requirements of most in the world as well. The tradition of commuting to one's job in a city center is still very common and hence one's home needs to be nearby. In a NLRB, such pressures are greatly alleviated and the idea of traveling the world constantly is a tangible option. Analysts have found that if we needed to fit the world's 7 billion people into a single city, modeled after New York City, all earthly inhabitants would fit in the U.S. state of Texas. While clearly impractical, this simple statistic reveals the vast degree of variance possible regarding how human beings can organize themselves topographically in a global society. The problem isn't the amount of physical space needed for 7 billion or many times more. The problem is intelligent organization, design and education. That noted, the method of access for NLRB is to create an interactive sharing system. The foundation of this idea will be expanded upon greatly in the essay The Industrial Government. In short, people are able to travel from destination to destination, enjoying a given location for a period, before likely moving on. Such systems already exist in the current system, where a network of people and domiciles is available for sharing. Of course, many used to a home-oriented frame of mind, which has a traditional romanticism, should not be fearful of losing such emotional security. There is no reason why a permanent location for a person or family cannot exist, as we find in the world today. In fact, in a society predicated on access abundance, finding and living in a permanent abode would likely be far easier than in a property ownership society. Yet, statistics prove that today people very much enjoy moving around, exploring and enjoying new places. If it weren't for their labor for income job and monetary limitations, it is clear a great deal more traveling would occur by the vast majority. Once such an access system is set in motion, the network of available places to stay and visit would open up and close down in a natural flow, just as hotels work. When a hotel is booked in full for a given day, naturally others seeking to visit that region look elsewhere. As demand ebbs and flows, feedback is used to produce new structures and the like, no different, again, than how it is done today in the vacation market. The educational and value imperative is the idea of sharing the world. Many today would consider this to be grossly idealized. The idea of freely moving about the planet, staying virtually anywhere, with no obligation to feel the need to return to any central place, seems like a fantasy. Yet, it is very possible. Also, since remote communication is exponentially increasing, engaging in any social-slash-community task or creative interest can occur virtually anywhere as well. Again, this is a value choice. If a person wishes to keep his family in one place for the rest of their lives, there is more than enough space on the planet, 
given the Texas statistics noted, to provide for both possibilities, assuming an intelligent revision of city layouts, responsible conservation and an earnest interest to be efficient. Either way, the same access system can be employed to find and settle a certain location, whether it is temporary or permanent. Oil In conclusion to this essay, issues surrounding modern society's addiction to the use of oil are important to address. Oil is likely the most industrial resource utilized on the planet today, used most notably for transport. As described prior, between battery technology, improved design and the vast renewable mediums we have today, there is no legitimate technical reason we need gasoline to power automobiles anymore. The handful of currently available electric cars today is also a clear testament to this fact. Airplanes and other extremely large powered machines might still need such oil force currently, but the trends show it is simply a matter of time and focus before planes are able to use solar energy coupled with advanced storage means for large-scale, heavyweight commercial needs. Yet, we should always try to think outside of the box when it comes to efficiency and sustainability. In the context of this large-scale, high-energy transport, the question arises, is there a replacement for plane travel which bypasses such high-concentration energy needs? The answer is yes. Maglev technology is many times faster and uses a fraction of the energy. So, even if some oil was used for power purposes here and there, such new approaches could reduce its use footprint exponentially, if pursued correctly. In America alone, 70% of the oil used in total goes towards transport in the form of gasoline, diesel and jet fuel. Likewise, if a new condition of peace can be negotiated on planet Earth, with a concentrated pressure to reduce armaments and preparations for war, an extensive oil savings would also occur. The United States Department of Defense is one of the largest single consumers of energy in the world, responsible for 93% of all U.S. government fuel consumption in 2007. The U.S. military uses more energy than most countries. The military is also one of the greatest polluters in the world. So, working to shut down all military establishments would facilitate a vast increase in this resource's abundance. Yet, as noted, oil is still polluting in multiple ways so using it as we have for combustion is not environmentally intelligent. The real solution is social revision. While the edifice of human society today has a vast dependence on oil and gas in general, generating all sorts of products from plastics and fertilizers, creative engineers have been slowly challenging this core chemical foundation need for many years. Plastics, which are ubiquitous in the world today, have been almost exclusively in the territory of petroleum for some time. However, recently Dutch scientists have invented means to replace oil-based plastics by using plant matter. Likewise, an organization called Evocative has been able to use mushrooms to generate fully sustainable materials, which can also serve to replace many petroleum uses for insulation and the like. Overall, a great deal of scientific work is going into substitutes for petroleum and most are plant oils and fats, because they have essentially the same base chemical structure as petroleum. So, the real issue again is focus. Today, commercially available, non-petroleum-based plastic bottles, bioplastic, are becoming much more common so it is clear that the real solution to evolving out of our material petroleum dependence is an issue of intention by the scientific community. Agriculture is another concern. Fertilizers and pesticides require oil and natural gas and it is well argued that modern civilization, given its rate of food consumption and growth, based on current methods, would not be able to function without these base means. This is likely true. However, that is partly why the prior vertical farming section is so important. Rather than seek to replace these mediums, within the context of traditional agricultural, the solution is to bypass the problem with the new methods. Overall, if you think of anything oil and hydrocarbons do today, you can either find an establishment preserving replacement for it, i.e. the plant oil-based plastics which work in most existing industrial contexts, or a completely new approach based on revised methods which bypass the problem altogether, i.e. vertical farming and its little need for such fertilizer. Not to mention, if we remove oil and gas simply from the main combustion purposes, you then free up so much of it that, apart from environmental concerns, the resource becomes that much more abundant, giving even more time to find further solutions to eliminate any and all environmentally unsustainable realities. Techno-Capitalist Apologetic
At the root of the increased capacity for abundance, as noted prior, is ephemeralization or doing more with less. Moore's Law, which is the phenomenon that computer power or chip performance essentially doubles every 18 months, has been found in the modern day to also include any kind of information-based technology. For example, the application of labor automation, which is a combination of robotics and programming, both of which are defined by information in origin, reveals how the means of production itself is becoming an information technology and hence subject to exponential growth as well. In financial terms, the result of this pattern has been cheaper price values as the efficiency inherent reduces costs to whatever degree allowed. This can be seen in the sharp rise in inexpensive and now ubiquitous technologies, such as cell phones. In absolute abstraction, with all things being equal, assuming society maintained only its current spectrum of use goods, many production trends have the capacity to approach near zero value. Given this, the question arises, at what state of such exchange value reduction, price, does value itself become so minuscule as to become mood in and of itself, as an economic factor? Can we expect that potential to occur to such an anticipated high degree in the market system? The answer is no. The market will never create such large-scale, dramatic, post-scarcity implying reductions overall due to its central need for scarcity to keep monetary turnover and hence keep people employed. It is worth noting that many in the modern technology movements still justify the existence of market capitalism as a means towards abundance by observing this general cost reduction phenomenon. As the argument goes, the unfolding of a given production and its increased demand facilitates better production methods and hence more savings by the company means more savings by the consumer. This then makes some goods available, over time, to those who would not have been able to afford them prior. If taken at face value, this observation suggests all goods will approach zero in value over time, as a given market increases in demand. The first problem, however, is that this argument simply ignores the vast array of general technical inefficiency which can also, if addressed and solved, create those same reduced costs. In other words, it conflates, erroneously, market efficiency and technical efficiency. Globalization is a common example. While cheap, primitive, third-world labor might be helpful to bring the cost down of a given product for the American consumer market, the wasted energy, wasted resources and possibly inhumane conditions created slash exploited to facilitate that price advantage really present deep and caustic inefficiencies, in the broad view. As an aside, while it is indeed true that certain types of technology, usually computer-related, are today widely available for many who otherwise would not be able to afford it, this is a result of scientific ingenuity, not the market. Many traditional economists today make the assertion constantly, that if it weren't for capitalism, etc. The truth is that the market is nothing more than an incentive and delivery system and while the profit motivation may, at times, incorporate high levels of technical advancement which achieve a higher output potential, invigorating this more with less phenomenon, this is but one possible outcome amongst many. Many other highly profitable means can be utilized, which have zero to negative value in the pursuit of post-scarcity itself. Perhaps the best way to think about it is as a self-limiting threshold. The profit goal of cost efficiency is to remain competitive against other producers, while naturally seeking maximum income to keep employees paid and the structure of the company intact. That is the incentive equation. Obviously, no company wants to make itself obsolete by pursuing a state of extreme efficiency. Likewise, profit culture is short-sighted by nature. This means that when faced with a decision for cost efficiency, the easiest and most immediate path to realize this change will likely be pursued. That can, again, mean the difference between updating a technical operation to be more efficient in its process of actual production or simply outsourcing to a developing country which can be paid so little due to existing poverty if it looks best on paper as far as cost savings. The market sees no difference between the two. Decisions are based merely on the trade value and the end tends to justify the means. So, as time progresses, the market process may, indeed, continue to make certain high-demand goods more accessible to those who couldn't afford them prior. However, that is not evidence that the fruits of a true, post-scarcity-oriented society can be obtained on the whole in the same framework. 
it will only be through a direct revision of society to accept the post-scarcity intent, removing the interest to preserve scarcity, which is common today, that true progress and abundance will be realized. This conclusion is also avoiding the vast array of other large-scale efficiency problems inherent to market capitalism with respect to cultural and environmental sustainability, which have been discussed at length in other essays. As a final note, the debate over technological unemployment has proven to be a powerful revelation in this clash of perceived intentions as well. Capitalist apologists have been hiding behind the idea that while technology does replace human labor, it is also creating it. While this may have been true in the slower-moving past, a highly skewed reality has become ever more apparent. For one, the exponential increases occurring today have proven to be outpacing human educational adaptation greatly. There is no one to call on one job loss to job creation process unfolding in the modern world. Job losses today and job loss possibilities for the future are enormous when the machine applications are reviewed objectively, given the exponential trends. The interesting thing is that this very process of automation is a huge part of creating abundance, even though companies, in the logic of seeking profit, are using it to save money. The result is a complex dichotomy, with fewer human workers and hence less money available as purchasing power. Of all the symptoms of failure of the capitalist model, this technological unemployment phenomenon just might be the most profound as it really reveals a clash of system functions. Capitalism presupposes that human labor demand will be near constant and all-encompassing. Yet, if it is cheaper to employ machines to do human roles, how do we get spending money to humans who have now been removed from the labor force due to those very machines? How can the machines continue to produce without the fuel of monetary circulation? In the end, the reduced value argument within the capitalist context simply doesn't work as it assumes a direct balance adjustment between cost reduced price value, saving of money due to mechanization to lower final good price, to meet the ever decreasing purchasing power of the now poorly employed consumers, those jobs removed due to mechanization. The only way this could work is if the profit motive itself was removed, which is essentially impossible if we are to still think within the context of a market economy. The only reason companies employ technology to replace human labor to begin with is to save money and increase their competitive place in the overall economy by some degree. This intention undermines any kind of distribution balance between buying power and cost savings. True Economic Factors The world has changed far more in the past 100 years than in any other century in history. The reason is not political or economic, but technological, technologies that flowed directly from advances in basic science. Stephen Hawking Overview in Greek, economy means the management of a household. The defining qualitative attribute of an economy is its level of efficiency. As opposed to the practice of market efficiency common today, this form of efficiency relates to physical systems, not the interworkings of money, the market and other arguably cultural contrivances. In this process of physical evaluation, we inevitably end up with a set of interrelated components appropriately called economic factors. Again, these components, unlike the vast financial theories in play in the modern world today, have nothing to do with the act of commerce or the like. Rather, they factor in the actual technical processes, hence trends, potentials and measurement requirements, needed for optimized system organization of industrial extraction, production, distribution, design, recycling protocols and the like. However, for the sake of comprehension, even though this manner of economic thought is a vast departure from the traditional monetary-based economic theories we endure today, this essay will still frame these resource-based economic components in the context of traditional microeconomic and macroeconomic categorical distinctions, as would be found in common textbooks, with respect to monetary economics. The macroeconomic components have to do with the largest possible physical system degree associations we can comprehend. The microeconomic components relate to specific industries or sectors, usually associated with singular good production, regional distribution and regenerative specifics. This will be expanded upon more so later in this essay. By system extension, macroeconomic components naturally govern the logic related to the microeconomic components as well. 
For example, the macroeconomic attribute of global resource management has a universal bearing on the proper unfolding of microeconomic operations such as product design efficiency, which invariably use such global resources. However, before these component factors are addressed, a further discussion of systems is in order, along with a declaration of what our societal goals actually are. General Systems Theory General Systems Theory is an idea likely made most famous by biologist Ludwig von Bertalanffy. He stated, there exist models, principles, and laws that apply to generalized systems or their subclasses, irrespective of their particular kind, the nature of their component elements, and the relationships or forces between them. It seems legitimate to ask for a theory, not of systems of a more or less special kind, but of universal principles applying to systems in general. While systems theorists throughout the years have put a great deal of intellectual complexity and elaboration forward, the basic recognition is rather simple and intuitively easy to grasp. The human body, for example, is composed of various system interconnections which not only natively regulate specific processes for a given purpose, such as the heart and its role in blood circulation, these systems always have smaller and larger degree relationships as well. In the case of the heart, the blood it circulates has its own set of defined chemical properties and system behaviors, smaller degree system relationship, while the heart itself is also a component part of the total human organ array, larger degree system relationship, and hence connects with, for example, the lungs which assist in oxygen distribution throughout the bloodstream. Extending this example to larger degree relationships, this human system is connected to an ecological system, which invariably has a direct correlation to human health. For instance, poor industrial methods existing within this ecological system can introduce, for example, pollution into the air, causing conditions that might set the stage for lung problems or other detriments to human health. Of course, system relationships to human health are not only physical in the traditional sense of the term, they are also psychologically and sociologically causal. Science has come to better understand how human learning and behavioral propensities are generated through both genetic and environmental influences, invariably engaging a larger system's context. For example, as noted in prior essays, addiction problems, such as with drugs or alcohol, can often be found linked to early life stress and emotional loss. In truth, the very basis for understanding public health is of a system's recognition, without exception. Now, binding all systems are what could be termed generalized governing principles. In scientific terms, a generalized principle or theory is a foundational characteristic or assumption that governs an entire system. A notable, ongoing quest of modern science has been the search for universally governing principles that apply to all known systems in the universe, as gestured in the prior quotation by Ludwig von Bertalanffy. While a great deal of theoretical debate exists with respect to the complex behavior of certain systems, finding clashes of perspective between, for example, classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, the understandings relevant to efficient economic organization a system design intended to optimize human well-being and long-term ecological-slash-social sustainability need not get lost in such abstraction. Thus, the economic relationships presented in this essay are fairly obvious and easy to validate. However, let it be stated that when the system's worldview is truly understood in its profound ramification of immutable interconnectedness and hence interdependence slash corresponsibility of literally everything in the known universe, traditional cultural notions based on human or social division, such as religious loyalty, race loyalty, class, nation states, patriotism and other manifestations born from a world arguably ignorant of this reality in the past, can create nothing but confusion maladjustment and conflict in the long term. Realizing and striving to think in the context of interconnected systems is critical for intellectual development, hence creating an educational imperative for people to also learn more as generalists as opposed to rigid specialists, which is the current pattern due to the structure of our traditional labor roles. Sadly, our educational system today has been shaped and structured not to create well-rounded understandings of the world, but rather directs focus to isolated and narrow specialties, which reduce systems comprehension consequently. So, returning to the specific context of the creation of an economic model, this system relevance inherently creates an essentially self-generating causality that reduces subjectivity greatly. When we relate current understandings of the human system to the ecological system, we find a process of objective calculation with respect to what is possible and sustainable, 
both in the general structure of industrial processes and the value structure of society itself. In the end, once this reality is understood, knowing that we may never have an absolute understanding of the total, universal governing system, our task is hence to derive an economic model that best superimposes upon such known properties and relationships of the physical world, adapting and adjusting as efficiently as possible, as new feedback, information, continues to prove valid. Put another way, the creation of an economic model is really a process of structural alignment with the existing ecological system already in play on the planet Earth. The degree to which we are able to achieve this, defines our success. Social Goals While diverse global cultures today show many unique features and interests, there is still a basic, virtually universal set of shared needs which revolve around survival. In concert, this essentially comprises the basis of public health, in its broadest definition. Below is a list of general, seemingly obvious social goals, which this new economic model would work to meet, with detailed explanations following. Overall, they are component goals of the pursuit to increase quality of life for the whole of humanity, while maintaining true sustainability in the long run. Goals, optimized industrial efficiency, active pursuit of post-scarcity abundance. Maintain optimized ecological-slash-cultural balance and sustainability. Deliberate liberation of humanity from monotonous-slash-dangerous labor. Facilitate active system adaptation to emerging variables. Optimized industrial efficiency, active pursuit of post-scarcity abundance. Unlike the current, structural economic mandate to preserve inefficiency for the sake of monetary circulation, economic growth and power preservation, this goal seeks to optimize, both technically and structurally, all industrial processes to work towards and create what could be gesturally termed a post-scarcity abundance. In short, a post-scarcity abundance is an idealized state that eliminates scarcity of a given resource or process, usually by means of optimized efficiency regarding production design and strategic use. Needless to say, the idea of achieving universal post-scarcity meaning an abundant amount of everything for everyone is rightfully an impossibility, even in the most optimistic views. Therefore, this term, as used here, really highlights a point of focus. Common examples of current post-scarcity realities, which will be addressed at length in a later essay, include the statistically proven ability to generate an abundance of nutrition for the world's population, an abundance of energy for responsible human use, an abundance of domiciles to shelter, at a high level of quality, every family on earth, along with an abundance of goods, both needs-based, i.e. tools, and reasonable want-based, luxury-slash-specialty items, to facilitate an ever-easing and Improving quality of life unknown by likely 99% of humanity today. These and many other possibilities have been proven as statistical realties for the Earth's current population and beyond, accomplished through what our Buckminster Fuller gesturally called the design science revolution, or the redesign of our social infrastructure to enable this new and profound efficiency. Needless to say, this societal redesign suggests a radical departure from current social norms and established traditions, including the very nature of our socioeconomic slash governmental structure itself. The complex subject of transition will be discussed in a later essay. 2. Maintain optimized ecological balance and sustainability. Maintaining environmental sustainability is of obvious importance given the human species has no independence from its habitat and is strictly supported by it. In fact, evolution itself reveals that we are actually generated from the habitat, further expressing the deeply symbiotic slash synergistic connection. Any negative disturbance of these interconnected ecological systems will likely result in proportional negative disturbances of our well-being over time. Therefore, making sure the economic system in practice has a structural, built-in respect for these natural orders is critical to public health and sustainability in the long term. This aspect itself is, in fact, a gauge of an economic system's own practical validity as a life support structure. It is worth reiterating that the current market model of economics maintains literally no structural acknowledgement of these natural order laws. The market simply assumes such balance will be maintained through what are rightly deemed metaphysical mechanisms related to monetary market dynamics alone a false assumption. Deliberate liberation of humanity from monotonous, dangerous and irreverent labor. 
as will be described in technical detail in a later essay with respect to the powerful, ephemeralization-oriented trend of what is termed mechanization, meaning the application of machines, displacing labor roles commonly held by humans, the need for human toil and suffering in monotonous, irrelevant or dangerous occupations has become increasingly less needed. This new technical reality has also created trends which were once unimaginable, such as the fact that the application of automation has proven to now be more efficient than human labor, making the persistent tradition of earning a living an increasingly irresponsible social convention given that we can now do more with less people in virtually every sector today. Likewise, it is also important to consider the pattern of human employment over generational time, recognizing that the current social detriment of unemployment is entirely manifest from the application of technology to labor. The great myth of the 20th century, propagated by market economists is that technology creates jobs in the same proportion as jobs are taken away by it. This is now proven as statistically incorrect as the exponential increase in information technology and its translation into ever-advancing machine efficiency proves the fallacy of this once seemingly true observation. Today, the 21st century labor crisis shows no sign of subsiding and will only find resolution through a restructuring of industrial labor methods, altering the work for a living tradition dramatically. 4. Facilitate active system adaptation to emerging variables. While this goal might seem more abstract than prior goals, acknowledging the emergent reality of intellectual and industrial evolution is critical. We must structurally allow for adaptation. The aggregate intellectual culmination of human knowledge is and, as the trends currently show, will always be, incomplete. Many practices that might be deemed sustainable or in accord with public health today might very well be found to be detrimental in a relative or absolute sense in the future. An example would be the decades past of oil combustion. While little negative retroactions were found during its early use, today there is a strong push to move away from hydrocarbon energy use due to the growing consequences resulting from its employment as the primary energy source for society, especially given the current state of more clean and more abundant alternatives. Therefore, the industrial-slash-economic system must be dynamically updatable, enabling rapid error correction and improvement as progress unfolds. Again, this type of flexibility is currently missing in the market economy today, since any such changes often have a destabilizing effect on the profitability of related industries. Change in general is extremely slow in the modern period in this regard due to the paralysis that originates from the preservation of market share and group power. It can be well argued that progress is often detrimental to existing profit schemes. Macroeconomic factors. In traditional, market based economic theory, macroeconomics deals with the broadest influences and policies that affect, in part, the dynamics and probable outcomes of the microeconomic condition. This usually relates to growth measures, employment levels, interest rates, national debts, currencies, and the like. In the context of a NLRBE, we can also establish economic components which could be categorically thought about in the same way, only this time it has to do with the largest order governing pressures of the physical world directly, along with how these physical principles relate to the more microeconomic actions of good production, design, distribution, and the like. In other words, it is an overarching rule structure, supported by essentially physical science, to ensure true economic efficiency is maintained and optimized. At the core of the macroeconomic, and, by extension, microeconomic, approach rests the method of thought and analysis itself. This is the scientific method. It is often said that nothing in science can be proven, only disproven. This is the beauty of the method as its inherent skepticism of its own conclusions, if uninhibited by human bias, can assure continual progress and adjustment. Science gives a vehicle to arrive at conclusions, not make them, and it is this system-based logic where all economic decisions are to be oriented regarding both possibilities and restrictions. Inherent to the scientific method in the context of macroeconomic policy for NLRBE are what we could consider earthwide recognitions. These components have to do essentially with the following. Global resource management. Global demand assessment. Global Production and Distribution Protocols These three factors are considered macroeconomic since they embody core, near-universal infrastructure considerations, regardless of what a given production specifically entails or where it is on the planet. 
It should also be immediately recognized that the concept of a national economy is no longer viable in this perspective, nor was it ever, in truth, technically speaking. 1. Global Resource Management Global resource management is the process of tracking resource use and hence working to predict and avoid shortages and other problems. In effect, it is no different than the logic underlying most common inventory systems we might find in the commercial arena today. However, this system has to do primarily with tracking the rate of natural generation to maintain dynamic equilibrium. All known natural resources, whether lumber, copper or, water, oil, etc., have their own rates of natural regeneration, if any. In certain cases, such as the state of certain metals or minerals, regeneration rates are so large-scale that it would be more appropriate to simply assume a finite supply outright. Overall, this process would begin with a total Earth survey, to whatever degree technically possible, tracked in real-time to whatever degree technically possible. The catalog of tracked resource components would include all forms, from biotic resources such as trees, to abiotic resources such as iron ores and the like. Pollution and other ecological disturbances of resource integrity would also be accounted for. While such a total systems approach to this earthwide resource accounting and tracking system might seem like a difficult task, it is actually very feasible in the modern day, with such technology already being employed by respective industries in the corporate setting. 2. Global Demand Assessment Global demand assessment is the process of realizing the demands of the human population. In short, this process would be broken up into a series of regional surveys, coupled with the release of publications that inform the public as to new designs possible in consumer or industrial production. Whereas from the current cultural practice, which consists of public advertising by profit-seeking corporations, often impose status-slash-vanity-oriented values on the population in many respects rather than serving to assist them with existing needs, the process of engagement in a NLRB deals explicitly with creating awareness of new technical possibilities as they emerge, while also allowing public consensus to decide what is of interest to produce and what isn't. This could be termed the market of a NLRBE. In many ways, it can also be considered the mechanism of societal governance itself since this type of social interaction towards decision-making does not have to be restricted to mere good design and production. After all, at the core of any society are really the technical mechanisms that enable order, well-being and quality of life. We often forget what the purpose of a government really is in the modern day. At its core, it is a means to assist economic organization to improve life, ease stress and create safety. The problem is that government today has necessarily turned into a system of essentially organized corruption and mafia-type protectionism rather than a facilitator of life support. In this new approach, a purely technical-slash-interactive system is established which works, in gesture, similar to how the notion of direct democracy has been proposed to work in the modern day where decision-making processes involve group participation in a direct way, goal by goal. With the exponential increase in computer-based calculation power, this type of aggregate societal thinking is now possible. The details of this interactive system, along with an expansion of an integral concept termed as automated design or the calculation of utility-based systems, in this context the system being a good in question, will be addressed in a following essay. However, let it be stated that all designs have a built-in logic towards what works, what is sustainable and what reduces negative retractions, or problems. It is this new, technical referential benchmark that guides the process of industrial design. Now, a final note worth mentioning in passing is that in the current market economy, the demand assessment process is orchestrated in a deeply haphazard manner via what is traditionally termed the price mechanism. Many in traditional economic schools have even argued that the dynamic variability of human interests makes it technically impossible to calculate such demand without the price mechanism. While this may have been somewhat true in the early 20th century when these claims were made, the age of advanced computer calculation, coupled with modern sensing and tracking technology, has removed this barrier of complexity. 3. A. Global Production and B. Distribution Protocols Global production and distribution protocols address the reasoning by which the overall industrial system is to be laid out in the context of Earth's surface infrastructure. This simple notion has to do with where these facilities are located and why. A basic economic factor to consider here is what we will call the proximity strategy. 
In the current system, the property orientation forces facilities for production and distribution to be scattered and rather random in placement. The advent of globalization and the constant search for cost efficiency by corporations via cheap labor and resources creates enormous inefficiency and waste, not to mention a basis for inhumane labor exploitation and other problems. In a NLRBE, the organization of global industrial processes are based on optimizing efficiency at all times, creating a network of facilities, logically based around factors related to the purpose of those facilities. This is actually simple to consider since the variables related can be quantified in importance fairly easily. Since the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, coupled with the modern technical capacity to produce many goods without the need for regional conditions, e.g. advanced, enclosed food production systems, a core concern to reduce energy and waste is to localize, as much as possible. 3a, Global Production Protocols the best way to express this is to provide a specific example by which variations can find a common context. We will use the example of the textile industry, specifically the manufacturing of clothing. Today, 98% of the clothing Americans wear is imported, mostly from China. Most clothes are still made from cotton today. Where does China like to get a great deal of its cotton? The United States. So, today, the United States produces a core raw commodity for the textile industry, ships to China to make the clothes, only to have it shipped back to the US when done. We can use our imagination with respect to the millions of barrels of oil alone wasted over time on this movement of materials, when such harvesting and production could be localized very easily. Again, this is a product of the market economy's internal economic mechanisms that have no regard for true, earthly economic relationships which require physical efficiency and waste reduction not financial efficiency and a reduction of monetary costs. This is a clear disconnect. 3b, Global Distribution Protocols. The same basic logic applies to post-production distribution. Once goods are created, they are to be made available regionally in the most efficient way possible, based on demand and proximity. Once established per regional needs, Distribution has three basic components. 3B1, facility location. 3B2, method of access. 3B3, tracking slash feedback. 3B1, facility location. Facility location is based on logical proximity of a population concentration. This is best exemplified with the current practice today of, usually, placing grocery stores in average convenience about a community though even this strategy is often compromised by the market's inherent logic. However, other technological factors could come into play to ease the movement of goods and reduce waste, along with more convenient access. While local facilities containing the most commonly needed goods might exist in close proximity around a community, delivery systems, such as automated pneumatic tube structures for medium-sized products, could be installed into homes in the same manner as plumbing is built into a home today. Other variations could include systems of access based on specific, regional needs, such as the case with recreational activities. Access facilities can be placed on location for various interests, such as sports resources, supplying needed equipment at the time and place of use. 3b2, method of access. Method of access is best described as a shared library system. This isn't to imply that all items retrieved must be returned to these access facilities, but to show that they can be for convenience. It is certainly a welcomed practice since this process of sharing is a powerful enabler of both preservation efficiency and public access efficiency. In other words, fewer goods are needed to meet the interests of more of the population through sharing systems, as compared to the 1 colon 1 universal property system practiced today. A common example would be specialized tool needs that are used relatively sparsely in the population. Production equipment for a specific project and recreation equipment that might be used only a few times a year are simple examples. On the other side of the spectrum, everyday needs, such as personal communication technology and the like, are made available in the same way, with an expectation of return likely only when the item fails, so it can be recycled or repaired. This concept of moving from a property-oriented to an access-oriented society is a powerful notion. Today, certain rental industries have already seen the fruits of this concept in the form of convenience, even in a market system. 
Again, comparing to the current model, these facilities exist like stores do today, with regional demand dynamically calculated to ensure supply abundance and avoid shortages and overruns. The difference is that nothing is sold and the ethos is of an strategically efficient, interactive system of sharing, with, again, returns occurring also when product life expires or when the good is no longer needed. As an aside, there is a common reaction to this idea that problems such as hoarding or some kind of abuse would ensue. This assumption is basically superimposing current monetary market consequences on the new model, erroneously. People in the scarcity-driven world today hoard and protect impulsively when they have something to fear or wish to exploit goods for their market value. In the NLRBE, there is no resale value in the system, since there is no money. Therefore, the idea of hoarding anything would be an inconvenience rather than an advantage. 3b3, Tracking slash Feedback Tracking and feedback, as implied above, is an integral part of keeping the system, both regional and global, as fluid as possible, when it comes to not only the meeting of regional demand through adequate supply, but also keeping pace with changes in extraction, production, distribution technology and new demands. Naturally, these factors are highly synergistic. Sensor systems, programs and other resource tracking technology have been rapidly developing for various industrial uses. Modern commercial inventory systems are already quite advanced in the proper context when it comes to demand and distribution. The issue is merely its scalability in certain contexts to account for all necessary attributes. In conclusion to this section on macroeconomic factors, the overarching consideration is efficiency on all levels and this has its own causal logic as noted before, when considered in the larger ecological and physical system interconnectivity inherent to the natural world. This efficiency has to do with waste reduction and meeting human needs, always oriented in its possibilities by the current state of technology via the scientific method. Microeconomic Factors Given these so-called macroeconomic concepts, it is important to restate that the underlying principles regarding optimum efficiency, productivity and sustainability are the same throughout the whole model, from top to bottom. This is, again, the train of thought coming from the scientific method, calculated within the near-empirical framework of natural law logic itself. Now, while traditional market-based economic theory considers microeconomics as something of a study of the behavior of individuals, households and businesses making decisions around markets, price determinations and other factors based essentially around the movement of money in various ways, the microeconomic context of a NLRB is quite different. Microeconomic considerations in this new model revolve around the actual methods of good design and production itself. This is basically organized around two factors. Product design efficiency. Means of production efficiency. 1. Product design efficiency relates to the integrity of design itself. Today, cost efficiency and the resulting technical inefficiencies, coupled with the corporate process of competition and the vast unnecessary duplication of specific goods, has created a climate of unnecessary waste and limited product lifespans. There are also, as will be discussed in greater detail in a moment, few built-in recycling protocols, if any, during these production designs as well. This is important because advanced recycling would assist in more preservation of materials in the long run, adding to long-term efficiency. Likewise, proprietary technologies, serving the interest to preserve market share for a particular business, have created an environment where there is very little compatibility of component parts across multiple manufacturers of the same basic products. Therefore, five component factors are relevant here. 1a. Optimized durability. 1b. Optimized adaptability. 1c. Universal standardization. 1d. Integrated recycling protocols. 1e. Conducive for automation. 1a. Optimized durability. Optimized durability simply means that any good produced is done so with the intention to last as long as possible, in this most strategic manner possible. The notion of strategic is important here for this is not to imply that all, for example, computer enclosures should be made out of titanium, simply because it is very strong. Once again, this is a synergistic design calculation where the notion of the best material for a given purpose is always relative to parallel production needs, which also might require that type of material. 
Therefore, the decision to use a specific material is to be assessed not only for its use for the specific good, but also by comparing it to the needs of other productions which require similar efficiency. Nothing exists outside this system-centered comparison. All industrial decisions are made with consideration of the largest system degree of relevance. This interest to create the strategically best is critical to human sustainability, especially when it has been reported that we are using our natural resources today faster than the planet is generating them, due to such inefficiencies. The modern throwaway culture is not only driven by a hedonistic, short-sighted value system imposed by modern advertising and current measures of wealth and success, it is also needed to maintain the paid labor system, a pivotal part of keeping the market economy going. 1b. Optimized adaptability. Optimized adaptability is really a subcomponent of optimized efficiency in the context of design engineering. Today, from automobiles to cell phones, efficiency increasing technological advancements continue rapidly. Yet, even with this rapid rate of change, other larger order attributes remain the same for relatively longer periods of time, as per historical trends. In other words, different production components have different rates of change and this means a system of adaptability and active updating can be foreshadowed through trend analysis, with the resulting expectations built into an existing design to the best degree possible. An example would be the rate of change of a computer system's chip processor, CPU. The advancement of chip power has been accelerating rapidly due to Moore's law. As a result, many software applications, as they improve to embrace these new speeds enabled, will not work on computer system with older chips. This typically forces the user to buy a new computer system, even though the only true issue is the CPU, not the whole system. While other factors can come into play such as system compatibility with the new chip, seldom do people update these chips alone, even though it is feasible. This kind of adaptability is critical today on all levels, which alludes to the next economic component, universal standardization. 1c. Universal standardization. Universal standardization is a set of optimized protocols, generated for mass industrial feedback in a collaborative way that works to create uniform, universal compatibility of all components associated to a given good genre. Today, this lack of standardization is a source of not only great waste, but great instability in the functioning of common goods, since the competitive ethos and proprietary intent restricts efficiency in a powerful way. This practice has been justified under the guise of progress in design with the premise that competing corporations, incentivized by financial gain, will outdo each other and hence be more productive with advancement. While there might be some truth to this, the retardation, waste and instability caused does not justify the practice. Furthermore, it has, and will always be, the sharing of information in the long run that has led to advancement, both personal and societal. Creating a research database of known component parts by industry, actively shared across the world as a point of design reference and feedback in the creation of common parts and goods, is not a difficult task and certainly would not inhibit technological advancement or ingenuity. If anything, it would present more diverse information and perspectives and hence better decisions could be made faster. 1D. Integrated Recycling Protocols this simply means that the current state of component and material reuse is optimized directly and strategically considered in the very design of the product itself. Again, this does not happen in the modern day, in any efficient way. A survey of landfills in the world finds many useful component parts that have been discarded in association with larger systems, goods. Since a normal corporation who makes such items rarely encourages them to be returned for direct reprocessing, this is the inevitable outcome. Furthermore, while traditional plastic, glass, paper and other recycling systems are in place with moderate efficiency, this process is really crude and ineffective in comparison to direct, industry-connected regeneration. In a NLRB, optimized recycling considerations to reuse materials, preformed or not, would be standard. In the end, landfills would not exist in this approach, as there is a way to reuse virtually everything we produce, if we had the interest to do so. 1e, conducive for automation. This means that a given good design accounts for the state of labor automation, seeking to remove human involvement whenever possible by more efficient, often less complex design. 
In other words, part of the efficiency equation is to make the production easy to produce by automated means, taking into account the current state of automation techniques. We seek to simplify the way materials and production means are used so that the maximum number of goods can be produced with the least variation of materials and production equipment. More on this in the next section. 2. Means of Production Efficiency Means of production efficiency as an economic component refer to the actual tools and methods used in industrial production itself. While this could also be considered a macroeconomic factor in many ways, it is considered microeconomic based on the fact that it relates to direct, specific production as well, along with human labor roles. The means of production of anything is directly related to the state of technology. From the Neolithic Revolution, with the advent of stone tools, to the birth of cybernation today and thinking machines that can assess, execute and problem-solve, the core foundation of all labor has been an engagement with available, assisting technological tools. The trend has been an easing of labor overall, with a general reduction of the human workforce in each sector as related to capacity. 200 years ago, the agricultural industry employed most of the people in the United States. Today, only a very small fraction is working in agriculture due to machine application and automation. This phenomenon and trend of mechanization is important because today it is challenging the very basis of the labor for income system, along with foreshadowing productivity moving towards a point of what could be termed post-scarcity. Today, we are more productive with less people in any given sector, relative to time and capacity, due to the application of machine technology. In many ways, this reality marks one of the most significant shifts in our social evolution, challenging the very fabric of our current social system, revealing immense possibilities for the future as far as the creation of a strategic abundance. So, in a NLRBE, this ability is maximized, reducing the human workforce as we know it by a liberal application and expansion of automation, increasing productivity vastly. Human labor involvement, while still necessary even in more advanced phases, is reduced to broad oversight of these automated systems as they are established. Factories are also no longer bound by traditional restrictions due to an eight-hour-long, five-day-a-week schedule since there is no reason, given the massive reduction of human contribution possible. These systems could now function 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if needed. As an aside, the question is often posed, how many people are needed to oversee fluid operations and handle problem resolution? This kind of question can be answered by assessing current statistical trends, averaging them and then extrapolating them forward. However, there is a common confusion between work in the sense of common drudgery by which the monetary incentive is a common reward, and the work which all humans, due to pure creative interest and contributive intent, perform as well. A deep value shift assumed by TZM is that progress in the classic distinction of work will morph into a type of social contribution that is actually of enjoyment and interest to people. Today, all across the world, the human interest to explore, create and improve exists, regardless of the monetary imposition. However, due to the constant pressure for income in the current model, nearly all such acts assume the needed context of a pursuit of money for survival. It could be argued that this has polluted the more natural human incentive system to explore, learn and create, without such a pressure. That noted, the notion of work then in the context of overseeing operations, repairing systems and other maintenance would likely not be reduced to the type of drudgery we so often considered the work reality in the modern day. Rather, the act is respected as a form of personal contribution for personal and social gain, since every act engaged in this type of system has a direct personal benefit to the people working to keep it operating smoothly. Again, this incentive is almost non-existent in the current mode since the capitalist system is designed for all the core profit benefits to go to the owners of the businesses, with the fruits of production often never relating to the worker in a direct sense, absent mere wage rewards. Today, employee-slash-owner relations exist as something of a class war, with animosity between the groups a common occurrence. In this new approach, all acts of contribution benefit the person performing the act, and the community at large. They are connected directly. That being understood, only a very small fraction of the population would be required, as it were, to engage in maintaining the core systems, likely about 5% of the population when industrial methods reach modern possibilities. This 5% could then be broken up across the population. 
So, if a given population of a city region is 50,000 people, the industrial system would require 2,500 people, assuming a traditional work week of 8 hours a day for 5 days per week. This translates into 100,000 hours being worked a week. In terms of the total population this work responsibility amounts to a mutual obligation of each person working only two hours a week. Clearly, this is a hypothetical as in such an advanced system, a system that serves everyone, human values would change greatly and many would likely be honored to take on more hours, reducing the obligation of others. Once again, we are talking about bare-bones maintenance here, as opposed to an immersive job as is currently understood and required. In reality, a free society of this nature could create an eruption of creative advancement and progress never before seen, with people working to contribute in vast, robust ways. Why? Because, again, such individuals would also be helping themselves directly in the process. Any invention or breakthrough in efficiency serves the entire community in this model. Self-interest becomes social interest. So, to conclude this point, this new means of production is about focusing core labor on true technical productivity that has a direct social-slash-personal return, with the most liberal focus on automation and such efficiency increasing technology and automation as much as possible. Conclusion As with anything of this brevity, we have an inevitable incompleteness. Other factors, both macro and micro, could be expressed in further detail. However, if one follows this basic train of thought, a train of thought governed by scientific logic to ensure optimized physical efficiency and sustainability, these other parameters inevitably make themselves known. In short, the outcome of this NLRBE system requires the same type of respectful engagement as with any other natural system. Just as our understanding of the forest and its regeneration and biodiversity has led a basic philosophy to engage this ecosystem with respect to its vulnerabilities to ensure its long-term integrity, the same logic applies to the NLRB as a whole. This social model is an attempt to mirror the natural world in the most direct way possible and could be considered a natural system just like anything else we find in nature, such as an ecosystem. Would it ever be perfect? No. But the logical foundation is there for constant improvement, far beyond the state of affairs today. The following summary tree, as a general outline for this essay, has been generated for review. Natural Law Resource-Based Economy An Economic Model Overview System, Social, Goals Optimized Industrial Efficiency, Active Pursuit of Post-Scarcity Abundance Maintain optimized ecological-slash-cultural balance and sustainability. Deliberate liberation of humanity from monotonous-slash-dangerous labor. Facilitate active system adaptation to emerging variables. Macroeconomic components. A. Global resource management. B. Global demand assessment. Creating awareness of new technical possibilities, public consensus to decide what is of interest to produce. C. Global Production and Distribution Protocols Global Production Strategic Localization Global Distribution Facility Location Method of Access Tracking and Feedback Microeconomic Components Specific Good Efficiency Optimized Durability Optimized Adaptability Universal standardization. Integrated recycling protocols. Conducive for automation. Means of production efficiency. Applied mechanization. The industrial government. Modern politics is business politics, this is true both of foreign and domestic policy. Legislation, police surveillance, the administration of justice, the military and diplomatic service, all are chiefly concerned with business relations, pecuniary interests, and they have little more than an incidental bearing on other human interests. Borstein Veblen Political versus Technical Governance The nature and unfolding of the politically driven model of representative democracy, legislation creation, and the sanctioned enforcement of law are all born out of natural tendencies inherent to the act of commerce and trade, operating within a scarcity-driven social order. 
The development of this commercial regulation and the rationale behind the very existence of state governance is quite easy to trace historically. After the Neolithic Revolution, humanity's once nomadic patterns shifted toward a new propensity to farm, settle, and create towns. Specialization flourished and trade was hence inevitable. However, given the possibility for imbalance and dispute, as regional populations grew and regional resources often became more scarce, a security and regulatory practice manifested to protect a community's land, property, trade integrity and the like. The use of an army, which is sanctioned to protect by public decree, became standardized, along with an adjacent legal or regulatory authority complex, sanctioned to essentially give power to a set group of officials which facilitate such policy creation, enforcement, trials, punishment practices and the like. This is mentioned here as there are many schools of economic thought in the early 21st century that talk about reducing or even removing the state apparatus entirely, falsely assuming the state itself is a separate entity and the starting point of blame for current societal woes or economic inefficiencies. Yet, on the other side of the debate spectrum is a general cry for increased state regulation of the market to ensure more limits on business manipulation and hence work to avoid what has been often perceived as crony capitalism. The truth of the matter is that this polarizing, false duality between the state and the market is blind to the true root cause of what is actually causing problems, not realizing that the dyad of state and market synergy is, in reality, a single power system in play, at once. Irrespective of the merit of any specific argument as to the favoring of the free market versus the favoring of state regulation, all business dealings have historically required some level of legal mediation. This is because all transactions are a form of competition and all competition invites the possibility of fraud or abuse, given the natural pressure of external circumstances and the nature of survival itself, within the bounds of the scarcity-based market. The fact is, any form of commerce that exists in this scarcity-reinforced worldview will manifest so-called corrupt or dishonest behavior constantly. It is firmly incentivized. The degree of corruption itself even becomes a matter of opinion, in fact. The line between accepted business acumen and blatant dishonest persuasion is not an easy distinction to make today in the broad view. Therefore, some type of overriding decision-making power has always been granted to some group body to mediate conflicts, and this is the seat of governmental power, as we know it. Yet, the punchline of the whole circumstance is that in a world where everything is powered by money, in a world where, in truth, everything is for sale, the rapid corruption of any such regulation or power establishment is also essentially guaranteed over time, to one degree or another. Put another way, there will always be a need for legal regulation of transactions in the market by some publicly sanctioned institution, and the market ethic will always corrupt such regulation to some extent with the influence of money because money and business are actually what make the world move. This is simply what is to be expected when the entire psychological foundation of existence is based on survival through acts of competitive self-interest, oriented by the universal assumption of empirical scarcity, with no real structural safeguards given to members of society for some reassurance in survival. To think any regulatory agency would not be susceptible to such corruption, to think state policy and hence coercion could not be purchased like any other commodity is to deny the basic philosophical foundation inherent to the market's notion of freedom itself. Therefore, complaining about state regulation or lack thereof is ultimately a mood issue in the broad scheme of long-term societal change. True social change will not come about by the elusive preference of one of these over the other. It will only come about by installing a completely different system which eliminates both the market and the state as we know it, elevating the entire framework out of the narrow, competitive focus of managing scarcity in the current earn a living or suffer system, to a focus on facilitating a sustainable abundance and the meeting of human needs directly. So, the following economic and management information presents a vast departure from the current, day-to-day -day unfolding of life as we know it when it comes to commerce and social management. What this model does is literally remove the edifice of representative government and replace it with a kind of participatory democracy. This participation is mediated through digital communication methods that can bring the interests of the whole community into calculation, whether dealing with interests of the so-called public sector or the private sector. In actuality, there is no difference in the process of participation and hence, there would no longer be a public or private sector. The importance of this kind of management resides in several areas. 
For one, it assures that human social operation is in accord with basic sustainability principles needed to operate with generational longevity, whilst also maintaining a vigilant focus on producing the most strategically necessary goods at the peak technical capacity known at the time of production. Such management is also about removing the vast incentive and requirement for corruption and corrupt behaviors, abuse and business-slash-government collusion which has plagued civilization since antiquity. The active pursuit of abundance through these sustainable means ensures not only survival and efficiency, but stability, ease and a higher state of public health on a vast scale. Economic Model Defined an economic model is a theoretical construct representing component processes by a set of variables or functions, describing the logical relationships between them. If one has studied traditional or market-based economic modeling, a great deal of time is often spent on things such as price trends, behavioral patterns, inflation, the labor market, currency fluctuations, and so forth. Rarely, if ever, is anything said about public or ecological health. Why? Because the market is life-blind and decoupled from the actual science of life support and sustainability. It is a proxy system that is based only around the act of exchange and exchange preferences. Therefore, the best way to think about a NLRB is not in the traditional terms of any form of market-oriented economic model common today. Rather, this model can best be thought about as an advanced production, distribution and management system, which is democratically engaged by the public, through a kind of participatory economics. This type of approach facilitates input processes, such as design proposals and demand assessment, while also filtering all actions through what we could call sustainability and efficiency protocols. These protocols are the basic rules of industrial action set by natural law, not human opinion. As noted, neither of these two interests is structurally inherent in the capitalist model. Goals, Myths and Overview All economic systems have structural goals and oftentimes these goals are not exactly apparent in the theories set forward in principle. The market system and a NLRB have very different structural goals. Market capitalism's structural goal is growth and maintaining rates of consumption high enough to keep enough people employed at any given time. Likewise, employment itself requires a culture of real or perceived inefficiency, and that often means the preservation of scarcity in one form or another. A NLRBE's goal is to optimize technical efficiency and create the highest level of abundance possible, within the bounds of earthly sustainability, seeking to meet human needs directly. That noted, there are a number of assumptions, myths and confusions that have arisen over time that are worth addressing up front. The first is the idea that this model is centrally planned. What this assumes, based on historical precedent, is that an elite group of people will make the economic decisions for the society. A NLRB is not centrally planned. It is a collaborative design system, CDS. It is based entirely upon public interaction, facilitated by programmed, open access systems, that enable a constant, dynamic feedback exchange that can literally allow for the input of the public on any given industrial matter, whether personal or social. Given this, another outcry is, but who programs the system, which once again assumes that an elitist interest could exist behind the mediating software programs themselves, as will be expanded upon more so in this essay. The answer, as odd as it may sound, is everyone and no one. The tangible rules of the laws of nature, as they apply to environmental sustainability and engineering efficiency, are an objective frame of reference. The nuances may change to some degree over time, but the general principles of efficiency and sustainability remain, as they have been deduced by basic physics, along with several thousand years of recorded history by which we have been able to recognize basic, yet critical patterns in nature. Moreover, the actual programming utilized by this interactive system would be available in an open-source platform for public input and review. In fact, the system is predicated entirely upon the intelligence of the group mind and the open-source-slash-open-access sharing virtue will help bring all viable interests to the surface for public consideration in an absolutely transparent manner. Another confusion surrounds a concept that has, to many, become the defining difference between capitalism and most all other historically proposed social models. That has to do with whether the means of production is privately owned or not. In short, the means of production refers to the non-human assets that create goods, such as machinery, tools, factories, offices and the like. 
In capitalism, the capitalist owns the means of production, by historical definition. There has been an ongoing argument for a century that any system that does not have its means of production owned as a form of private property, using currency as the information mechanism, is not going to be as economically efficient as one that does. This, as the argument goes, is because of the use of the price mechanism. Price, to its credit, has the ability to create exchange value amongst virtually any set of goods due to its divisibility. This creates a feedback mechanism that connects the entire market system in a certain, narrow way. Price, property and money work together to translate subjective demand preferences into semi-objective exchange values. The notion of semi is employed here because it is a culturally relative measure only, absent almost every factor that gives true technical quality to a given material, good or process. Arguably, the only tangible technical data price that embodies, crudely, relates to a resource's scarcity and the labor energy slash complexity put into the creation of a given good. Keep this in mind, as these two value variables will also be addressed again later in this essay with respect to non-price-oriented calculation. That all noted, the reasonable question becomes, is it possible to create a system that can more efficiently facilitate feedback with respect to consumer preference, demand, labor value and resource or component scarcity, without the price system, subjective property values or market exchange? The answer is yes. The modern solution is to completely eliminate exchange and create a direct control and feedback link between the consumer and the means of production itself. The consumer actually becomes part of the means of production and the industrial complex as a whole becomes a tool that is accessed by the public, at will, to generate goods. To illustrate this, most today likely on a simple paper printer connected to a home computer. When a file is sent to print from the computer, the user is in control of a miniature version of a means of production. Likewise, in some cities today, there are now 3D printing labs, where people in the community can send their 3D design and use these machines to print what they need in physical form. The model being presented here is a similar idea. The next step in this scaling process is the creation of a strategically automated industrial complex, localized as much as possible, which is designed to produce, through automated means, the average of everything any given region has found demand for. As will be described, this is very feasible given the current state of technology and the ephemeralization trends at hand. Imagine, for example, a clothing store except that is not organized like a store as is currently understood. It is a multi-purpose textile printing house. You find the design you are interested in online, along with the materials you prefer and other customizations, and you print that article of clothing on demand at that facility. Consider for a moment how much storage space, transport energy, and overrun waste is eliminated by this approach if virtually everything could be created on demand, done by automated systems which can continually produce a greater variety of goods, from increasingly smaller manufacturing configurations. In truth, the real fallacy of this private ownership of the means of production objection is its culture lag. Today, industry is witnessing a merger of capital goods, consumer goods and labor power. Machines are taking over human labor power, becoming capital goods, while also ever reducing in size to become consumer goods. The result is an increasingly smaller and more optimized industrial complex that can do more and more with less and less. It is also worth mentioning that labor automation is now making the historically notable labor theory of value increasingly moot as well. Today, the labor energy that goes into a given good, while still a factor for process recognition, does not have much of a quantifiable correlation anymore. Today, machines now make and design machines. While the initial creation of a machine might require a good deal of human planning and initial construction at this time, once set in motion, there is a constant decrease in that labor value transference over time. Structure and Processes As will be described in detail by section, figure 1 shows the linear schematic of the industrial process, moving from design to production to distribution and recycling. Figure 2 shows how an optimization of such efficiency can be considered from a mathematical point of view, as a minimization or maximization of some functional. Because we are talking about efficiency, we can consider the problem as a maximization of the production function FP. Figure 3 is a table of symbols and descriptions, 
as will be used in the following explanations. It is important to note that not all attributes will be covered in this text. The purpose of this essay and the formulas suggested are done so to give a starting point for calculation, highlighting the most relevant, overarching attributes for consideration. A full algorithmic calculation of this nature, taking into account all related sub-processes in real-life terms would require an enormous text-slash-programming treatment and will likely occur in a future edition of this text's appendix as an ongoing project development. Collaborative Design Interface The starting point for interaction in a NLRB is the CDI, or Collaborative Design Interface. The CDI could abstractly be considered the new market or the market of ideas or designs. Design is the first step in any production interest and this interface can be engaged by a single person, it can be engaged by a team, it can be engaged by everyone. It is open source and open access and it would come in the form of an online web interface. The notion of market is expressed here not to conflate the notion of trade, but rather the notion of sharing and group decision-making. As with the traditional sales market, there is a swarm type of behavior which makes decisions over time as a group whole with respect to what goods will develop, demand, and what goods will perish, lack of demand. In a certain sense, this democratic process is embraced in a NLRBE, but by different means. Moreover, all submitted designs, in creation or deemed complete, are stored in an open access, searchable database. This database makes all designs available for others to use or build upon. In this way, it is similar to a traditional goods catalog commonly found today, except it contains digital designs that can be sent into production at any time on demand. This design creation and proposal system is how demand itself is assessed. Instead of traditional advertising and the unidirectional consumer good proposal system where companies work to persuade the consumer as to what they should buy, with the public mostly going with the flow, favoring or not favoring a company's pitched good, component or feature by purchase or not this system works in an opposite, more involved and democratic manner. In this new, open-source type design approach, the entire global community has the option of presenting ideas for everyone to see, weighing in on and building upon designs, harnessing the power of collective experience and global knowledge. The mechanism of the CDI would come in the form of an interactive interface, such as we see commonly today with computer-aided design, CAD, or computer-aided engineering, CAE, software. In short, these programs are able to digitally create and represent any given product design, containing all information as to how it should be made in final, physical manufacturing. Above, CAD interface design example. As an aside, many considering the educational requirements to engage such an interface might be concerned about use complexity. Naturally, the more dedicated designer will develop the skills needed to whatever degree interested while, for the more casual user, different degrees of interface complexity and skill orientation can be utilized. This more user-friendly interfacing can develop in a similar fashion to how personal computers transitioned from complex proprietary coding interfaces with manually input instructions, to the now ubiquitous, simple graphic interface icon system, which allows users to operate more intuitively. Future CAD slash CE type programs will likely evolve in the same way, making the interactive process more accessible. In many cases, as the database is always populated with current, already existing designs, the practice will be to build upon others' work. For example, if an engineer is interested in the optimization of a cell phone, they have the option of building upon any existing phone product design in the database, rather than starting from scratch. The benefit of this cannot be emphasized enough as a collaborative platform. Rather than limit the design input to, say, a boardroom of engineers and marketers, as is common practice today, literally millions of minds can be brought together to accelerate any given idea in this approach. This new incentive system also ensures everyone interested in the good will receive exactly what everyone else is likely to receive in its advanced optimization states, where personal interest becomes directly tied to societal interest. Also, given the patterns today, likely not everyone would want or need to be a designer. Many people would be satisfied enough by what had been set in motion already by others, with perhaps minor customization along the way. Today, a very small percentage of the population actually create and engineer the dominant technology and goods we use, and this specialization may naturally continue in the future to some degree, 
even though it is to the advantage of everyone if more minds came together. If the educational system is orientated away from rote learning and its antiquated basis that originated in the 19th century social order, we could see an explosion of input and creativity. All that understood, an incredibly important component of these design and engineering programs today is how they can now incorporate advanced physics and other real-world, natural law properties with the proposed design for testing. In other words, the good isn't just viewable in a static visual model with noted properties, it can actually be tested right there, virtually, to a relevant degree. For instance, all new automobile designs today, long before they are physically built, are run through complex digital testing processes that assist in design integrity greatly. Over time, there is no reason to believe that we will not be able to digitally represent and set in motion for testing most all known laws of nature, applying them in different contexts, virtually. Optimized Efficiency Standards Efficiency standards are standards by which a given design must conform. This evaluation will be calculated automatically, or algorithmically, by the CDS's programming. This can also be thought of as a filtering process. In short, any proposed design will be digitally filtered through a series of sustainability and efficiency protocols which relate not only to the state of existing resources, but also to the current performance of the total industrial system. These would include the following efficiency standards. A. Strategically maximize durability. B. Strategically maximized adaptability. C. Strategic standardization of genre components. D. Strategically integrated recycling conduciveness. E. Strategic conduciveness for labor automation. Figure 4. Symbolic logic for the optimized design efficiency function. As per Figure 4, design efficiency E. Design is one of the main factors that can affect the overall efficiency of the manufacturing and distribution process. This design efficiency depends on several key factors, which can be called current efficiency standards e.design. I, here the index 1, corresponds to some particular standard. Each standard will be generally explored as follows, expanding in certain cases with respect to the symbolic logic associated, for the sake of clarity. Strategically maximized durability means to make the good as strong and lasting as relevant. The materials utilized, comparatively assuming possible substitutions due to levels of scarcity or other factors, would be dynamically calculated, likely automatically by the design system, to be most conducive to an optimized durability standard. Durability TD Maximization This durability TD, D1, D2 DI, maximization, can be considered as a local optimization issue. It can be analyzed by introducing the factors D which affect it where D1O, D2O, DIO are some optimal values of the factors. B, strategically maximized adaptability odd sign means the highest state of flexibility for replacing component parts is made. In the event a component part of a good becomes defective or out of date, the design facilitates that such components are easily replaced to maximize full product lifespan, always avoiding the interest to replace the good as a whole. C. Strategic standardization of genre components G1C, GC2, GI, GCNC means all new designs either conform to or replace existing components, which are either already in existence or outdated due a lack of comparative efficiency. This logic should not only apply to a given product, it should apply to the entire good genre, however possible. The aim is to minimize the total number of genre components and see. In other words, the standardization of the process will enable the possibility of lowering the number NC to a possible minimum. D. Recycling conduciveness CR means every design must conform to the current state of regenerative possibility. The breakdown of any good must be anticipated in the initial design and allowed for in the most optimized way. Strategic conduciveness for labor automation means that the current state of optimized, automated production is also taken into account, seeking to refine the design to be most conducive to production with the least amount of complexity, human labor, or monitoring. Again, we seek to simplify the way materials and production means are used so that the maximum number of goods can be produced with the least variation of materials and production equipment. This is denoted by human labor HL and automated labor AL. The aim is to minimize the human interaction with the production process. This can be written as
Using this equation, we could also write a simpler condition, where Li are factors that influence human and automatic labor. So, returning to figure 4, this optimized design efficiency function can be described by a function f design where td is durability, ad sign is adaptability, cr is recycling conduciveness, nc is the minimum number of genre components and hl is a human labor. The industrial network. The industrial network refers to the basic network of physical facilities that are directly connected to the design and database system just described. The system connects servers, production facilities, distribution facilities, and recycling facilities. Figure 5. Industrial Network Visual Aid Design Servers These computer servers connect the design database to the designers slash consumers, while constantly being updated with relevant physical data to guide the process of product creation in the most optimized and sustainable way. As noted, the engaged CDI, or Collaborative Design Interface, is an open-source program that facilitates collective, computer-aided design, running each step through the set of efficiency and sustainability filters, i.e. Figure 4, which assure optimized design. These designs are tested in real-time, digitally, and in most cases, the good will exist in whatever state online for others to obtain, on demand, or for use as a preliminary model by which new ideas can be built upon. Production Facilities these structures facilitate the actual manufacturing of a given design. These would evolve as automated factories that increasingly are able to produce more with fewer material inputs and fewer machine configurations. Again, if the interest existed to consciously overcome unnecessary design complexities, we can further this efficiency trend with an ever lower environmental impact and ever lower resource use per task, while maximizing our abundance producing potential. The number of production facilities, whether homogeneous or heterogeneous, would be strategically distributed topographically based on population statistics, no different than how grocery stores today try to average distances between pockets of people around neighborhoods. This is the proximity strategy, which will be revisited in this essay. Distribution facilities Distribution can either occur directly from the production facility, usually in the case of an on-demand, one-off production for custom use, or sent to a distribution library for public access in mass, based on regional demand interest. Some goods will be conducive to low demand, custom production, and some will not. Food is the easiest example of a mass production necessity, while a personally tailored piece of furniture would come directly from the manufacturing facility once created. It is worth reiterating that regardless of whether the good is classified to go to a library or directly to a user, this is still an access system. In other words, at any time, the user of the custom or mass-produced good can return the item for reprocessing or restocking. Recycling facilities Recycling facilities would likely exist as part of the production facility, allowing access to returned parts for updating and reprocessing. As noted in the design protocol, all goods have been pre-optimized for conducive recycling. The goal here is a zero-waste economy. Whether it is a phone, a couch, a computer, a jacket, or a book, everything goes back to a recycling facility, likely the point of origin, which will directly reprocess any item as best it can. Of course, an item may be returned elsewhere if needed, the integrated and standardized production and recycling centers, having been conceived of as a complete, compatible and holistic system, would be able to handle returned goods optimally, as is not the case today. Global Resource and System Management These four facilities are also connected, to one degree or another, to a Global Resource Management GRM, network, which is a sensor and measurement system that provides feedback and information about the current state of raw materials and the environment. Resource Management, Feedback and Value As noted, this computer-aided design and engineering process does not exist in a vacuum, it does not process designs with no input as to the current state of the planet and its resources. Connected to the design process, literally built into the noted optimized design efficiency function, is dynamic feedback from an Earth-wide accounting system that gives data about all relevant resources that pertain to all productions. To whatever degree technically possible, all raw materials and related resources are tracked and monitored, in as close to real time as possible. This is mainly because maintaining equilibrium with the Earth's regenerative processes, 
while also working strategically to maximize the use of the most abundant materials, while minimizing anything with emerging scarcity, is a critical efficiency calculation. Again, this is, in part, the purpose of the global resource management system mentioned prior. As far as value calculation, perhaps the two most important measures, which will undergo constant dynamic recalculation through feedback as industry unfolds, is the level of a. scarcity and the degree of b. labor complexity. Scarcity value can be assigned a numerical value, from 1 to 100. One would denote the most severe scarcity with respect to the current rate of use and 100 the least severe. 50 would be the steady state dividing line. The scarcity value of any given resource would exist at some value along this line, dynamically updated by the Global Resource Management Network. Figure 6. Scarcity Rank Visual Aid. For example, if the use of wood passes the steady state level of 50, which would mean consumption is currently surpassing the Earth's natural regeneration rate, this would trigger a counter move of some kind, such as the process of a material substitution or finding a replacement for wood in any future productions. As far as a comparative evaluation, in a market system the price mechanism is used to decide which material is more cost-efficient, assuming a given price will have already accounted for relevant technical information or, in this case, the issue of scarcity. This new approach, rather than use price to compare or assess value, accounts for a given technical quality directly by a comparative quantification. In the case of scarcity concerns, it is best to organize genres or groups of similar used materials and quantify, to the highest degree possible, their related properties and degrees of efficiency for any given purpose. Then, a general numerical value spectrum is applied to those relationships. For example, there is a spectrum of metals that have different efficiencies for electrical conductivity. These efficiencies can be physically quantified and then compared by value. So, if copper, a conductive metal, goes below the 50 value of equilibrium regarding its scarcity, calculations are triggered by the management program to compare the state of other conducive materials, their scarcity level and their efficiency level, preparing for substitution. This is just one example, and naturally this type of reasoning would get extremely complicated depending on the material and purpose problems posed. However, that is exactly why it is calculated by machine, not people. The human mind, either singly or organized into large groups, simply cannot process such data effectively. Also, it is worth pointing out that this type of direct value calculation, based around purpose, conduciveness and sustainability, dramatically eclipses the price mechanism when it comes to true resource awareness and intelligent resource management in calculation. Likewise, labor complexity and its assessment simply means estimating the complexity of a given production and drawing a numerical value based on the degree of process complexity. Complexity, in the context of an automation-oriented industry, can be quantified by defining and comparing the number of process stages. Any given good production can be foreshadowed as to how many stages of production processing it will take. It can then be compared to other good productions, ideally in the same purpose genre for a quantifiable assessment. In other words, the units of measurement are these stages. For example, a chair that can be molded in three minutes, from simple polymers in one process, will have a lower labor complexity value than a chair which requires automated assembly down a more tedious production chain with mixed materials. In the event a given process value is too complex or hence comparatively inefficient in terms of what is currently possible, by comparison to an already existing design of a similar nature, the design would be flagged and would hence need to be reevaluated. Such adjustments and flagging would come in the form of feedback from the design interface during the design stage. There is also no reason not to assume that with ongoing advancement in AI, the system could actually feedback with actual suggestions or even direct solutions to a given efficiency or sustainability problem in real time. Design calculation. Those generalizations noted, a walkthrough of this overall, linear process is expressed below. There will be some repetition here, for the sake of clarity. If we were to look at good design in the broadest possible way with respect to industrial unfolding, we end up with about four functions or processes, each relating to the four dominant, linear stages, including design, production, distribution and recycling. 
Again, each of these processes is directly tied to the global resource management system that provides value feedback that assists in the regulatory apparatus to ensure efficiency and sustainability. The following propositions apply. Figure 1 – All product designs must adapt to 1 – Optimized design efficiency 2 – Optimized production efficiency 3 – Optimized distribution efficiency 4 – Optimized recycling efficiency Figure 1. Repeated. 1. Optimized design efficiency. A product design must meet or adapt to criteria set by current efficiency standards at Azigni. Current efficiency standards have five evaluative sub-processes, as expressed before, durability equals TD, adaptability equals ADE sign, standardization equals NC, recycling conduciveness equals CR, automation conduciveness, Equals HL, please note that further breakdown of each of these sub-processes and logical associations can be figuratively made as well to ever reducing minutiae. However, as noted, this expression is the top tier by which all other sub-processes are oriented. It is, again, not the scope of this text to provide all attributes of a working algorithm. It is also not implied here that the parameters expressed are total or absolutely complete. Two. Optimized production efficiency. This filter's parameters can change based on the nature of the facilities and how much machine variation in production, fixed automation versus flexible automation, is required at a given time. For the purpose of expression, two facility types will be distinguished, one for high demand or mass production and one for low demand or short run, custom goods. Figure 7. Dividing by low and high. Application of the class determination process. Very simply, a class determination is made which splits DS the destination facilities based upon the nature of production requirements. The high demand target assumes fixed automation A, AI, meaning unvaried production methods ideal for high demand slash mass production. The low demand target uses flexible automation A, T, DC, T, AI, which can do a variety of things but usually in shorter runs. Again, this schematic assumes only two types of facilities are needed. There could be more facility types based upon production factors, generating more splitting conditions. However, if the design rules are respected, there shouldn't be too much variation over time as the intent is always to reduce and simplify. To state the process in linear form, Figure 7 All product designs are filtered by a demand class determination process. The demand class determination process filters based on the standard set for low demand or high demand. All low consumer demand product designs are to be manufactured by the flexible automation process. All high consumer demand product designs are to be manufactured by the fixed automation process. Also, both the manufacturing of low consumer demand and high consumer demand product designs will be regionally allocated as per the proximity strategy of the manufacturing facilities. 3. Optimized distribution efficiency. Once process 2 is finished, the product design becomes a product and moves to the optimized distribution efficiency filter. In short, all products are allocated based on its prior demand class determination. Low consumer demand products follow the direct distribution process. High consumer demand productions follow the mass distribution process, which would likely be the libraries mentioned prior. Both the low consumer demand and high consumer demand product will be regionally allocated as per the proximity strategy, as before. Figure 8. Illustration of the distribution schemes. A. Left, direct distribution, low demand case, B. Right, mass distribution, high demand case. In the case of low consumer demand, the distribution scheme is direct, figure 8a. In this case, the product goes directly to the consumer without the help of network intermediaries. In the case of high consumer demand, the distribution scheme is mass, figure 8b. In this case, the product goes to intermediary facilities, such as libraries D to engage the potential consumer CI. Similar to the production efficiency considerations, in the case of distribution efficiency EDIST, for the low and high demand, the distribution process will be optimized in terms of the distance DIST to the existing facilities. 
In this case, the facilities are places in regional distribution, libraries, based on the level of demand in the given region. IE Proximity Strategy DP 4. Optimized Recycling Efficiency After distribution, the product then goes through its life cycle. Once its life cycle ends, the product becomes void and moves to process number 4, or the optimized recycling efficiency, filter. In short, all voided products will follow the current, regenerated protocol, PREG. This protocol embraces the standards employed at that time to ensure the optimized reuse or reincorporation of any given good or component. Naturally, the subprocesses of this are vast and complex, and it is the role of engineers, embracing natural law physics, to best understand exactly what parameters will be set. The domestic economy. The prior schematic regarding sustainable and technically efficient processes optimized dynamically to gain the most stability and maximize the potential of any given economic operation is both extremely complex in detail and deceptively simple in theory. The tedium of creating a complete, industry-orienting algorithm that serves as the natural law regulatory filter by which humanity can assure the most optimized technical practices is certainly a major intellectual project to undertake, once again. The subprocesses inherent to such a multidimensional calculation would run into the thousands, for sure. Yet, at the same time, the unfolding of the overall process is quite elegant in form. The idea of placing each human, if interested, at the helm of industrial creation, facilitating the group mind interaction for problem solving and creation, contains a deeply unifying community gesture, coupled with a kind of personal freedom of expression in the creative process which has not been seen before. The very notion of extremely versatile, on-demand production systems which can produce a good for a single person or goods for an entire cultural demographic, is profound in its implications, not to mention the vast positive outcomes inherent when it comes to creating a more peaceful, humane society. Given the technological trends, it is not far-fetched to imagine a small town which, just as it may today have an electrical grid which unifies that town in its central source of power, now has a production plant network designed to literally create most everything that town may need, on demand. Raw resources are brought into the plant as per conditions and allocation algorithms surrounding the global resource management system, which connects all such economic facilities both regionally and globally. Yet, within this scenario, the role of the human being is often confused. While the pursuit of post-scarcity in this way will create a sustainable and abundance-generating paradigm where people can live without the burden of working for a living, the debate over what will people do, is a question that often arises, along with another inevitable question, who is running the machines for no pay? The first question gets to the heart of human values. People have always found interesting things to do and explore, and it is severely doubted that an era of boredom would arise given that people would no longer need to fight just to live a high-quality life. Rather, people might very well be elevated to a new type of existence and engage in higher-order interests that were simply unattainable in the prior model. The second question is more interesting. In an automated economy, which strategically works to remove humans from any kind of monotonous, difficult or unsafe labor, there will still be some basic need for oversight and management. For many who shun post-scarcity rhetoric, this fallback is common, arguing that only in a 100% automated utopia, where people literally have no obligation, would the society be possible. Otherwise, some subculture will be required to do the remaining labor and hence some kind of stratified oppression would be inherent. The problem with this assumption is that it is deeply locked into a market-oriented worldview where time is equated to money. People today have a knee-jerk reaction to assume that in order for anything to actually get done, money must be in play as an incentive. Yet, statistically, this is simply untrue. In a 1992 Gallup poll, more than 50% of American adults, 94 million Americans, volunteered time for social causes, at an average of 4.2 hours a week, for a total of 20.5 billion hours a year. A more recent poll in December 2013 showed a steady increase in volunteering from 2001 until 2013. Figures from 2008 in the U.S. also showed an increase in non-religious volunteering, underlining the point that social contributions can exist for their own sake, as well as for religious reasons, and during great economic difficulties.
The truth of the matter is that human beings, even in the highly competitive and materialistic orientation of the United States, still decide to do a great deal without an interest in monetary reward. Open source programming is another example. Linux, which started in 1991 as a simple experiment, was able to complete its community-driven, almost moneyless programming development in just three years. Linux has over 10,000 lines of code and the vast amount of its creation was done for free by a global community. Wikipedia is yet another example of a non-profit, community-generated creation, research and expression. It has been estimated that Wikipedia took 100 million hours of volunteer time to create and features a technically advanced and complex backend, demonstrating that well-engineered interrelating systems, when leveraged with large volunteer efforts, can create world-first systems previously considered unrealistic or unfeasible. So, while money still rules the overall motivation in the current society, given some free time, people have proven they will contribute greatly to projects which have no monetary return and the real issue underlying the motivation of such labor is the satisfaction and the feeling of contribution. Today, most jobs do not generate this feeling. Most people walk into a private dictatorship five days a week and are under the control of superiors, knowing they can be fired at any moment. The contribution they make rarely has a direct return to them and the feeling of accomplishment is diminished. Some jobs might even make one wonder what the point of the occupation even is in the context of social contribution or personal development. Many jobs exist today simply for the sake of generating or moving money and nothing more. Advertising and Wall Street occupations, for example, are examples of high-value occupations which, in truth, do very little to improve society. This perhaps might explain the lazy tendency many feel once off their job at the end of the day, returning home feeling defeated and tired. Over time, many lose spirit and motivation overall and find that their job becomes the only thing that is supposed to have meaning in their life, forgetting the enjoyable passions once inherent to their development. That considered, in a fully realized NLRBE, it is estimated that perhaps 5% of a region's population, 5% of the global population as well, on average, would be needed to assist the fluid operation of this industrial system and this figure would likely continually diminish in the future as technology advances. This participation might best be expressed in the form of what has been termed the domestic economy. The domestic economy embodies the helpful actions of people in a non-paid environment. Household work, family and community interests are traditional examples. In a NLRBE, such labor would be relegated in the same gesture and the delegation of such labor roles could be distributed amongst a large-scale population making the actual time commitment minuscule overall. Even by current standards, if one were to ask the average worker if they would be willing to live, say, the equivalence of a $100,000 a year lifestyle, but having to volunteer 5% of their time for maintenance of the system that supports their standard of living, there is little doubt agreement would be met by most. The amount of time saved alone in this type of socioeconomic model, coupled again with the vast problem alleviation of the environmental problems and social conflicts inherent to the market, leave little room for rational objection. Likewise, once set free, the creative, collaborative contribution propensity itself, which is the true driver of progress, will no longer be inhibited by the monotony of labor or the income system. It is very difficult to predict the incredible level of productivity and focus a society may achieve once such oppressive factors are removed. The Decentralization Paradox While the rhetoric of a global society with global values underscores this socioeconomic model, it is important to understand the nature of its redundancy and its decentralized layout. John Dahlberg Acton, 1st Baron Acton, once stated power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This power-fearing perspective is certainly well justified in history, and many who hear about a NLRB often assume this global society is ruled by one mainframe, one machine, an elite group of technocrats, or something similar. It is important to remind ourselves that almost all prior societies have lived within great scarcity and hence, great conflict. This, coupled with the fact that money and resources have been a means to gain power, usually after a good deal of battle, reinforcing a status and dominance hierarchy illustrates that we should not be surprised at these reactions. However, this statement is also deeply counterproductive on the whole as it gives the paranoid sense that no one can ever be trusted if they are given any type of control over others. 
A NLRB is, indeed, a global structure in how it processes economic information and assesses output possibilities. Once a good is designed, it runs through the aforementioned efficiency and sustainability filters, which invariably tie back to the status of global resources, along with a global network for design contribution. At the same time, larger order societal decisions, meaning those decisions once made by elected representatives, are also achieved by consensus by the population, directly. The only real centralization inherent is this digital network, connecting the world itself. Given that, we could consider a few possible problems in this circumstance in the same way we think about the internet today, which is essentially the same infrastructure. Hacking, for example, which is the act of disturbing, stealing or corrupting a program or digital information by invading the source code, might be a concern. However, we have to first ask why anyone would perform such an act in the new model. Since the entire system is designed to provide for everyone, where is the incentive to disturb it? Anyone shutting down such a system is also shutting down their means to contribute and develop. An analogy would be a person today living in an apartment building, where everyone shares the utility infrastructure, deciding to destroy the fuse or electrical breaker box, which divides the incoming electricity to power the whole apartment building. Why would they do it if it shuts down their own electricity as well? It is important to review why people can be so vicious today. Anger is bred by deprivation, and some external act is often interpreted as the source of this abuse. So, in retribution, people today hack and violate websites and the like to either make a protest point or to get revenge. In a NLRB, it is hard to fathom where the source of such angst and outrage would materialize. If a person doesn't like the way the system is working in a specific way, they have the capacity to change it by assessing consensus with others. The system is emergent. However, in the event that this did happen, there is a simple solution, active redundancy. In a monetary-driven society, based around cost efficiency, we see little fail, safe redundancy in place as it is unaffordable. For example, we see an airplane with two engines, and both are needed to fly. Why not create an airplane with two main engines and two backup engines, which are not running when the full plane is in working order, but in the event an engine fails, another engine is able to take over. The main server network which facilitates social connectivity and unification could have 5, 6, 7, 20 levels of redundancy and automatic backup in the event anything went down. It might not be perfect. Some data may be lost. However, again, this isn't a utopia. With respect to who has the power to notice the problem and implement this redundancy, technical teams exist to monitor the network, just like any other existing vocation. Of course, the question then arises, what if someone on the technical team is corrupted and purposefully messes up the system? Once again, the counter-question is, why would they do it? What is the incentive? In the event this did happen, it would not take long for others to notice and the system could be corrected in the same semblance of redundancy, with the person removed. That person would then be questioned by his or her peers and society overall to better understand why this act occurred. Overall, we trustfully give ourselves over to authority all the time. Doctors, mechanics, and any other specialization always involve a level of trust by those seeking such help, and most of the time, even in a monetary society which generates dishonesty, people are mostly honest, or as honest as they can be, the majority of the time. It is simply too cynical to assume that any allocation of control is dangerous. At no time in human history have we not shared some level of delegated power responsibility to each other, and in almost all cases, as with dentistry or mechanics, the nature of the power delegated in question is characterized by its technical merit, precisely the kind of oversight advocated within the present context. In a NLRBE, the reinforcement is to help oneself, which means to help society, not to exploit or abuse. There is literally no reward reinforcement for such negative behavior, as opposed to the natural state of general corruption we endure today. As far as the physical network itself, it is decentralized in its orientation in many ways, often more so than we see today. The topographic layout of Earth makes many things logically obvious as far as structure placement. 
People, being social, naturally have an interest to have some kind of community centralization, the existence of certain energy providing areas, such as for solar slash wind slash geothermal slash hydro, carve out their own locations logically, extraction, production and distribution networks also have a topographical logic inherent as efficiency mandates we keep such facilitates as close to each other as possible, reducing energy waste and transport, etc. Cities themselves will change in two major ways. For one, the construction and networking of the internal city system will seek to meet the highest state of technical efficiency possible, including sustainable infrastructure, homes, production-slash-distribution networks and the like, taking the system's basis into direct account. Secondly, it is expected that due to the evolution of ephemeralization, a given city will produce all regional goods locally. Management of the city on the level of broad infrastructure, such as where to put a bridge, will also be a regional decision-making process, set in motion by the direct democracy, CDS system. Land allocation works the same way, even though that is a larger subject, which is addressed in the essay Post-Scarcity Trends, Capacity and Efficiency. Of course, each city naturally connects to other cities, ideally with advanced transport systems, which can cleanly and fluidly move people. Maglev-type train systems are on pace to be the next stage of fast, safe and efficient transport with little to no environmental footprint, as compared to oil-powered planes, buses and cars. As for as the engine of a city, which is its industry, digital networks and sensor systems work to gather important regional and non-regional data. This relates to the Global Resource Management Network as described before and both regional and global networks of measurements allow all cities citizens to have a holistic sense of what is going on, affecting production and other important environmental factors. So, this network might very well be centralized in its data and raw resource flow to a city's internal production facilities, but it is decentralized in that a city imports nothing else. It is mostly self-contained. All productions occur internally, importing and exporting no produced goods, only resources. This idea of self-containment per scale degree is important and even applies towards structures, such as houses. The ideal house would be off the grid and self-contained in its energy sourcing and with redundant backup energy sources in place should anything become compromised. Put another way, there is no central off switch in such a natural redundancy-based system. For example, if a baseload providing power grid is being used and that grid goes down, it would have little effect on houses if those houses are also designed to harvest local energy sources, i.e. solar, and hence be self-contained. Likewise, no one thing can upset the international system. Unlike modern monetary finance and currency structures, which are highly centralized and can wreak havoc globally if things go wrong, a problem in one city has little effect on any other city in a NLRBE. So, in truth, a properly organized NLRB is not centralized in any real sense. It is more accurate to say that it is a global decentralized system, with various degrees of inherent redundancy, which, degree by degree, connects itself by information flow and physical channels to acquire proper resources, to be used for each region's local economy. Lifestyle, Freedom and the Humanity Factor is freedom anything else than the right to live as we wish? Nothing else. Epictetus. What is happiness? It is difficult for most in the world today to imagine a society without the duress and daily strife endured by the act of simply trying to survive and keep a healthy mental and physical state. So much of our lives today is centered around staying financially ahead and making sure we have enough money for today, tomorrow, our family, and even perhaps for the next familial generation, we often lose sight of what it is that actually creates well-being and happiness. In fact, this fear and often predatory motivation has created a social climate that has even generated a positive value association toward narrow, self-interested behavior. While the line is always subjective as to what behaviors are to be considered ethical or not, the competitive, scarcity-driven orientation toward gaining an acceptable quality of life continually reinforces our lower brain, fight-or-flight propensities, perpetuating a constant sense of social detachment and general loss of empathy for others. In many ways, money itself has even become the reward and status standard, not what it can do with its potential to move the world. Therefore, Given these values, it is always a challenge to discuss a NLRBE's non-market premise with the vast majority of those in modern culture, as certain knee-jerk contradictory assumptions almost always prevail. 
It is not the purpose of this essay to address these in detail, but to denote how communication of a future lifestyle not based on these now long sustained values is difficult, as the idea of existence without such strife is almost impossible for many, due to our history. Merging Society and Individuality Ayn Rand and other famous authors and theorists in the 20th century spent a great deal of time talking about a duality between self-interest and social interest, or individualism and collectivism. In these works, whether in fiction-based literary form or in actual economic treatment, rarely is consideration given to a possible balance between the two. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, Communism forgets that life is individual. Capitalism forgets that life is social and the kingdom of brotherhood is found neither in the thesis of communism nor the antithesis of capitalism, but in a higher synthesis. It is found in a higher synthesis that combines the truths of both. There is no denying that human beings have evolved with a deeply social nature. It could be argued that what really defines us are the relationships we have created in our lives, not to mention the vast influence of cultural development itself, which is the main source of most value orientations at any given time in any given society. Yet, at the same time, we cannot deny the personal development needs, freedom of expression sought and general independence most all humans tend to need to feel in their day-to-day -day lives. While the notion of free will might be highly complex in analysis, there appears to always be a part of us that navigates based on what we consider to be choice, and if we feel oppression of that choice, it tends to upset us and destabilize. So, while it is true that when the synergy of the total life experience is brought into focus, we can well argue that all of our choices exist under some level of duress, influence or impulse and hence are actually not entirely free, we cannot ignore the emotional interest we tend to have in perceiving ourselves as separate, independent and individual in some way. True or not, the very idea of free determination appears critical to personal development, confidence and well-being. This is brought up, as perhaps the most important sociological outcome of a NLRB is something historically unprecedented on a large scale in the history of human society. Today, we have the technological means to not only bring all human beings into a high standard of living due to the rapid advancement of technology and basic understandings in science, we also have the ability to structurally rationalize ourselves as being actually responsible to each other and the earth itself. The market system has been unable to reinforce this sense of community or harmony with the habitat because its very foundation works against both as a value or virtue. The earth, in the market model, is viewed as an inventory of resources waiting for financial exploitation and the more goods and service, the more money is made and hence more jobs are created. Likewise, perpetual human oppression has been a natural byproduct of the underlying Malthusian, scarcity-based orientation, since the dawn of existence. This old system, which is a natural consequence of this scarcity-driven order, worked well during primitive periods where our impact on the earth and how much damage we could do to each other had acceptable limits, if you will. The larger structural problems inherent simply could not be understood at that time. However, Today the market has revealed itself as no longer a method towards sustainability or a means for intelligent resource management and it also creates a constant propensity to view other human beings as threats to one's own survival. On the social level, the entire edifice justifies a zero-sum game. Two people going into a coveted job interview for the same job may be respectful to each other, but they both know only one of them will get the job. This fear-based competitive nuance runs the gamut of societal affairs from justifying massive wealth gaps and class imbalance in the developed world to the overall ignoring of mass poverty and the genocide it is in the developing world. A NLRBE, on the other hand, structurally combines societal interest with personal interest and environmental interest. Its functioning is directly tied to the resources and environment, actually rewarding sustainability and efficiency. Likewise, there is no gain to be had by the exploitation of others or behaving in the dishonest and corrupt ways we tend to accept as normality. Theft, crime, fraud and all structural outcomes common to the scarcity-based market will no longer have any real incentive as the entire society is oriented to serve itself and harming others only harms oneself. For example, an enormous number of laws exist today that protect one's private property. People might be motivated to steal for a number of reasons, but statistically a lack of means, general deprivation and hence relative or absolute poverty, is the common precondition. 
When people steal physical goods, they are usually stealing exchange value in most cases. In a NLRB, there is no exchange value and hence to steal an item that cannot be sold is mostly pointless. Likewise, a common objection is that if goods were available without price, there is no restriction on taking vastly more than one needs. Once again, we need to consider the reason for such an action. Since the same goods cannot be sold, they would simply exist in another place, perhaps even inconveniencing the person who took them. What is one to do with, say, 200 televisions? Why would someone take five times the amount of food needed if they cannot eat it all and it will go to waste? From an ethical standpoint, which is often seen as culturally subjective, we see a great number of customs in society today based upon what is considered appropriate. When a person walks down the street and litters on the ground, anyone watching would likely not applaud such behavior. In regions where water or electricity is paid for with a flat rate, people do not just let the water run all day long or keep lights on constantly, simply because they don't need to care, financially. There has always been a general social and environmental sense of responsibility under the surface of the current zeitgeist and NLRB will finally amplify these same responsible propensities to a vast degree, rather than incentivize their suppression, which is what the current system does. Humanity Factor and Access Rights Still, while a NLRB will set in motion, for the first time in history, a kind of economic and social premise that reinforces sustainability, human solidarity, empathy and sharing on a global scale, working to literally unite the human family with common concern, there will always be problems of some kind, including behavioral. There is an unpredictable element to human development. The great many and complex environmental and biological influences, which create our personalized form, comprehension and propensities, can be difficult to understand in causality to any degree of absolutism. We simply cannot account for all relevant factors. While a great deal has been learned about human influences and how certain things should and should not happen to a person during development, as they have statistically predictable consequences with respect to behavior, there is always a possibility of things going wrong that are out of a family or society's control. We can call this the humanity factor. The current social order, which is, again, literally built out of the market-oriented, scarcity-driven, competitive premise of economy, has an enormous legal apparatus to control human behavior. In the new approach, we could likely expect a 90-95% to decrease in such criminal acts since the vast majority of crime has to do with money, trade and property. These very ideas are no longer relevant in this post-scarcity model for there is no basis for those problems in general. They have been designed out. However, this humanity factor can still generate unexpected circumstances and problems that require a socially accepted course of action. A simple example is mental illness, which can develop slowly over time and unexpectedly. It is a medical problem and must be treated as such. A volunteer group working to help those sick in the behavioral context would need to be in place, no different than those who work in any other facet of societal maintenance. However, this team would be a vast departure from the crude idea of police and security we see today. Likewise, there are certainly no prisons existing to incur inhumane treatment and punishment. Even in the case of crimes of passion or the like, the worst scenario is containment if the individual is unable to control destructive actions. Just as we might quarantine a person with a highly contagious, infectious disease if it were a serious threat, the logic to contain people who pose behavioral threats to others would suggest a similar scenario only this containment would be humane and for the sake of research. Whether biological or developmental, all aberrant behaviors have a source of some kind, and as complex as they may be, only further study can work to source solutions. On a more moderate level, such as the case of adolescent kids who, in the common discovery and rebellious stage of development, act in socially offensive ways in experimentation, a different kind of understanding is culminated where the community can come together to assess the nature of the problem and work to deter the behavior as a community. Just as minors are treated in the Western world today, given non-criminal condemnation in most cases, the same type of community assessment can be provided, which will likely come natural to any family or local region. However, in some cases, there might be a need for a type of rights system when dealing with accessed goods. In other words, a simple rule system of some kind might be useful, centered not on property rights, but access rights. 
Imagine a scenario where an individual parks his or her bike on a street, without a lock, entering a house. This bike was checked out of a local distribution library for the person's use. Then, a bystander, who is in a hurry, not close to a distribution library, sees this bike and makes an inappropriate decision to take the bike to get where he needs to go. This is a dishonest and rude act. In a property system, this would be called theft. In an access system, it might take a different term, such as an access violation. The severity of the action is very different and it is more of an annoyance than a crime. In a property system, the bike would likely be sold for money or kept. In an access system, the original user would simply obtain a new bike and move on, inconvenienced, while the person who took the bike would likely just drop it off after use, as there is no resale value and hence no real reason to keep it. Yet, it doesn't mean the act should be ignored and go unnoticed in its access violation, as such behavior, as rare as it likely would be, would need acknowledgement to serve as a form of operant education. It is no different than how people today learn basic decency, respect and etiquette. Therefore, rather than property rights, a simple access rights rule could be installed to deter such behavior. In other words, any person obtaining items through the system would have access rights to those items for the duration of use and if another comes and takes those items, it is an offense. Reinforcement to deter such future acts would first be warnings. If persisted over time, it could mean a temporary limitation of future access in some genre for that offending person. In reality, it could be considered a slap on the wrist for essentially being annoying and rude. However, if a person were to repeat this over and over, it might take on the role of mental illness, as something of an impulsive behavior disorder and that medical context might come into play at that time. But once again, this type of behavior would be extremely rare and if far from a serious concern. However, such possible measures should be understood, as this isn't a utopia. It should also be noted that technical resolutions are always sought after as the primary prevention strategy to design out any such problems. Crisis management is another issue. Just as we have a volunteer fire department in most cities in America who live their normal lives until they get the call for an emergency, this same approach can work for natural disasters or acts of extreme behavior, such as behavioral violence. In the case of an earthquake, flood, tornado or the like, each case would naturally have a plan in place by the society to assure proper handling. This preparation can cross regional lines as well, with contingency plans agreed upon on the global level to know how the rest of the world may help if a given region has a severe problem. This is actually similar to how the international community works to help in crises even today, when such problems occur. Overall, we can speculate on all these ideas and problem-solving measures to a vast degree, but the underlying preconditions set in motion by the NLRB will dramatically reduce the commonality and severity of each issue and that is important to remember. For example, buildings constructed in regions susceptible to earthquakes will be made to withstand them as best they can. This is very difficult in the current world due to the associated financial costs as the revisions deeply needed are great. Such impediments will no longer exist and proper, technically accurate construction and infrastructure can be made to assure the least amount of damage in the event of such a natural disaster. Lifestyle As technology unfolds and scientific understanding evolves, culture changes. This has been the trend of history. With the exponential development of information-based technologies and hence the applied technology that then emerges, each generation develops new values, associations, means and expressions. Let's imagine waking up one morning in a NLRB a day in the life, you rise to a generally quiet hum of mild traffic, with maglev trains whisking about the city. Having a love for high views, you get out of bed on the 20th story of a simple yet elegant, mold-extruded apartment complex that converts all sunlight into energy through photovoltaic paints on its outer shell. You have a fleeting moment of marveling at this reality as the sun bursts through the windows, forcing increased alertness out of your early morning stupor. As you emerge, you are also reminded of your cousin having taken part in that global, university-driven initiative about two decades ago, which sought to perfect this paint technology to a degree of efficiency never before seen. In just a few years of collaboration, this PV paint achieved 90% energy efficiency, making it workable in almost any structure. 
You remember the joy and satisfaction your cousin felt when his team was on the front lines when this breakthrough for humanity was achieved. It was like the elation felt amongst soccer teammates after a goal has been scored. Slowly gaining focus as your pupils find balance with the invading light, you glance out of the window and notice an enormous machine, suspended from a crane of sorts, slowly adding a new section to the very building structure you are a part of. Almost like magic, the machine is able to form, from what first appears like a kind of liquid plastic, a new apartment configuration and appends that form onto the existing structure. Quietly, safely and oddly with very few parts, there is no technician in sight, even though likely someone is monitoring the process from somewhere. Blinking and scanning sensor lights on the huge machine appear to suggest that it understands everything about the surrounding area and what it needs to do. Glancing further around the city's skyline, there is an immediate sense of synergy with nature. The city has no awkward concentrations or imbalance. The slick transport systems that zoom by, which are high-tech indeed, seem to merge seamlessly with the greenery, lakes and canals. Suddenly, a picture on the wall, next to the window catches your eye. It is an old archival shot of almost the same perspective, but taken many, many decades before, during what modern folk now call the last dark age. In this shot a sense of tension, congestion and strife is felt. A long stream of automobiles is seen on a strip of crude concrete highway, backing up all the way out of frame. You remember from your history education years ago that back then a monetary practice created great duress and discord, with people piling into cities to gain employment and hence to gain the money, in order to buy things and survive. You then think of how things have changed indeed, feeling rather sorry for that primitive culture and happy you were born when you were. Of course, realizing that you too live in a fleeting era as time marches on, you further try to imagine what aspects of your life today will one day be considered outdated in the future. Feeling hungry, you enter into the apartment's kitchen. It is a fairly new design you hadn't seen before. While the system's concept and the interest to combine and unify industrial design was mentioned prolifically in your educational materials as an engineering student, you notice the advanced degree of efficiency now achieved. The kitchen is one unit. The dishes and ware are designed for the washing and placement process, which is directly built in. Once a plate is dirty, it is set into a compartment that already understands the nature of the pre-designed plate and processes the plate with a kind of cleansing steam and a UV configuration that also sterilizes it. Automatically, the plate is then returned to the proper disperser location in the shelf for the next use. It was as though the kitchen was one big, unified machine. However, checking the refrigerator, you realize you have forgotten to pick up provisions for your short stay. You ponder whether to go down to the lower level to pick up such provisions and come back, but you decide it is time to get going and you will grab something at a cafe on the way. As you exit the apartment, you swipe the access key into the control panel to confirm your final exit and then glance at the control panel to find the clean button. After a bit of frustration, you finally realize the apartment has been designed with a time-based motion sensor system to clean itself automatically when no motion is detected. You then notice the CF6 robot in the corner and take pause as to the amazing technical feat it is to have this robot understand the exact nature of the space, where things belong and where they do not, all programmed with absolute 3D spatial awareness of the apartment to clean and arrange. It is hard for you to imagine what it must have been like to maintain such daily drudgery generations, prior. Exiting the apartment, which is actually a temporary access location you rented through an online service, you then enter the hallways and almost collide with a fast-moving older man who drops a small laptop. You realize he is one of the managers of the apartment complex. You help him pick it up and he apologizes profusely. Very sorry, he exclaims. We have a problem with the CF6 on level 12 and I need to reboot him. Good thing we always have a few backups for each room. You thank him kindly for his well-kept place and continue on your way, with a brief reflection back to that historical photo in the room you just left. Long ago, people's sense of contribution was always associated to money. They had jobs, as they were called. Today, people's vocation is a matter of choice, facilitated also by a basic sense of social responsibility. Our society is designed to take care of us as one, so why should we not take care of society itself in return? 
The man who passed you maintains that building because he enjoys helping others and since he, himself, only needs to work a few hours a week at this role, he'd use his volunteer time as valuable and without burden, happily assisting others who very much appreciate the contribution. It makes him feel like he is more a part of the community. Exiting the building, the street is bustling with motion. You notice an artsy-looking, retro French café on the corner and laugh to yourself at the pointless, yet cute nostalgia. You enter and sit at a small corner table, smiling politely at the family across the way. Realizing you are running out of time since you have to catch a train to attend a conference a couple hundred miles away, you tap a simple order into the kiosk menu in the center of the table. Tea and waffles. Once submitted, you can't help but notice a mild vibration occurring behind your head. Since your grandfather was an engineer who helped design the original automated kitchen system, this is curious to you as the usual tradition was to put the processing facility above and center in the space. It appears there was some restriction in this narrow area, so they hid it to the side. About two minutes later, a red light appears on the table to alert you that your order is ready. A glass door opens that is perpendicular to the tabletop and a conveyor extends to reveal your tea and waffles. You grab the tray and rush to finish in the hope not to miss your train. Once done, you slide the tray back into the opening and it closes for cleaning. As you exit the cafe, you can't help but notice a decal with the silhouette of a female form with a tray, bending over what looks like a table. At first, the image confuses you, and then you remember that at one time in history, people were slaves to others in this very way. Before the automated restaurant, people actually wasted their potential by waiting on each other and manually bringing food and taking orders. Once again, you are happy you were born when you were. Emerging back outside, you realize you have a fairly long walk. Pondering jumping on the maglev trolley, which constantly circles about the city like a giant worm, you decide it is probably going to be too slow. So, you make your way to the street parallel, which is where the automated cars zoom around in their custom paths. Pulling out your cell phone, which has a special application linked to the region's transport system, a white cab quickly notices your call and stops on the corner. You enter the front of the cab and verbally describe the address. A voice confirms your request and you are off. Arriving at the train station, you exit the cab and begin to make your way. Gliding along, you notice a person with a very large bag next to you, strolling it along. This perplexes you. It appears so arduous and unnecessary. You ask yourself why anyone would need such a large bag when the basic things everyone needs can be found in any city in the world, on demand. The idea of luggage seemed awkward and strange. Yet, before you have a moment to ponder this any further, the man in front of you suddenly collapses to the ground. Instantly a large crowd begins to form to see if they can assist. Being the closest to him, you notice the characteristics appear to be of a heart attack. While extremely rare in the world at that time, they still occasionally occur. Pulling out your phone, you text emergency number 331 with the word medical. This sends instant notification of an emergency to a local team of volunteers trained in medical practice, along with the location via GPS. Within minutes, a team arrives and works to save the man's life. With the man still breathing, he is placed into an automated emergency vehicle, which zooms off to the local hospital. Concerned about the fate of the poor man, you collect yourself and continue on, even more late than before. Finally making it to your train, you enter and sit. Within moments, the doors close and you breathe a sigh of relief. In your seat is an entertainment center with has on-demand media. As the train begins to accelerate, you suddenly remember that your nephew produced a feature film about whale migration recently, but you can't remember the name. Given this media center has a link to literally all media ever produced in human history, digitized and contained in one accessible database, you balk at the idea of searching for it amongst the millions of films. Then, it comes to you. So, you enter the title, and there it is. However, you remember your trip is only about 275 miles so you know you won't get far as this maglev train goes about 3,000 miles per hour. You will be lucky if you get 8 minutes into the film. So, rather than spoil the experience, you decide to go over some notes you brought for the conference. The subject of the conference is terraformation. 
Great interest is being shown by humanity to further explore the idea of inhabiting space, and this conference will address the potentials currently available. However, before too much thought can be done, you arrive at your destination. You exit the train and enter the station. You realize you need some equipment for some program work that will be addressed at the conference, so you make your way to the local technology library. You need a versatile laptop and a series of storage cards to bring your notes and work with you after it is done. You enter the library and feel a buzz on your phone. You pull it out and a curious notification welcomes you to that region's technology center and asks if you need search assistance. This perplexes you at first, but then you remember that the library network in that region has recently been updated to allow for a universal recognition system, facilitated by a phone application you had installed prior, while using another library in the same region years ago. You had forgotten about this. How convenient, you think. You describe the laptop and memory cards and it returns the product profiles. You find that it is correct. Once confirmed, a visual map of the library appears that shows your location and the location of the area with the goods you need. You navigate to that area and check out the items. Then, you exit the library, retrieve an automated cab, and you are off to the conference. A number of hours later the conference ends. You are inspired, exhausted and hungry, having forgotten to eat most of the day. You decide an Italian-style meal sounds good. Luckily, you notice just such a restaurant a few blocks down and start walking. Your phone rings. It is an associate from your hometown. He states there is a problem with one of the food production manifolds and he is unable to respond due to his own personal emergency. You state you will go online and check the system status and get back to him. You quickly enter the Italian restaurant and take a seat at a small table. It is a pretty busy night so it is noisier than you would prefer. You whip out the laptop, which has a satellite-based internet connection at all times, and navigate to your region's technical mainframe to check for status errors. Sure enough, there is a power problem in Sector 5 of the automated vertical farm structure in the Northeast region. You bring up the digital image of the physical layout, which, by a kind of color coding, reveals a severed cable line to a power converter. Having seen this problem before, since you have been overseeing your region's food production for about eight years, you gain a sense of relief, as the problem is very simple to fix. With a few keystrokes, a CR9 modular robot is now under your control in the farm. Through this remote controllability, you are able to guide the machine to the problem area and explain the issue. This robot, like the one in the apartment rental you had prior, has a complete understanding of all physical and technical systems in the operation. A 3D model of the plant and its infrastructural design is literally programmed into the CR9S and all it needs is a little orientation from the management team and it quickly goes into action to fix a problem. Once in place, the CR9 quickly understands the problem clearly and moves to replace the bad power cable. In a few minutes, the problem is solved. You call your associate back and he thanks you kindly for the assistance. Now extremely hungry, you whip around the menu kiosk and find the largest plate of pasta you can. You enter your order, along with a strong cocktail and some water, and wait. About 10 minutes later a mechanism in the table opens from the side, elevating your now ever-enticing looking meal to the surface in front of you. You dive in. Eating away, you can't help but notice a gentle-faced woman staring at you from the corner. You smile and she comes over. She asks, how is everything? You state, quite good. Are you the manager here? She nods. You then go on to describe how your grandfather helped design the kitchen system she is using. She lights up and says, my family has been feeding people for nine generations. Sometimes I go back and cook the food myself, just for fun. You both laugh at the nostalgia, comparing the idea to those who still manually fix up old cars, just for fun. After the meal and conversation, you decide it is time to retire for the evening. Pulling out your phone you locate an available room a few doors down. You enter the building, obtain a keycard from an automated key wall, and ascend to your room and sleep. Life moves forward. Part 4. The Zeitgeist Movement 
social destabilization, and transition. I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we must undergo a radical revolution of values, we must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism and militarism are incapable of being conquered. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Trends The early 21st century marks an extremely interesting period of time. On one side we see many clear and present problems that, as this essay will discuss, show an accelerating gravitation toward further negative consequences, both environmental and social. Yet, on the other side, an ever-present and accelerating solution orientation, technically, reveals so much potential to change course for the better, positive future possibilities appear profound and limitless. To the casual observer, the idea that the worst is over regarding the evolution of human culture may appear intuitively accurate, depending on where one resides on the planet. We have seen an overall increase in life expectancy, an overall decline in behavioral violence, a rising standard of living on the whole in the Western world, along with a generally maturing global culture which has been inching its way out of vast periods of bigotry, sexism, racism, and nationalism, further promoting a much-needed global consciousness. Yet, the truth of the matter is that any such social progress, specifically the overall standard of living elevation occurring due to our technological ingenuity, is actually amalgamating within a highly detrimental framework that has just started to really reveal itself as such. These surfacing problems are of a scientific nature, not an ideological one. The fact is, market capitalism, no matter how you wish to regulate it or not regulate it, contains severe structural flaws, which will always, to one degree or another, perpetuate environmental abuse and destabilization, along with human disregard and caustic inequality. As expressed at length in other essays, this market-slash-trade concept manifested out of an environmental condition which viewed all material things in the world as universally scarce. This has forged a competitive and invariably exploited a value system that generates certain behavioral propensities and loyalties that are misaligned with the natural order of reality, as per our modern environmental and sociological understandings. The difference between capitalism's effect today and in the 16th century is that our technical ability to rapidly accelerate and amplify this competitive and exploitative process has brought to the surface consequences that simply couldn't be recognized or even anticipated during those earlier periods. Today, we are seeing the surfacing of these previously hidden tendencies in full force, and the end result is that what we see as progress now will likely be overcome, in time, by the larger order force of capitalism's misaligned detrimental principles. It is like a massive tidal wave which has been on pace to crashing on a ship for a very long time and no matter how well developed and organized that ship is, it is no match for this larger order force of nature. Perhaps the most notable example of this is the fact that virtually all life support systems are in decline. It really doesn't matter how many people have achieved a coveted, ideal, upper-class lifestyle if it is occurring on the back of unsustainable methods. It is simply a matter of time before the effects of resource depletion, biodiversity loss and pollution evolve to destroy this illusion of success. Likewise, while it may be true that we have seen a decline in violence, mass genocide and the once enormous fatalities common to global warfare, we need to step back even further and remember the causality itself, not the mere trend of reduction. If resource scarcity and geoeconomic strategy have been the cause of most national conflicts in the world in the past, which it has, then all it takes is that precondition to rematerialize. The rapid decline of human-environment relations in the past few decades is setting the stage for this once again. The 2003 Iraq War, by some analysts, was a resource war for oil, and this is rather difficult to deny when the evidence is weighed. There is little doubt that if the world was faced with real energy, water, food and mineral scarcity, to the extent that it would deeply affect the economies of larger national powers, we would regress rapidly back to mass global warfare and mass casualties, not to mention massive civil unrest as well. Today, all major superpowers continue to increase armaments and weapon power, clearly in preparation for such events. On a different level, almost paradoxically, the very things that have been helping society increase its standard of living, science and technology, is also driving its increased vulnerability towards destruction. 
while science can, on one side, illuminate the natural alignments we as a species need to adhere to in order to find balance with the habitat and each other, it can also be used locally and narrowly, within the context of the distorted incentive structure the market perpetuates, to create and accelerate destructive and inhumane consequences. The atomic bomb is one extreme of this reality. Our increased, high-tech capacity to more efficiently destroy biodiversity, overuse our resources and pollute, is another. In some ways, the rapid development of science and technology is pushing humanity into a corner. It is as though the species is marching farther back into the apex of a three-dimensional triangle, laid on its back, with its edges sloping quickly down, once passed over. One side is a negative acceleration into social and ecological decline and the other a positive acceleration into an age of abundance, balance, peace and progress. As time moves forward, the farther we move back into this apex, the less space we have. At some point, we are going to succumb to one side or the other. Population and Resources Statistics suggest that well over 9 billion people will inhabit Earth by 2050, sourced mainly in the developing world. Along with this come dramatic increases in demand for a. food, b. water, c. energy, and d. minerals slash material resources. Each one of these will be discussed. Reproduced from the Food and Agriculture Organization's Expert Forum, 2009. As far as food, there is no shortage of studies that project that our traditional food production methods are not going to come close to meeting demand by 2050. Estimates put production needs at a 60 to 110 percent increase and given the current industrial climate, which also has an extremely wasteful and inefficient supply chain, wasting 30 to 50 percent of all food created, the only logical expectation is a worsening of the global poverty and starvation levels in terms of population percentage. This doesn't even bring into consideration the ongoing plea for more sustainable agricultural practices to stop pollution slash soil erosion, which would not be a convenience if this pressure accelerates, assuming traditional land-based methods are still in use. This chart shows yields per acre for the important foundational crops corn, rice, wheat and soybeans. The solid lines show what would happen if this growth continued. The dashed lines, however, show what is really needed to satisfy expected demand by 2050. Potable water statistics are equally if not more dramatic, and needless to say, water scarcity means even more problems for traditional agriculture. According to the United Nations, by 2025, an estimated 1.8 billion people will live in areas plagued by water scarcity, with two-thirds of the world's population living in water-stressed regions. The OECD projects that fresh water demand will rise by 55% by 2050, corroborating the UN water stress statistic, extending it to 3.9 billion by 2050, or nearly half the world's population. 2050 Projection of Water Stressed Areas Reproduced from the OCED Water, the Outlook, to 2050, 2011 Likewise, water pollution, which further compounds the problem, is on pace to continue as developing countries increase industry and agriculture in their interest to raise their overall standard of living. Sadly, this interest to increase industry will only further the pollution problem as the methods used are often much more primitive and environmentally dangerous than what the developed nations are slowly emerging out of. China is a case in point. While considered a developed industrial nation, its internal policies are excessively relaxed when it comes to environmental standards and regulation. This is a natural capitalist outgrowth as the intention is to free up commerce and further economic growth. Today, China contains 16 out of 20 of the world's most polluted cities and only further development, population growth and hence pollution is to be expected. As far as water pollution, globally, nitrogen and phosphorus contamination, mostly from agriculture, is now a major problem, creating both dead zones in certain surface bodies, along with making people sick who drink it via groundwater. Likewise, many other pollution sources are ubiquitous. For example, air pollution from coal plants enters the atmosphere and then finds its way into the ocean. The mercury released by the burning of coal then pollutes the fish and those fish are then caught as a food source, containing this deadly toxin, hurting human health. Given current trends, mercury pollution is expected to rise as well. In short, if all patterns stay the same, water, 
both in the context of its symbiotic relationship to biodiversity and its direct relationship to human survival, given that humans can only go a few days before dying without it, is on pace for severe shortages and extremely detrimental environmental outcomes overall. This again assumes we conduct ourselves in the same basic ways we have for the past 50 years, embracing market logic, which is life-blind and decoupled from environmental awareness. As far as energy, as alluded to in the prior note about coal, there is literally nothing positive about any fossil fuel combustion process when it comes to environmental sustainability. These means will always have a detrimental footprint and it can only get worse as population and industry increases. Compounding this is also the fact that such resources are non-renewable and ensuing scarcity is simply a matter of time. Reproduced from Dr. Michael R. S. Smith, CEO of Global Shift Ltd. The issue of peak oil has been looming for many decades. While controversial, what we know today is that convention oil production, meaning the usual raw crude which used to occur in large vast pockets under the Earth's surface, is in decline on the global scale, with an estimated 37 countries already past their peak of production. According to Dr. Richard G. Miller, who worked for British Petroleum from 1985 to 2008, we need new production equal to a new Saudi Arabia every three to four years to maintain and grow supply. New discoveries have not matched consumption since 1986. We are drawing down on our reserves, even though reserves are apparently climbing every year. Reserves are growing due to better technology in old fields, raising the amount we can recover, but production is still falling at 4.1% PA per annum, but. Of course, many others today speculate that the world is still awash in oil, with grand speculations of future capacity. However, these projections are centered on non-conventional sources that are often extremely difficult to extract and process. Oil shale and tar sands, along with fracking for natural gas, are currently accelerating methods and, on paper, they can give the sense of abundance. However, there is a great deal of dispute about just how viable these means are to meet growing demand, while the environmental costs of these complex and often destructive practices are vast and counterproductive. According to the Center for Biological Diversity, the development of oil shale and tar sands has been shown to be environmentally destructive and water and energy intensive. Extracting oil from U.S. public lands through oil shale or tar sands would deal a disastrous blow to any hope of reducing atmospheric CO2 levels to below 350 parts per million, the level we need to reach soon to stabilize Earth's climate. Besides helping push us toward global warming catastrophe, oil shale and tar sands development destroys species habitat, wastes enormous volumes of water, pollutes air and water, and degrades and defile vast swaths of land. Likewise, hydraulic fracturing or fracking has been found to be exceptionally polluting and dangerous with even recorded instances of groundwater being so polluted that home water supplies have become literally flammable. Regardless of such contaminated water supplies, given the dangerous air pollution, destroyed streams, and devastated landscapes, fracking continues to accelerate globally. The bottom line is that the fossil fuel economy is unsustainable. The economic manner by which this will become apparent in the current model will be through extreme price. The visceral problem is how supply and demand will set up a condition where scarcity will raise prices so high that industry and public simply can't afford it. This would severely limit the entire facet of industry itself since fossil fuels and hence energy are what move agriculture, production, distribution and the like. At the same time, these practices could bring human society in a pollution nightmare that could take generations to overcome. General resource scarcity, embracing both biotic and abiotic resources, is rapidly increasing globally, coupled with a parallel loss of biodiversity. In 2002, 192 countries, in association with the United Nations, got together over something called the Convention on Biological Diversity, making a public commitment to significantly reduce the losses by 2010. However, when 2010 arrived, no progress has been made. In their official 2010 publication, they stated, none of the 21 subtargets accompanying the overall target of significantly reducing the rate of biodiversity loss by 2010 can be said definitively to have been achieved globally, actions to promote. Biodiversity receive a tiny fraction of funding compared to infrastructure and industrial developments, moreover, 
biodiversity considerations are often ignored when such developments are designed, most future scenarios project continuing high levels of extinctions and loss of habitats throughout this century. In a 2011 study published, which was in part a response to an ongoing general call to isolate and protect certain regions of Earth to ensure the security of biodiversity, it was found that even with millions of square kilometers of land and ocean currently under legal protection, it has done very little to slow the trends of decline. They also made the following, highly troubling conclusion with respect to resource consumption, the excess use of the Earth's resources or overshoot is possible because resources can be harvested faster than they can be replaced, the cumulative overshoot from the mid-1980s to 2002 resulted in an ecological debt that would require 2.5 planet Earths to pay. In a business-as-usual scenario, our demands on planet Earth could mount to the productivity of 27 planets by 2050. Projections for, a, human population size, b, human ecological demand and ecological debt under different scenarios of human population growth and use of natural resources. Ecological demand is calculated by multiplying the size of the world's human population by the average yearly demands of a person and dividing this amount by the Earth's biocapacity, this yields the number of planet Earths required to meet the whole human demand. Reproduced from Marine Ecology Progress Series, Volume 434. Today, one could search through all peer-reviewed scientific documents in the world and likely not find one review of humanity's resource and biodiversity relationships that are neutral or positive. While estimates may vary, one thing is clear, the species is growing rapidly and expanding its industrial activity in a climate of absolute deficiency with respect to the unsustainable methods and values being put forward. It is important to remind the reader, however, that this problem is a system issue not an immutably empirical one, once again. The problem is not our mere existence or a growing population. The problem is that we have a global economic tradition in place rooted in 16th century, pre-industrial, handicraft-oriented thought that places the act of consuming, buying and selling at the core of all social unfolding. A good analogy is to consider the gas pedal on a car. The more consumption of fuel, the faster it goes, buying things in our world is the fuel. If you slow down consumption, economic growth slows, people lose jobs, purchasing power declines and social conditions destabilize. This is an artificial reality generated by misaligned economic principles, not the physical reality itself. The perfect storm. While the preceding sections have addressed specific, major issues in some detail, we cannot overlook the economic synergy which links them all in the financial and technical systems related. Energy, water, food and material accessibility interlock into one societal mechanism, which can have dramatic effects on employment, social stability, and many other issues if any one of them is disturbed. There are numerous scenarios that could materialize that compound this overall sustainability problem. For example, Global GDP has a powerful connection to water. The IFPRI states current business as usual water management practices and levels of water productivity will put at risk approximately $63 trillion, or 45% of the projected 2050 global GDP, at 2000 prices, equivalent to 1.5 times the size of today's entire global economy. Likewise, from a mere production standpoint, 70% of all freshwater is used for agriculture. Any large-scale water scarcity would then also mean reduced yields, assuming the same traditional practices are used for cultivation. The same goes for energy, especially hydrocarbons. The effect of a substantial reduction of these resources on traditional agriculture alone is staggering, while the effect it would have on industry as a whole as far as the vast amount of petroleum-based products and power needs would be nearly apocalyptic in the current model. We also cannot overlook the social stability issue and how the decline of such resources will change human, social and national behavior, inciting indifference and a loss of empathy as fear and narrow self-preservation is triggered and exacerbated. We can imagine, for instance, a steep price increase in gasoline where it becomes unprofitable for those transporting critical, life-supporting materials. The result might very well be a union strike that stops the flow of goods, compounding the problem. Imagine for a moment if the dominant food transport unions on the west coast of America went on strike, stopping the flow of basic commodities. This could spark a highly detrimental chain reaction. Scarcity breeds crime, conflict and antisocial behaviors. 
On the micro scale, it is not difficult to see the increase in gangs, theft and prohibitive underground economies flourish in this climate, as they have statistically proven to do so in regions still enmeshed in great poverty and a lack of job opportunities. Disease, and other issues arising out of such poor conditions, is another viable concern. On a macro level, as noted prior, national war has historically mostly been driven by resource scarcity and national-slash-business self-preservation. It should be no surprise that America and many other nations have been beefing up nuclear arsenals and delivery systems for some time, with the world currently capable of destroying itself many, many times over with its existing arsenal of over 26,000 nuclear warheads. Thousands of these weapons remain on high alert today, ready to be fired at any time and the reaction of the global outcry to stop proliferation has literally been met with more proliferation, behind the scenes. At the same time, the mechanics of the global financial system are also in play. Since all money is created out of debt and loaned with interest attached, interest that actually doesn't exist in the money supply outright, there is always more global debt in existence than money to pay for it. This has culminated into vast personal, business and government defaults, both real and pending. A 2010 report from the Standard & Poor's Rating Agency estimates that the United States will have a debt of 415% of GDP by 2050, while by 2060, 60% of all the countries in the world will be bankrupt. A cursory glance at the financial status of most countries in the world today reveals a spectrum of medium debt to extreme debt. Amazingly, there appears to be no country on earth with a balanced budget, and as of early 2014, the public debt of the planet is equivalent to about $52 trillion. However, that is just public or government debt. The real figure, combining both public and private debt is a staggering $223.3 trillion. Dividing that number by the 7.1 billion people on the planet as of early 2015, we find that each human owes about $31.5,000. So, we have to ask ourselves, how possible is it that we are going to be able to financially facilitate the vast technological reforms needed to generate some degree of sustainability when it is clear that massive overhauls of our agricultural system, water processes, pollution control, energy sources, infrastructure and industrial methods are desperately needed? We know we have the technical means to do it, but do we have the money? The more one thinks about this latter question, the more incredible and outright idiotic the financial mechanisms in play become. It isn't that some progress will not be made, as the major powers in the world pretty much don't take debt seriously to begin with. The difference between a $1 trillion deficit and a $100 trillion deficit is only as important as the ability to service it. In truth, the major powers know the full amounts will never be paid back and the process of alleviation will likely take a political form rather than financial, likely in the context of market incentive negotiations, geopolitical negotiation and resource acquisition negotiations. However, those deals are usually behind the scenes and the growing pressure to cut social programs and spending on what are more often than not the very programs that help keep some order, continues for the sake of public perception and other levels of differential advantage. Likewise, while the larger powers have great advantage in this predicament, the smaller developing countries are the ones who really suffer, as they have no economic or military power to gain clout in international appeal. Given this, it is easy to see that the developing countries will be the ones firmly underwater, continuing to be vulnerable to austerity, exploitation, and the basic ignoring of its internal social strife. In 2011, the United Nations noted a statistic that 1.5 billion people were living in absolute poverty, with a representative from Nepal at a pertaining conference adding that at the rate of decline observed from 1990 to 2005, it would take another 88 years to eradicate extreme poverty. If we reflect on the rapid economic growth that occurred from 1990 to 2005, which was considered by many a boom period for much of the world, we see that the existing negative pressures were not even close to what we are seeing two decades later. Hence, it is logical to speculate that what progress, growth, was achieved in the 1990s with respect to the rather minimal percentage reduction of extreme poverty is likely to be reversed as exponential population growth amidst an ever-deteriorating financial and environmental situation accelerates. Likewise, and as a final topic of this section with respect to emerging negative pressures, we have the issue of technological unemployment. 
As partly expressed in the essay Market Efficiency versus Technical Efficiency, machine automation is rapidly evolving to mirror or exceed the vast majority of industrial activities common to human laborers. A 2013 study out of the University of Oxford states 45% of America's occupations will be automated within the next 20 years. Given America's advancement, this naturally also implies that half the world's occupations could be automated as well. More specifically, a detailed examination of automation technology by sector at the present time, both in the fields of manual labor and the service industry, show that there is really no tangible occupation in existence that isn't on pace to being replaced by machine and or artificial intelligence. It is simply a matter of time and intention. Unfortunately, the market economy is predicated on people earning a living and cycling money through the society to maintain economic stability and growth. This, of course, means such a trend is actually economically detrimental in the context of the market system. Likewise, since such automation technology is subject to Moore's law, or more accurately ephemeralization, such machines are getting cheaper and eventually they will become more cost-effective than hiring human beings, who require insurance, vacations, a limited number of hours to work a week, and so forth. The productivity now possible is exponentially more effective with machines than with people and this reality will only increase as time moves forward. Yet, this creates a system contradiction, for if machines displace people, how do they get income to cycle money into the economy by purchase? In traditional market principles, there is no solution, other than the false assumption that humans will constantly shift in exact accord with such labor displacement. This might have worked in the mid-20th century, but it will no longer work given the rapid, exponential advancement of modern technology today. Even more, it could be well argued that it is socially irresponsible not to pursue this new attribute of our means of production for it removes humans from unsafe and monotonous, life-wasting roles, possibly freeing them also to do more sensitive, creative, high-order things. Such a transition, however, would require the entire edifice of market capitalism to be uprooted and replaced by a new social approach that does not require labor for income. The Fatal Incentive, Business Acumen Business acumen can be defined as keenness and quickness in understanding and dealing with a business situation in a manner that is likely to lead to a good outcome. Put another way, it is about gauging each situation to best maximize profits, in the most strategic way. This is brought up to convey two related propensities that have a great relevance in the way most people, particularly the wealthy, will likely cope with increasing scarcity and or social destabilization. The first is the rather simple observation that the pursuit of business is really nothing more than the pursuit of money. While the business mindset will often romanticize about helping the world and pleasing consumers, the only real measure is profit. It is simply assumed that gaining profit means helping the world, which is clearly not the case given the vast declines in our habitat integrity and the fact that there are now more slaves in the world than ever before. The second is subtler and it has to do with the psychology of fear and greed. Research done in the Department of Psychology at the University of California, Berkeley found that increased wealth actually creates reduced empathy and compassion towards others, along with elevating one's sense of entitlement. In short, increased wealth tends to make one mean, and there is no shortage of corroborating studies that have confirmed this very propensity. A study done by the University of Michigan titled Higher Social Class Predicts Increased Unethical Behavior States, seven studies using experimental and naturalistic methods reveal that upper-class individuals behave more unethically than lower-class individuals. In studies 1 and 2, upper-class individuals were more likely to break the law while driving relative to lower-class individuals. In follow-up laboratory studies, upper-class individuals were more likely to exhibit unethical decision-making tendencies, study 3, take valued goods from others, study 4, lie in a negotiation, study 5, cheat to increase their chances of winning a prize, study 6, and endorse unethical behavior at work, study 7, than were lower-class individuals. Mediator and moderator data demonstrated that upper-class individuals' unethical tendencies are accounted for, in part, by their more favorable attitudes toward greed. A study titled Class and Compassion, Socioeconomic Factors Predict Responses to Suffering revealed that lower-class individuals respond with greater compassion to viewing human suffering than upper-class individuals. 
In a related study titled Social Class, Contextualism, and Empathic Accuracy it was found that individuals of a lower social class are more empathically accurate in judging the emotions of other people. In its three studies, lower-class individuals received higher scores than upper-class individuals on a test of empathic accuracy, judging the emotions of an interaction partner, and made more accurate inferences about emotion from static images of muscle movements in the eyes. In a report titled Having Less, Giving More, The Influence of Social Class on Prosocial Behavior it was found that across four studies, lower-class individuals proved to be more generous, charitable, trusting, and helpful, as compared with their upper-class counterparts. A 2012 article in the The Chronicle of Philanthropy reports that low-income people give a far bigger share of their discretionary income to charities. People who make $50,000 to $75,000 give an average of 7.6% of their discretionary income to charity, compared with an average of 4.2% for people who make $100,000 or more. Now, such reports are not noted to suggest this is a universal phenomenon. However, there is clearly something going on in the psychology of those who become wealthy and a heightened sense of protection, indifference and entitlement seems consistent. With this in mind, let's return to our consideration of how different classes would respond to threatening social circumstances. Given the fact that the world now has almost 2,200 billionaires worth about 6.5 trillion in total, that's an average of 2.9 billion each, with the top 100 capable of ending global poverty four times over a great deal of attention has been placed on these figures in the hope for social help. Given the anger that has risen due to the reality of tremendous and growing inequality in the world, one can imagine the general sense of unease of those who are super-rich. Yet, apart from what could be argued as a public relations move, combined with both honest intentions and the specter of philanthropy, such as the so-called billionaires giving pledge, one can't help but feel deep animosity for such figures and the system that enabled their extreme and clearly unnecessary wealth. This, again, isn't to say anyone is bad, but rather to note that any system which has the capacity to even create such extreme wealth imbalance, in and of itself, needs to be addressed as the root problem it is, not the supposed charity of those who have been able to play the market game to such an extent as to accrue such irrational and wasteful sums. It is not a cynical view in this light to consider such things as the giving pledge as more of an insult than a solution. So given the noted psychological studies put forward and the current state of extreme and growing wealth imbalance and destabilization, good intentions by the wealthiest side, there is no evidence that the rich will save us. If current trends remain, as they likely will, the rich will simply isolate themselves more and more in fear and protection as problems continue to emerge. This propensity also applies to the entire chain of social stratification in general as narrow, short-term self-preservation will always be a knee-jerk tendency when one finds his or herself susceptible to financial loss and as the studies show, the higher a given person is in class status, the more indifferent they tend to become. This is the signature of class war, and as these trends persist, we can hence expect increased uprisings and anger at the state of affairs and gross imbalance in society. While this may seem like an elusive kind of phenomenon, it should be thought about in the same context of other negative factors, such as resource depletion, unemployment and the like. An angry population can become a divisive and violent population, and the emergence of large-scale social insurrection can have very negative social consequences if root causes are not clearly understood. Transition the idea of transitioning fluidly out of the current model into a NLRB can be a daunting and difficult speculation. Perhaps the first consideration is to think more deeply about what it is we are transitioning into exactly. In many ways, this move from a scarcity-preserving economy to a system of direct resource management and scientific application in the pursuit of a post-scarcity or abundance economy to meet the needs of the human species, while securing the integrity of the habitat, is really a transition of values. At the same time, it is also a transition of operant reinforcement, which simply means the new structure actually works to reward conservation, balance, social contribution and ecological respect, rather than what we reinforce today, which is essentially selfishness, competition, consumption and exploitation. In fact, the market system could gesturally be viewed as not a social system, per se, but an antisocial system. As far as physical transition itself, it is naturally naive to assume we can predict the future regarding such a vast societal shift, especially given how forceful and present the pressures are that keep the current system in place. 
All of us are coerced on a daily basis into this market psychology in order to maintain survival, and hence our values are deeply associated to these methods, practices and general worldview whether we like it or not. It could even be said that these pressures generate a syntax of thought, if you will. Our brains seem to wire themselves as we engage the environment, constantly reinforced by existing pressures and our responsive actions. Just as a person can learn a skill and have that skill become second nature, without much direct conscious thought to execute once learned, we humans perform actions constantly with the same kind of learned, subconscious patterning. For example, we often don't even know we are behaving in so-called narrow selfish ways at times, since everyone around us appears to be working in the exact same manner, creating perceived normality. Therefore, TZM naturally views the shifting of people's values as the most important necessity for transition. How this is done is deeply related, of course, to education, while also attempting to actively create conditions that, again, hopefully reinforce these new, sustainable values, inching out larger order change. That stated, there are perhaps two broad ways to think about transition, with the first giving something of a logical framework for the second. This first scenario assumes that there is the basic sanction of the political-slash-economic power structure and the community overall. It assumes that the human species has definitively decided to make this move in a step-by-step -step manner on the global scale. Of course, the sad truth is that it would likely never happen this way. Yet, this hypothetical is expressed because the reasoning inherent is relevant with respect to how we think about transition as a general process and certain attributes noted would likely still come into play in the second scenario. This second scenario is the more realistic scenario as it assumes there is no large-scale public sanction and the transition must originate from activism and influence. This essentially looks at exactly where we are today, taking into account the vast range of divisive opinions, political polarization, national hatred, commercial warfare, etc. So, to conclude this introduction to transition, it is also worth noting, as an aside, that many who criticize the Zeitgeist movement do so not because they disagree with the direction, but because they do not understand how to get there. A relevant analogy to counter this argument is the idea of a very sick person seeking to get well. This person might not even know the cure or the medical path to get there, but given his or her life is at stake, the task to learn and try to realize the proper means toward resolution does not end because of mere ambiguity. Likewise, the difficulty or confusion in transitioning into a NLRB does not remove the necessity for it. The fact is, we are all humans on this planet and we can change the world quite easily if we can find unified, shared common ground to relate. Furthermore, it's also important to note that we are always in transition to one degree or another. There are no utopias and even if we accomplish only 50% of such a move, as we may define it in theory, it would still be well worth it. Scenario 1, Systematic Dismantling A systematic move from the market economy to a NLRB could theoretically occur through a step-by-step -step socialization of the core attributes of the societal infrastructure. Essentially, we dismantle one layer while implementing a new one in the most fluid way we can. This term socialization, which is of course a stigmatized notion in the West given the hyperglorification of the market economy and the demonization of anything otherwise, is still technically appropriate to use in this context, bias aside. This simply means that the necessity of money and the market mechanism would no longer apply to the given social attribute, not that a traditionally socialist, in the political and economic sense of the word, structure would replace it. Direct, advanced technical means would produce and distribute without a price tag, meeting these needs directly. As noted in detail in prior essays, a critical component that enables the new social model to produce a high standard of living is the liberal application of modern technology and a systems approach to social organization based on strategic technical efficiency. Since the current model is literally based on a technical inefficiency to keep it going, the more technically efficient the system becomes, the less traditional labor is required. Therefore, in a transition starting from within the market economy, measures to compensate for this financial loss are required. These can consist, in part, of the adjustment of wages to compensate for job losses, along with the shortening and sharing of the workweek to also compensate. The core societal attributes to be discussed for this exercise consist of, a, food production, b, utilities, c, basic good production and, d, transportation. 
Obviously, these fragments have a synergistic relationship, which require other types of technical evaluation. However, since these core attributes of our day-to-day -day lives are essentially what maintain our general health and basic standard of living, these abstractions should suffice for the sake of simple reasoning exemplification. It is also worth noting that the post-scarcity relationships denoted in each subject can be explored more so in the essay Post-Scarcity Trends, Capacity and Efficiency. A. Food Production The technology for high efficiency, automated food production is now a reality today with vertical farm technology and low-energy-slash-low-impact cultivation methods such as hydroponics, aquaponics and aeroponics. Desalinization processes, for example, could enable the building of these vertical farm facilities along most major coastlines, producing organic food in quantities to meet and exceed the needs of the regional population. In short, if such advanced methods were implemented, the strategic abundance possibility reveals that the need to place restrictive monetary value on basic food resources is simply not required. There is no legitimate technical reason, even within an existing monetary economy, grocery stores today cannot provide the same produce resources to a given regional population without the need for financial exchange. It is simply a matter of getting the advanced automated systems in place. B. Utilities. The hydrocarbon economy today continues to cause a great deal of turmoil, not only on the environmental level, but also due to the inevitable scarcity of the resources themselves. While the debate continues regarding peak oil, there is no legitimate debate as to the fact that fossil fuels are essentially finite and its combustion is detrimental to the environment. Given the advanced state of renewable energy means such as solar, tide, wind, geothermal and the like, coupled with advanced localization means, there is no reason any of us would need to pay for energy if the system was properly designed. Advanced solar systems alone applied to every existing structure, even feeding excess energy back into a community's redundant baseload grid, would eliminate electricity needs immediately based on current statistics. The same phenomenon also assists with natural gas and water utilities. Since electricity can be used to replace gas for heating and most other utility purposes, its use can simply be designed out in this context. Water, which is of a generally nominal financial expense today in the West, can be made dramatically more abundant via further industrial efficiency to receive pollution and maintain a regional surplus by strategic use. Those who do have water shortages in the world have had technical resolutions for years via desalinization and other purification systems, both on the large scale and small scale. It has been, again, the lack of financial resources that have caused the problems, not the lack of technical ability. C. Basic Good Production the spectrum of basic good production is wide, ranging from core staples such as household items, clothes and communication technology, to specific tools for specialized tasks, such as musical instruments and other increasingly less demanded items. The best way to think about this is as a spectrum of demand, with daily needs on one side and specialized, or luxury-type goods on the other. While the advancement of automation technology will likely facilitate a vast amount of variation in production once the revolution in modular robotics and nanotechnology comes to fruition, for the sake of transition in the immediate future, we can think about industry in the more established context. Overall, each industry or sub-industry could be unified in operations to enable the highest level of production and output efficiency possible as a deliberate whole. In other words, the corporate structures would combine based on genre or sector, using that collaborative capacity to increase efficiency, while reducing waste and competitive multiplicity. This would set the stage for the creation of a fully synergistic industrial system, applying advanced, ideally simplifying automation processes liberally at every turn to remove human labor and inevitably increase efficiency. In this, primitive versions of the collaborative design system, as described at length in the essay The Industrial Government, could also gain traction. While certain limitations would occur given the absence of larger order cooperation, the inching in of this process would set the stage for larger incorporation while also increasing sustainability. Now, returning to the prior point about compensation for the loss of paid work hours, the loss of sales naturally means a loss of growth and hence a loss of jobs. In the current model, this is structurally a negative thing, of course. However, in this hypothetical transition proposal, wages would shift in proportion to the resulting job losses and or with the shifting of workday hours. 
In other words, assuming an initial average workday need of 8 hours per person, incurring a loss of jobs by 50% due to the application of automation and new levels of technical efficiency, the workday would then be cut by 50% and spread across the existing workforce, keeping everyone employed, but for a shorter period. So, if we had a hypothetical economy with 1,000 people and 50% of them were displaced by this deliberate technological unemployment, the workday is then divided between them so everyone now works only 4 hours, instead of 8. Again, the fact that these goods and services are becoming free in the economy means that there is less of a need for prior levels of purchasing power. Therefore, a 50% cut in wages is calculated to be directly compensated for. Overall, we are phasing the monetary system out in this process. In cases where this isn't feasible, there would be an increase in hourly wage rates in the same basic proportion, compensating for the average losses incurred. In theory, this hourly reduction of the total workforce, assuming 100% employment through these standards, coupled with the compensating increase in now free resources, would fluidly move the society out of the labor market over time. Again, this is the abstract hypothetical. D. Transportation. The next social staple is transportation. The production of vehicles, which is already largely automated today, is one consideration and this isn't much of a problem to perfect. This issue here is access, application and necessity. Of course, this thought exercise could be quite elaborate. If we were to calculate the vast amount of energy and resources used on a daily basis today for all of us to travel to centralized offices, usually participating in occupations with questionable relevance in the broad view, we would be amazed at the inefficiency apparent on the whole. While there are certainly exceptions, there are very few occupations today that really require direct location interaction anymore, given the vast power of the internet and such communication tools. Even industrial production facilities, once further automated, would only require a small number of people on location, with most processes administered remotely. So, with a strategic move to simply stop from wasteful 9 to 5, 5 day work week, traditional travel to work and back would create a great alleviation of pressure on many levels. Having everyone equipped by whatever means needed to operate their business function from their homes is a logical and sustainable idea for energy reduction, reduced accidents, reduced pollution, reduced stress and the like. Beyond that, as far as infrastructure, systems of sharing, such as the currently existing rental street bicycles and the like, should be applied to vehicles, and everything else we can, coupled with the liberal incorporation of mass transit. This, again, is to be a step-by-step -step process of improvement where different regions are purposefully reorganized to favor the highest level of technical travel efficiency possible. In short, localizing labor locations slash remote access to limit travel needs, coupled with sharing systems for vehicles and liberal mass transit, would profoundly change the nature of transport infrastructure, easing into the foundation of a NLRBE, even if some of those services still need money to pay for them. Scenario 2, The Real World now, with the following truncated yet logically purposeful train of thought towards a hypothetical breakdown the current system and a systematic implementation of attributes of the new one in mind, let's now take a realistic look at what a transition to this new society may hold given the complex and dichotomous reality we endure today. It's first important to understand that the intention of social and environmental sustainability has been developing under the surface of culture for a long time. For example, the now common notion of the green economy, which is being pushed forward by environmentalists, coupled with periodic outbursts by civil rights groups such as Occupy Wall Street, reveals a deep-seated interest to aspire for a world that is more equal, humane, and sustainable. While our current social system, as argued, often reinforces the opposite of those values, it still seems that deep down most of our core historical philosophies still suggest an interest in social equality and sustainable balance. So again, it is important to acknowledge that in order to really create a more sustainable, humane world, a complete move out of the current social architecture is required. Otherwise the same basic problems will persist, even if reduced to some degree by half measures. To do this, global social movement tactics become critical to put pressure on the existing system, along with helping change the intents and values of the culture itself by vast education and communication projects. However, before such ideas are addressed, it is worth revisiting the issue of societal collapse, this time in the context of what we could term eco-biosocial pressures. 
A backdrop to our cultural evolution are pressures that can take both a positive and negative form. Positive pressures of this nature could include the development and expression of life-advancing technologies where the viewing public is so impressed by the possibilities, the social demand for that feature or implementation becomes unwavering. On the other side are the negative pressures, such as the dramatic failure of a social edifice that shocks the culture and creates unease, loss of confidence and a dire interest in problem resolution by new methods. Given the prior section on societal problems we can logically expect as the current model grinds along, that these negative pressures are bound to help facilitate new incentives toward change. Of course, this is out of the control of TZM and at no point does TZM promote furthering any harm upon anyone. TZM focuses on positive pressure influence in its activist work, showing the world what can be done through education and think tank projects. Yet, TZM does not deny the existence of these other emerging negative pressures and acknowledges them also as a form of mobilizing incentive. It is also important to note that so-called societal collapse is not an absolute distinction. It is relative. In general day-to-day -day operations, specifically in the West, one typically does not look around and deem the society as being in a state of breakdown. This is because most people have simply become accustomed to the pollution, cancer, debt, homelessness, depletion, poverty, wars, uprisings, periodic financial crises, unemployment and other inefficiencies. It isn't as though one day everyone wakes up and finds the whole world suffering or dead in the streets. Societal collapse, or system failure, is a process and the real question is actually how bad are we prepared for it to become before we act to change it. In truth, all systems change and while such a process of failure is a very negative thing in the short term, it is also ultimately a natural consequence of cultural evolution. Problems can lead to creativity and creativity leads to new solutions, if we are willing to move on. At any rate, with these ecobiosocial pressures apparent, coupled with a basic understanding of how a step-by-step -step transition could unfold, scenario 1, let's now talk about transitional activism. The goal here is to not only facilitate a move to the new model, but to also work to help those suffering in the current model, basically bringing them in first in this process of transition. This is done by creating parallel systems, which do not use money but still provide helpful services to people. With growing technological unemployment and most governments and corporations still looking the other way for as long as they can, creating solutions to ease the stress on the population, coupled with removing support for the current system, is a win-win goal. For example, the use of mutual credit systems or time banks facilitate a kind of non-currency transactions, often based upon labor only. While taxation of these transactions apply in some countries, this system is able to bypass money overall, i.e. for those who have skills but are poor, along with reducing overall financial circulation, as a means of protest and transition. A mutual credit system is a form of barter for services or goods, which allow non-monetary exchange values to be applied to other goods and services, removing the one to call and one good to good correlation common to simple barter. Let's is an example. It assists an interest-free, non-inflationary form of exchange where value cannot float or fluctuate, as it does today, among many other positives. In the case of the time bank, it is based on the prior work of the person, in effect. There are a number of variations of these kinds of systems, and they are becoming ever more sophisticated in their programming and malleability. Another tactic, which has a similar effect, is the use of community sharing systems. TZM Toronto, for example, has a tool-sharing network where basic tools exist in a facility, like a library, and one can check out these tools in rotation, as needed. As minor as this may seem, it is easy to see how this library concept could extend greatly in a community, such as with automobiles and other items used more sparsely. Again, this would help those who didn't have a means of access, along with removing growth pressure for the economic system. It would also be more environmentally friendly and sustainable, needless to say. Likewise, more traditional social policy influencing methods, such as mass online petitions and other such acts are to be viewed as minor in effect, but still relevant for awareness. TZM does not endorse physical protest in the sense of piling into a parking lot and yelling at buildings as an effective means of social change, but it does not dismiss them either as such activities can draw attention toward a given issue to some degree. Likewise, petitions have been ubiquitous in the world today, 
along with working to influence political officials by also publicly challenging them in the purview of news media. These are other such expressions that come down to one's creativity, courage and personal interests. However, there is one specific political lobbying proposal worth mentioning that has been around for a long time. While not a long-term solution in and of itself, its implementation would at least generate improved public health and eliminate general poverty. It is called a guaranteed or unconditional income system. This simply means people are given basic life-supporting funds each year to meet basic needs, with no one left behind. In late 2013, activist groups in Switzerland were pushing very hard to implement this idea. Now, all that aside, TZM's most important activist initiatives are the ever-emerging think-tank-style projects, which literally can work to show a better way. R. Buckminster Fuller once stated, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. This is the transitional motto of TZM as well. As will be expressed in the essay Becoming the Zeitgeist Movement, apart from general awareness events, think tank projects that can literally start to build the new social model, both physically and in its programming for sustainability and efficiency, is perhaps by far the most profound method of activism. The digital revolution has taken the complexity and arduous development process of industrial design and provided the option to virtually represent most any physical idea for the sake of communication. Likewise, while the collaborative design system noted prior may not be in existence today, there is no reason programming for it cannot be created now, even if it is to merely exist as an oversimplified mock-up. Likewise, the Global Redesign Institute, which is a macro-industrial design interface designed to enable anyone to think about the logic of redesigning the topographical layout of Earth, is another idea. In the end, the range of possibilities to virtually create almost exactly what TZM speaks of is becoming more possible and this has powerful communication potential. We can imagine, after these developments occur, large-scale conferences that can be conducted in any given region, showing how much more efficient that region would be, if such technical system or designs were implemented. The Lone Country Transition Building on the prior paragraph, imagine a fairly small country with a vast range of natural resources, a possible realistic location could be a lush country in Latin America. It is some time in the future and technical progress has been continuing its phenomenon of doing more with less. The result is such that known methods of industrial production now require fewer raw materials, to such an extent that if well-organized, resource-rich country adapted strategically, there would be no need for imports or exports in that region. The country could be off the grid, so to speak, in the context of globalization and international influence. However, the leaders of this country really were not aware of this technical reality. So, one day a relative of one of the leaders finds his or herself at a TZM conference, talking about those very design initiatives and advancements in production methods. This person notifies the leaders of the country, and the government takes notice. This hypothetical government is perhaps impoverished, as many Latin American countries are, mostly due to international trade dealings, corruption, debt problems, unemployment problems and the like. This government, enlightened by what they have learned, decides to take the initiative to incorporate a localized NLRBE, as best they can. They understand that a true NLRBE is global, with a total earthly resource management system. However, knowing this will not occur anytime soon in the current global climate, they calculate that with a number of adjustments, they can still utilize the model to a limited but powerful degree, solving most all of its country's material-slash-financial woes. So, the country then adjusts its industrial methods in accord, creates a domestic sensor system and management network to understand its resources and keep equilibrium, fully digests the new industrial capacity to do more with less, also installing the sustainability and efficiency protocol algorithms inherent to the CDS, and they proceed with the new model in full force. Literally stopping all trade with foreign nations, being self-contained and 100% sustainable in their region, once established. After a period of this success, the world slowly begins to see the incredible result of their moneyless economy. The population, which had a very low standard of living prior, is elevated to an economic abundance they have never seen. It helps greatly that the people's values in that country consist of conservation and modest living, furthering balanced progress of the nation.
So, given this evidence of feasibility and fruitfulness, other adjacent nations begin to understand the vast merit of the new model and decide to take part. This process of joining expands the resource network greatly and the more it expands, the more other countries' people also see the merit and the more they demand it, and so on. In time, the world unites. Now, while this example might be oversimplified, also clearly ignoring the international political pressures that most certainly would cause conflict, the reader should be able to understand that it is still a possibility. In truth, we don't really know what exactly will start such a move, but we do know that planting as many seeds of possibility as possible is the key, coupled with the increasingly negative eco-biosocial pressures that will appear to have no end in sight. Becoming the Zeitgeist Movement Sometimes the slightest things change the directions of our lives, the merest breath of a circumstance, a random moment that connects like a meteorite striking the earth. Lives have swiveled and changed direction on the strength of chance remark. Bryce Courtney Responsibility While on the surface, the following proposition may seem like a mere poetic gesture, the truth of the matter is that it is absolutely true and inescapable. We are all in the zeitgeist movement, whether we like it or not. Every day of our lives, we make decisions in social and environmental contexts that create influence on the well-being and perception of others. It doesn't matter what one's political, religious or overall ideological disposition may be specifically, if you live on this planet you are influencing it and the culture spawned from it. What this also means is that you are responsible. You are responsible for what you set in motion and hence responsible for the state of the habitat and your response for the balance or imbalance of the human species itself, to one degree or another. Each act of empathy or indifference resonates with those who receive those effects, and due to the basic, evolutionary laws of human adaption we adjust our expectations and propensities as we experience the environment around us. Naturally, early childhood is the most sensitive period to our species, as we try to figure out if this new world we have come into is safe and supportive or if the world is unsafe and indifferent. This type of programming, while established in early childhood most dominantly, still continues throughout our lives, and the effect it has on the larger order cultural perception is also profound. Yet, while our capabilities are truly powerful, particularly when it comes to human society's recent capacity to build technological tools, which can change the societal construct rapidly, it is easy to forget that at the root core of this existence is a kind of subservience and acceptance of factors that we will never have control of. After millennia of confusion about the nature of our existence, inventing complex and ultimately false systems of belief as we cope with this confusion, the slow discovery of what are commonly termed the laws of nature have provided not only a means to create and invent, but to also understanding that we are actually not in control in many profound ways. We appear to only be in control of how we relate to this existing rule structure, and those natural law rules show no sign of changing. Our submission to this reality rests at the heart of the technical proposals made by the Zeitgeist movement. It is merely a process of adaptation to better optimize human existence and create a condition that improves our lives and allows for future generations to inhabit this planet without severe deficiency and a loss of sustainability. In truth, the human species today does not just share the world with itself and the habitat. It also shares it with the extended family of the species and the extended family of the other life inherent in the habit, generations into the future. There has also been an eclipsing tendency for an idealized sense of self-importance. Traditional religions and such notions of being created in the image of God and other ideas tend to separate humans from the natural world, as though we are not to be reduced to some kind of mere artifact of nature. The great astronomer Carl Sagan perhaps best addressed this problem in his text, Pale Blue Dot, The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner, how frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that, in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. Of course, 
There is no denying that our capacity to think, create, problem-solve and alter our world places us in a very unique rank with respect to the other species we share this habitat with. The human organism is so incredible in so many functional and adaptive ways, yet modern science has not even begun to understand how this ever-complex array of organs and chemistry is able to do what it does so well. In fact, our creativity is so powerful, we have been able to extend our mental and physical forms to include physical and computational possibilities that would otherwise be impossible. This is the true nature of our technological ingenuity. A computer, a car, a phone, a table, a pencil or any other tool we may utilize, are not merely detached abstractions we engage in. They are extensions of ourselves in very real and direct ways, improving some type of function we wish to complete. As time moves on, the logic is clear that problem resolution can become ever more powerful, so much so that the social models we may embrace in one generation will be made obsolete in another generation. The desired transition from the competitive, market model of economics to a NLRB is just such a move. Roles and Projects The Zeitgeist Movement is a global organization that has no papers to fill out or any formal acceptance process. One's interest in the proposals of TZM, coupled with some type of action to promote such change, is the only defining feature of a member and the degree of participation comes down to the comfort zone and ingenuity of the individual and or groups they choose to be a part of. It is also important to point out that simply being a part of this community is, in many ways, a contribution to transition itself, as a changing of social values is critical to such a move, and this starts by generating a growing subculture that simply finds alignment with those values, even though the old, caustic social model is still in place. More specifically, getting involved invariably means trying to raise awareness in the community, while ideally contributing to development projects. The range of activist possibilities can be as simple as an isolated person online working to post relevant data to target audiences in places such as forums, media sites, social networks and the like, while the others may take a more detailed approach and contribute to design and programming projects that can serve to facilitate the actual mechanics of the system proposed. Three such developing projects are the IGA, Global Redesign Institute or GRI, B, the Localized Solutions Project or LSP, C, and the Collaborative Design System or CDS. GRI is an online collaborative interface that functions in a similar manner of public contribution as Wikipedia does, except with a much higher degree of logical assessment and minus much of the semantic problems that arise with an encyclopedia. The purpose is to redesign the surface of Earth, graphically and mathematically, region by region, based upon the most advanced principles of sustainability and efficiency. This system's theory-oriented approach does not observe human contrivances and artificial limitations such as countries, property rights and other inhibiting factors existing today. The best way to think about it is as a macro-industrial design initiative, which removes all topographical and infrastructural attributes of modern society, working to replace them with more optimized means. The goal is to virtually implement a NLRB in the largest scale theoretical way. Of course, many hear such a proposal, coupled with the understanding that this is an open access project and anyone on the planet can contribute might conclude that the vastness of subjective human opinion on such a matter would make settling on such a design impossible. This is actually not the case when the scientific method is brought into play. While the localized technology, more on this in the LSP section, will always change over time, since that is the nature of it as things technically improve, the basic topographical reasoning will change far less. More specifically, the manner by which these macro decisions are arrived at would have a direct relationship to the characteristics of any given area, coupled with the logical reasoning inherent to the networks that emerge to synergistically connect social functionality. For example, different terrains have different propensities for settlement, while the location of renewable energy sources demands that harvesting exist in certain places. If production of a particular genre of goods requires certain materials and those materials happen to be local, it is logical to construct production facilities as close as possible to the extraction source. Likewise, any other attributes of the supply chain are best allocated using the same logic, including the means of distribution. Distribution centers would naturally be close to large city centers where the population has easy access within short distances. 
Furthermore, the creation of parks, recreation and the like becomes self-evident as well, finding conducive placement in areas that fit such a given profile, such as large flat expanses for games and the like. In short, this process of logically deducing topographical placement to maximize efficiency and sustainability is a technical process overall. This isn't to say one can push a button and the entirety of a given region can be deduced automatically with no human consensus or interfering values. Rather, it is to say that what we have in the world today, with the wasteful, market-derived practices of international markets, globalization and other inefficiencies, is deeply misaligned. Through this basic natural law reasoning, we can further create ease, safety, and abundance and hence increase our quality of life, while reducing our environmental footprint dramatically. As far as communication and education, which are ultimately the points of any such project, in part, the task once a certain area has been updated is to then show the world what has been made possible. The statistics that would accompany these end design proposals would likely relay mathematically derived feedback, such as how much less energy and fewer resources are being used, the overall ecological footprint reduction, the ease of transport, the efficient increase in production and distribution, the statistical creation of a material abundance based on population, and so forth. The Localized Solutions Project or LSP can be thought about as a micro-industrial initiative, as compared to the macro one just discussed with the GRI. This is simply a good design project where people can think about smaller order systems that could be a part of the larger order, macro context. For example, a house design that is lightweight, off-the-grid and easily constructed or prefabricated out of earth-friendly and abundant materials, could be one such project. Once such a design is found to be most versatile, sustainable and optimized by the community through the online collaborative system, it can then go into a database for both general reference and even incorporation in the GRI as a subsystem. Likewise related to the LSP, the CDS or Collaborative Design System is a programming project that would seek to produce the actual regulatory and network-aware source code that facilitates the process discussed in the essay The Industrial Government. This system could be coded in the exact same open source and open access manner by which the prior two projects are, utilizing the group mind and the scientific method to help maximize potential. As a communication tool, this project would not have to be complete to be effective. Even if only a small set of parameters were utilized that relay the calculation of a theoretical design evaluation, the educational value alone has great potential. In time, primitive versions of the CDS could be directly incorporated into the LSP and GRI, since they are connected in purpose. Such expressions could be demonstrated at movement conferences. Chapters and Events A TZM activist almost always has a relationship to a regional chapter. As of 2014, there are many chapters across dozens of countries. A chapter can be a few people or thousands and those in regions currently without local chapters are encouraged to start one. It is a very easy process and the time commitment needed comes down to the degree of dedication and one's time availability. Chapters are organized by local and international tiers. For example, there is national chapter coordination for the entire United States, while each U.S. state has its own chapter, or sub-chapter. Likewise, each city in any given state can also have its own chapter. This network creates a multidimensional information flow, and while it may appear hierarchical, the ethic of the movement is not a top-down power system. Chapters often hold meetings about their work in each tier, and the ideas talked about are brought up the chain as much and they are brought down the chain. As far as events, since the inception of TZM in 2008, certain periodic events have emerged as staples of the movement, with two occurring annually. These two are called Zeitgeist Day, or Z-Day, and the Zeitgeist Media Festival. 2013, for example, marked the fifth annual Z-Day and the third annual Media Festival. Z-Day is the movement's flagship public awareness event, which is intellectually driven, describing progress in the movement and expanding relevant research. It is also a public media activism event, always trying to entice media outlets to cover it in order to further spread awareness of TZM's mission. In contrast, the Zeitgeist Media Festival is a multimedia arts event, which works to bypass the intellectual side and use art for the sake of personal transformation. 
The arts have an emotional and experimental capacity to inspire change and generate new ideas and TZM views the arts as an underpinning of scientific development itself. This event is also a means to express the creative and exciting capacity and potential of the human condition and to remind ourselves that we should also celebrate humanity as we work to improve it. Each of these events has the same basic format. There is a main event and there are sympathetic chapter events. In the case of Z-Day, the global main event tends to focus on the most dominant global issues and projects for the movement each year, usually featuring well-known speakers and contributors to the movement. Mirrored sympathetic events, which are regionally targeted, occur the same day or weekend around the world via the chapters. In 2009, for example, there were over 400 sympathetic events, along with the main event in New York City. Likewise, very often chapters conduct food and resource charity drives for the suffering in their community. Other events, such as town halls, which can be monthly or bi-monthly, are also common. It is up to a given group slash chapters to decide the frequency of these public meetings. Beyond these core ideas, many other possibilities are out there and it is, again, up to any chapter to be creative in how it conducts its activism. Mission Statement In conclusion, the official mission statement of TZM will be stated in full. Founded in 2008, the Zeitgeist Movement is a sustainability advocacy organization which conducts community-based activism and awareness actions through a network of global-slash-regional chapters, project teams, annual events, media and charity work. The movement's principal focus includes the recognition that the majority of the social problems that plague the human species at this time are not the sole result of some institutional corruption, absolute scarcity, a political policy, a flaw of human nature or other commonly held assumptions of causality. Rather, the movement recognizes that issues such as poverty, corruption, pollution, homelessness, war, starvation and the like appear to be symptoms born out of an outdated social structure while intermediate reform steps and temporal community support are of interest to the movement, the defining goal is the installation of a new socioeconomic model based upon technically responsible resource management, allocation and design through what would be considered the scientific method of reasoning problems and finding optimized solutions. This natural law slash resource based economy, NLRBE, is about taking a direct technical approach to social management as opposed to a monetary or even political one. It is about updating the workings of society to the most advanced and proven methods known, leaving behind the damaging consequences and limiting inhibitions that are generated by our current system of monetary exchange, profit, business and other structural and motivational issues. The movement is loyal to a train of thought, not figures or institutions. The view held is that through the use of socially targeted research and tested understandings in science and technology, we are now able to logically arrive at societal applications that could be profoundly more effective in meeting the needs of the human population, increasing public health. There is little reason to assume war, poverty, most crime and many other monetarily based scarcity effects common in our current model cannot be resolved over time. The range of the movement's activism and awareness campaigns extend from short to long term, with methods based explicitly on nonviolent methods of communication. The Zeitgeist movement has no allegiance to country or traditional political platforms. It views the world as a single system and the human species as a single family and recognizes that all countries must disarm and learn to share resources and ideas if we expect to survive in the long run. Hence, the solutions arrived at and promoted are in the interest to help everyone on Earth, not a select group. Join us, www.thezeitgeistmovement.com
Zeit TV. Behind the scenes. I want to let you, the viewer, know that the positive feedback regarding Zeit TV is greatly appreciated. However, the most difficult part about producing this series has been getting copyright strikes on YouTube. I'm not going to name names, but I've been abused by people claiming to own the copyright on certain parts I've used for Zeit TV. The reality is that copyright is a form of censorship and abuse. Copyright is a weapon which can be used by cults and corporations to intimidate or threaten. Copyright's place belongs in the unnatural and malicious monetary market society. It does not belong in an open source society or a natural law resource based economy. Copyright does not exist in the natural world. If copyright did exist in the natural world, life would be impossible, as genes are always copied. The natural world is open source. This reality, whatever you want to call it, has already allowed any combination a human or an AI can come up with. So copyright is actually a form of plagiarism. You are plagiarizing God or this reality when you put something under copyright. There is no such thing as an original work. Some corporations have even attempted to copyright certain colors. It does not matter how hard someone works on an invention, a video, a song, a book and so forth. It belongs to this reality or God if you will, nothing belongs to any human. Reality owns humans. This is the fact that the back in the box speech at the start of the film Zeitgeist moving forward alludes to. If you are an artist and you don't want your work pirated or stolen, then do not bother making any art in the first place. Because the nature of creativity and art and the nature of computers is to copy or steal. Intellectual property is one of the themes of George Orwell's 1984. In the story 1984, Winston Smith is tortured until he believes 2 plus 2 makes 5, because the Ingsoc party owns the rights to 2 plus 2 makes 4. And his love for his girlfriend, Julia, is replaced with love for the Ingsoc party and Big Brother. As love is also owned by Big Brother, there must only be love for Big Brother and the party. Hence the torture ministry is called the Ministry of Love. What I'm saying is I disagree with any form of top-down control over the Zeitgeist movement, and any control over the Zeitgeist movement, or Venus Project-related information. Information, knowledge and the truth should be free. You are not a person who is for creativity, peace and love if you are for enforcing copyright strictly. They contradict each other. Legally someone is within their right to enforce copyright over something they own, but morally they are bankrupt. A pro-copyright person or corporation is a pro-censorship, malicious, abusive, controlling bully and nothing more. So thank you for watching Zeit TV. Despite the setbacks, I've enjoyed making this program so far and will continue to do so in the future.